Welcome. This video was created for you to relax or fall asleep to. Enjoy the sounds of falling rain, accompanied by allegedly true, scary stories. If this is your first time trying a rain video with scary stories, it's actually more relaxing than you might think. And don't worry, there will not be any jump scare sound effects or music. Just my voice and relaxing rain. If you're new here, I want to let you know that I don't put ads all over the place in my videos. In my videos, there are only three mid-roll ads, and they will always be after story number one, after story number two, and one more ad after story number three. I like to get them out of the way quickly so you can listen for hours with nothing interrupting your relaxation or sleep. Also, the last story in this video is not true. It is fiction, and it is one of the scariest stories I have ever heard. Lastly, I left some extra rain for you at the end of the video. I hope you enjoy, and if you do, all I ask of you is to like the video so that it will get recommended to more people. Now, if you are ready, let's begin. This happened back when I was 14, but even with my bad memory, I remember this years later. I honestly think that this memory will haunt me for the rest of my life. I would often go walking either alone or with my neighbor, Jim, but this specific night, she didn't go with me. I usually went walking around 9 at night, but was impatient that night, so I left about 15 minutes early. It was summer in Texas, but I grabbed my black hoodie anyway. The reason for this was because I was a pretty small kid, even for my age, and I would walk with a knife in my sleeve in case of a problem. There was security in this area, but they were pretty much useless and weren't fond of the kids anyway, so the black was to avoid them seeing me and to maybe help avoid being noticed by anyone else, too. The area was heavily wooded and the roads had no streetlights. I had lived there my whole life, so with the moonlight, this wasn't really an issue. I could see things as much as I needed to. I walked to the park in the area and sat down on the swing set like I had a million times before. The park was old and wasn't very well taken care of, so the swing set creaked. The wooden picnic tables were half rotted with the paint mostly peeled away, and the metal slide was covered in rust. There was the main road that ran in front of the park and a branch off road that ran along the side of the park with a thin line of trees between the side road and park. After a while, a favorite song of mine came on and I, of course, started singing it, since singing was a big way I let out stress despite my stage fright. I had a tendency to not hold back when singing at this park since there was rarely people near it during the day, let alone at night. My blood ran cold, though, when I saw the shape of a person, maybe 50 to 100 feet in front of me, on the main road. The main reason for the chill was the fear that this random person heard me sing, but then I got a deeper, bad feeling. Something was just wrong about them. I noticed that the person was walking really fast, like really fast, almost running speed. I figured he might have been running from something, or after something, but when I looked around everywhere that I could possibly see from where I was, I saw nothing else but them. They soon passed by the park not seeming to notice me, and after a few minutes of waiting to make sure they were gone, I continued singing. After a couple more songs, I decided that it was time to go home. I still had that bad feeling, that uneasy pit in my stomach that you get when you're being watched. I even thought I saw something behind the tree line between the side road and the swings, but I brushed that off as an animal or something. Deer were really common, so were dogs and things like that, so it was probably me getting spooked by an animal again. But the feeling was eating away at me, so I cut my usual 30 minute to an hour walk to about 10 minutes. So I got up and started to leave the park, turning onto the main road to go home. As I was leaving, I saw a person walking toward the main road from the road that ran alongside the park. It looked like the same person as before, 
It was a man. He must have been visiting a friend or something. Right? Even if that was the case, I crossed to the opposite side of the street so I wouldn't pass directly by him. He didn't look particularly dangerous or unusual, so sadly, no weird, creepy, homeless-looking man for this story. I just got a bad feeling from him, which is probably what makes him even more terrifying. He got to the intersection before me and stopped. I passed by and glanced at the man, taking in what details I could under the moonlight that came from between the tree branches. He looked normal. He was probably an average height, wearing a pure white ball cap with no logos that casted a shadow over his face and a pure white polo type shirt. There wasn't a speck of dirt on the man. He looked well kept and it made the moonlight almost shine on him like some kind of ghost, which just added to my uneasy feeling. He watched me as I passed by and I tried to pretend that I didn't notice. I would occasionally look around as if I was just looking at the woods so I could see the man out of my peripheral vision. I didn't want or need to see the man in detail, partly because I was scared of the possibility of seeing something else too. Just because the man was much larger than me didn't mean that he wasn't probably armed too. Once I was around 15 feet past the intersection, I glanced and my stomach dropped as I saw him turn and start to follow me. Maybe he was just going for an extra long walk or something. He probably isn't following me, right? Then, another thought popped in my head and sent my stomach to my feet. I had been there for probably ten minutes or so singing after he passed. What if he wasn't visiting anyone? What if he was the thing I saw just beyond the tree line? That's kinda obvious now that this was almost definitely the case. But let's be fair. When do 14 year olds ever think through all the details of a situation completely during the situation? He was probably watching me the whole time. He could have snuck up and done God knows what at any time. I kept doing my glances and noticed that he was getting closer and closer. I gripped my knife tighter, ready in case I had to use it. The chance of it going well wasn't the best, but it was a better chance than not trying at all. But I wanted that to be a last ditch option. I tried to make sure it wasn't obvious I was keeping tabs on him. I didn't want him getting anxious and having to decide to speed up or whatever his plan was. I was only halfway home, and this was before I had surgery on my ankle, so I was absolutely sure he could catch me before I reached the house if I started running where I was, so that wasn't an option whatsoever. I didn't have many current options, so the one I chose was to bide my time until an opportunity opened up. I kept walking at a rather quick but unpanicked pace, keeping tabs on the man as he inched closer, and kept an eye out for opportunities. And an opportunity came. I saw headlights. A car was rolling towards me at a careful pace, like normal considering the animals I mentioned earlier. It was Jem's dad. I recognized the shape of the lights and as the car got closer, I became convinced it was him. I was never so relieved to see that tiny white car. I tried signaling him without letting the man know I was, but he just passed by. He must have thought I was just saying hi. I glanced back again. Even though he didn't stop, he did exactly what I needed. He slowed down a bit as he passed. The man backed up a lot and crossed to the other side of the road. The headlights were on him and he couldn't see me at least for around five or six seconds, maybe a bit longer including readjusting to the dark. I walked faster. I didn't run, that way my steps wouldn't be too loud, but I rounded the corner before he would be able to readjust and get sight of me again. Once I could turn and no longer see him, I rushed home and locked the door. I knew better than to leave it unlocked since after all, I lived in the woods. Just because I couldn't see him anymore didn't mean he wasn't nearby, and didn't mean he couldn't see me. As stupid as this next part is, it's probably for the best that I did it. I texted Jim. I asked her to meet me outside right now because something happened, and I needed to come over. She said okay, and we both went outside, and as soon as I saw her in the driveway, I sprinted to her house. 
I didn't want to be outside any longer than I had to be. She kept panicking and asking what happened and what was wrong, and once I caught my breath, I told her everything. Right after I got done explaining, her dad walked in the house. He looked at Jem seeming worried, then noticed me hiding behind her. He looked relieved and told her, I was about to tell you to ask her to come over here. I asked him if he saw the man following me. He said he did. He didn't really see his face, but that he was trying to make it look like he was on the phone when he wasn't holding anything. But that wasn't even close to the worst part. I think this was the first time I have seen this man scared, and I am not sure if I have ever seen fear like this from him since. He told us the man wasn't alone. There was a gate at the front of where I lived that needed a card to get in. Apparently there was another man outside the gate, who looked similar to the first, standing by a van. That mean they didn't live there, didn't want security knowing they were there, and wanted to get out quickly and quietly after they did whatever they were there for. Needless to say, I spent the night at Jem's that night, and I have no clue what would have happened had Jem's dad not driven by, or if I would have left at my normal time. Anybody who has ever camped up in the Adirondack area of upstate New York knows just how breathtaking and beautiful it can be any time of the year. Last year, I stayed with my family in a cabin that rested in the mountains. I had recently split up for my longtime girlfriend, and it seemed like a wonderful place to go to clear my head. At first, my theory was correct. It was therapeutic and beautiful being out in nature and it was nice spending some time with my family. One of the really nice things about this cabin was that it was truly separated from any other residence. The closest cabin, or campsite, was probably at least a mile or more away. This meant we had total and complete privacy. Or so we thought. One late afternoon, probably around 5 p.m., we heard some shuffling coming from the front of the cabin. We were sitting on the back porch and heard some movement that sounded like footsteps. A little on edge, my brother and I got up and got ready, just in case we needed to leap into action. All of a sudden, two middle-aged men walked into the back where we were sitting. I asked in a very abrasive and annoyed voice, Hey, what are you doing? Can I help you with something? The men just looked and laughed and said in a cheery voice, why, hello there, young man. My name is Lewis, and this is Tito. We just really wanted to check the view out at this place. We have heard so many wonderful stories. The man seemed sincere, but something just didn't seem right to me. I still looked at them with an uneasy feeling in my stomach. But my mother, who is a very friendly person, made small talk with the man. Perhaps the most unsettling thing of this entire interaction was the friend, Tito, who was just standing around looking at the house, with seemingly no facial movements or anything. Lewis was charismatic, smiled a lot, and made lots of eye contact, where Tito was almost the opposite. After several minutes of small talk, they vanished back out into the woods. I was not a fan of this at all, and quickly let my family know about it. Where were these guys coming from, I thought. As I stated previously, the closest place was about a mile or so away, and the place belonged to the guy who owned the cabin we were staying in. So Lewis and Tito must have been hiking for a little while to get to our cabin, which is not unlikely up in the Adirondacks, but something was off about that entire interaction. It bothered me all night. Around 11 p.m. my family went to bed, and I sat around a fire with my brother and his fiance. Every little noise I heard caused me to jump. My brother told me not to worry about it, and I was just worrying too much over nothing. I pretended everything was okay, but really, I was still uneasy about our unwelcomed visitors. Shortly after midnight, it was just my brother and I around the fire. We decided to let the last few logs burn out before we went inside. This is when Lewis decided to pay us another visit, but this time, 
he was not so friendly. My brother and I jumped out of our chairs and were now facing Lewis and Tito, who were coming out of the woods. They looked crazy. Lewis did not have that same charming personality as before. His eyes were bulging from his head, and he flashed his pearly white teeth in an almost sadistic way. Tito, who was almost a statue earlier in the day, stood next to Lewis, also smiling, and slowly approaching me and my brother. Lewis started to slowly approach us and said, This cabin really is lovely. I think we will be staying here now. He reached into his bag as if to pull something out. Tito, who was slightly behind him, was already wielding some sort of bushwhacking sword. Not trying to take any chances as to what Lewis was pulling out of the bag, my brother decided to tackle him. He went down with relative ease. As Tito approached my brother with the sword, I ran over and pushed him, strictly only using adrenaline as my motivator. Both men got up and backed away. Lewis, now standing about ten feet away, kept saying, You have no idea who I am and who you are messing with. I built this house. This is my land. After repeating this a couple of times, Tito finally spoke up as well and said in an almost robotic voice, We shall have our land back. We must wait for the right time. Tito grabbed the shoulder of Lewis, and they both ran into the woods. Remember, this is after midnight in the woods, so it was pitch black, other than a soft orange light from the dying fire. We put the fire out rather quickly and went inside the cabin and made sure all the doors and windows were locked. My brother and I stayed up all night and basically watched the property to make sure they did not return. I have never been so happy to see the sun in my entire life. The next day, we went to see the property owner and told him about the entire night. He said he had never heard the two names before and assured me that no Lewis ever built the house. The owner who we were renting the cabin from told us that he had built the cabin 10 years ago. So who were these two that claimed they had built the cabin? The owner was kind enough to refund us the rest of the nights we were supposed to stay at the cabin. I know this could have ended much worse for us, but all things considered, I am very lucky that I left with no more than some minor psychological damage. Be safe, everybody, and always lock your doors. You never know who could be creeping around. When I was a junior in college, I took a modern American literature course under a professor who I will call Dr. H. Her class took place right after the lunch period, so many of her students would come into the classroom looking like they were ready for a nap. Dr. H sympathized with us, so before she started the day's lecture, she would tell us an interesting story in hopes for waking us up a bit. Usually her stories were tidbits about the author we were studying that day. Some stories were more successful than others in getting our attention, but there was one story she told that got everyone's attention. She said that the story was a little long, but she thought we would find it interesting because, as she put it, the devil is in the details. Dr. H was a senior in college at the time this story took place. She shared a room with another senior, who she called S., they had both spent the day reading and working on papers for the week ahead, only breaking once to eat some sandwiches while listening to the radio. About 8 o'clock p.m., Dr. H and S decided to reward themselves with the rest of the night off. Dr. H had a novel that she had been dying to read, while S wanted to treat herself to some cocktails. S told Dr. H that she would only be gone for an hour, tops. She then said in a joking manner, If I'm not back in two hours... Make sure the police find my body. S decided to have a cocktail or two at a bar that was popular with her classmates because it was so close to campus. She sat down at the bar and ordered a dry martini. She did not notice that she was seated right next to a man until she looked up from her glass and was greeted with a smile. The man tipped his tumbler at her and said, Hello. S was immediately embarrassed, especially because there was an empty seat to her right. 
She was about to move to the other seat, feeling as if she had violated one of the unspoken rule of bars, but before she could get out of her seat, the man said, You don't have to move if you don't want to. I like the company. The man extended his hand to S and introduced himself as Chris. He said that he worked in construction and was renting a room in the area. He asked S what she was studying and she told him she was a psychology major. Chris's eyes lit up and to S's surprise, he began to talk about Freud and Jung. She told him she had to do an experiment for her final project and he asked her which method she would be using, an observational study or a survey. She told him she wanted to make a link between lack of empathy and the potentiality for criminal behavior. She told him she wanted to do an observational study, something similar to Milgram's controversial studies, but based on posing scenarios rather than shock experiments. Chris shook his head. You should do a survey instead. S pointed out that people could lie on a survey without thinking twice about it, but that it was a lot harder to lie to someone's face. Chris chuckled. Sweetheart, a psychology professor could look at a student, the same student, for three years and never have an inkling that the kid killed his mother and has her buried in his backyard. People can lie to your face if they want to keep a secret bad enough, but a true sicko can't refuse the chance to show his true colors on a survey because that guy wants to shock you. S listened as Chris argued that Jack the Ripper's letters from hell proved his point. But she had already decided that though Chris knew some things about psychology, his lack of knowledge was beginning to show. Nevertheless, S still appreciated how passionate Chris was about helping her make the right decision regarding her project. She eventually told Chris that she would bring up all the good points he had made to her professor, and this seemed to satisfy him. Though S was attracted to men her own age, Chris had a certain appeal. He was not bad looking for an older man, and most importantly, he was easy to talk to. Over the course of 45 minutes, they had talked about various subjects including psychology, politics, and places Chris had traveled to while working various construction jobs. In all that time, Chris had not hit on S once. If Chris was trying to seduce her, he was being admirably patient in his approach. He did offer to buy S another martini when she finished her first, and though S would have normally said no to the offer, she felt so comfortable around Chris that she let him buy her a drink. While she had carefully nursed her first martini, S quickly drained her second, and without asking permission first, Chris bought her another. S did not mind because she wanted to spend more time with Chris. It pleased her that Chris seemed to have no expectations for sex in return for his generosity. S's attention quickly turned momentarily from Chris to the television behind the bartender. The newscaster was giving a preview for the evening news, which included a story about a fatal car accident that had occurred earlier that morning. S told Chris that she had heard about the accident on the radio that afternoon. She said that she felt terrible because a whole family had been killed in a head-on crash. Chris replied, I wonder if anyone was beheaded. Then he chuckled. S was stunned by this sudden change in Chris's personality. It was like an invisible mask had quietly slipped off of Chris's face to reveal the true man underneath. S had an urge to leave the bar, but the psychology major in her was intrigued. She had read about inappropriate effect and emotional personality disorders, but she had never met someone who displayed any of those characteristics before. Any desire that she had to sleep with Chris was now over, but she thought that he might be an interesting story to share with her fellow psychology majors. S continued to listen as Chris started talking in graphic detail about some of the accidents he had seen at construction sites, including one guy whose hand and wrist got pulled into a cement mixer, and another guy who fell four stories from scaffolding and wound up in a twisted mess on the rubble below. The whole time he was talking about his fellow co-workers being maimed or killed on the job, Chris was smiling and giggling. S tried not to show her disgust, but when Chris followed up on a story of one of his co-workers being impaled by a piece of rebar by inviting S to his room for some real drinks, 
S suddenly remembered that she told her roommate she would be back in an hour. Chris's face was suddenly indifferent. Not angry or sad, but more cold and expecting. Most men would have tried to turn on the charm in hopes of salvaging the night with a potential conquest, but Chris had already caught the eye of a blonde that had just walked into the bar. S said goodnight. Chris gave her a little wave but said nothing. When S finally arrived back to her room, S apologized for being late. She told Dr. H that she had been talking with a man. Dr. H smiled at the news and said, So, what was he like? S replied, He was interesting, but not in a good way. Early that morning, Dr. H was woken up by a pounding sound on their door. She heard the RA shouting on the other side of the door, Wake up! The campus is on lockdown! Dr. H had to shake S awake. They went outside to the hallway and saw the other occupants on the floor standing in nightgowns and pajamas crying, whispering, or just looking dazed and confused. The RAs looked panicked and they spoke to each other in whispers. Dr. H learned through the various conversations that multiple girls had been brutally attacked on campus just minutes ago. Police believed that the killer could still be on campus. No one in that dorm at that moment knew the extent of what had just taken place. Later that morning, each girl in the dorm was asked if they had seen anyone strange that night. For a moment, S thought of Chris, but she told herself, more than likely, that Chris was with a woman right now. S told the officer no and thought nothing more about it. When a news report finally broke a month later showing that the campus killer had been apprehended, there was a collective sigh of relief and a few loud cheers from the young women gathered around the television. Dr. H smiled, but when she turned to look at S, her roommate was staring at the television. Her eyes were wide and her face looked pallid. S said, I think I'm going to throw up. It was not until two years later when Dr. H, who had just finished her master's degree, and S who was now a law student, were having brunch that the subject of that horrifying night was brought up again. Dr. H said that S suddenly looked like she was not feeling too good. Dr. H asked S what was wrong. There was a pause as S took a sip of her orange juice. Dr. H could see that S's hand was shaking. S finally spoke. That night at the bar... If Chris had asked me to go to his room 30 minutes into our conversation, I would have gladly gone. S began to tear up. She then added, I wonder if I would be here right now. The man S had drinks with that night was Ted Bundy. In 2007, when I myself was seven years old, my single mom began dating a man who lived in a campground, and she, my older brother and I soon moved in with him. While most campgrounds are seasonal and not intended for residential use, this particular campground had a large area up front dedicated to campers and a row of trailers in the background that people lived in full time. Most of the trailers were occupied by elderly folks who wanted a cheap place to live that was close to nature, and there was only one other family there with kids my age. It was lonely during the off-seasons when no families came to the camp, but during the summer, numerous families would stay there, giving me the opportunity to make new friends, and in some cases, reunite with the families that would visit on a yearly basis. Summers in the campground were lots of fun for a kid my age, there was a large pool in the center of the campground, a pavilion that would host parties practically every night, and plenty of new people coming in and out as the summer progressed. However, this influx of strangers made my mom weary, and she always stressed to me that not all grown-ups were nice, especially given how many were intoxicated during their vacation. Thankfully, I never really encountered anyone truly malicious in the seven years I lived there, a few oddballs and more drunks than I could count, of course, but most people were either nice or simply kept to themselves. However, one summer, a rumor had begun to spread amongst the kids in the campground. 
I was told that there was an elderly couple visiting that summer that had been caught a number of times, staring into people's windows, following them at night, and even supposedly intentionally walking in on people as they used the public showers. I didn't take this warning very seriously, since scary stories told between kids were the norm in a place like that, and I personally hadn't encountered any creepy old people. I suppose word of this got to my mom, because she reminded me to always close my blinds at night, just in case. Since she began to take it seriously, so did I, until the nights became unbearably hot, and I began keeping my window and blinds open at night, in order to let cooler air into my room. I had gone days without any strange encounters, so I figured the rumors were simply rumors, and continued to leave my windows open at night. One night, I was in bed playing my DS and watching old Disney Channel sitcoms at around 1 in the morning or so when I started to hear rustling outside. This wasn't particularly unusual since we had outside cats who liked to play in the leaves, and it wasn't uncommon for deer, raccoons, coyotes, and other wild animals to pass through our yard, entering and exiting the woods behind the line of trailers. When you live in the country, the nights can be just as lively as the days due to wildlife. However, the rustling seemed to be much louder than I was accustomed to. Whatever was making the noise wasn't nearly as light of foot as a typical animal. My bed was directly in front of my window, so I would have to turn my body completely around to look outside. And I was simply too tired to do so, even if it meant catching a glimpse of an elusive coyote. After a while, the noises stopped so they completely faded from my mind as I continued to play my game. About 15 minutes later or so, I heard an incredibly strange noise. However, it sounded like a fingernail scratching against the mesh screen of my window. I immediately started to feel anxious. The cats couldn't reach my window, and no wild animal would care to come that close to a bright window. Instinctively, I turned around to see what made the noise. Right outside my window was an elderly man, wide eyes and a big, toothless grin, face practically pressed against my window. His expression wasn't at all what I would have expected. He looked so genuinely happy to see me, as if he had been waiting all that time for me to turn around and notice him. Instead of screaming for my mom or my brother, I froze up, just staring at this face in my window for what felt like minutes but was probably more like seconds before I grabbed the blinds rod and rapidly twisted it, closing my blinds and throwing my blankets over my head. I remember trying to take shallow breaths, as though I were afraid he would hear me, despite already having seen me. I tried to convince myself it was just a hallucination, or maybe even my own reflection distorted, but I knew that what I saw was real. It was inches away from me, separated only by a thin mesh screen. At some point I must have fallen asleep, because as soon as I woke up, I rushed to tell my mom what had happened. She immediately called the campground's owners, pretty close friends of ours, and they informed us that the old man, along with his wife, had already been kicked out. Apparently, after I closed my blinds and shut him out, the old man went to another trailer with an open window, one belonging to one of my neighbors who was also still awake. She called the campground owners who immediately called the cops and they evicted him, along with his wife, who was apparently making her rounds, peering into the windows of the campers up front. They had been doing this for over a week and finally had been caught. To this day, I am not really sure what their motives were. It could have been a source of perverse pleasure to them, or it could have simply been an exciting hobby of theirs, seeing how long they could stare at people before they noticed. Regardless, this event shook me quite a bit, and it was a long time before I was comfortable even having my blinds open whatsoever. I was more than willing to suffocate in the summer heat if it meant not risking being spied on again. I lived in that campground for seven years, and my childhood was certainly interesting due to it. I mean, what kid doesn't want to live in a place that's a 24-7 vacation? But the voyeuristic couple who came to visit in the summer of 2008 definitely changed my perspective.
My wife and I traveled back to her hometown in Brisbane, Australia for the New Year holidays to spend some time relaxing in the sun with the extended family and friends. Unfortunately, it was ruined by an encounter with a creep who insisted, with a very vicious persistence, that I wear the party hat that came out of a bonbon I shared with him. For those who don't know, a bonbon is like a party cracker that two people pull from each end and break open. They contain a small trinket like a whistle, balloon, party hat, etc. I knew hardly anyone at the party except for my wife's immediate family, which totaled four people. There were about 20 people gathered. After dinner dessert was served, and along with it some festively decorated bonbons. I was seated next to a man of about 30. He looked relatively normal, except he hadn't touched a drop of alcohol the whole night and as far as I could tell, he was nursing the same ginger beer I saw him with when I first walked in. Apart from exchanging a friendly nod when I sat next to him, we had not said a word to each other. Then the bonbons came out, and I suddenly found myself being presented with one end of it by him. Other guests were already pulling theirs apart, so I obliged and pulled my end. A small folded square of paper flew out and into my lap. It was a party hat, purple, shaped like a crown, and made from what looked like tissue paper. I laughed and offered it to him. He stared pointedly at me, really cold, hard eyes. Put it on, mate, he said. It sounded more like an order. I instantly felt awkward and didn't know whether to laugh at his reaction or not. I excused myself and told him I'd give it to one of the kids, as it was clearly far too small to fit on my head. He did not like this answer. Hey, come on, it's a party. Just have some fun and put the hat on. He was visibly angry when he said it. My awkwardness peaked to an intolerable level, and I told him I'd go find one of the kids to give it to. I found my wife and asked who the guy was. She said she didn't know him, but knew his name was Jono, and took the hat from me. I saw he wasn't seated at the table anymore but was mingling about the room talking to other guests. But as he was talking to them, he would look over at me and even point me out and say something to the person. They looked confused and a little creeped out themselves, by the way. He was making a gesture like putting a hat on, too. Then, he would screw up his face when looking at me. A little later, I was having a small talk with my wife's brother-in-law when Jono came out of nowhere and said to him, you see this guy here? He looked disgustedly at me. He wouldn't even put the hat on. It's New Year's Eve and he wouldn't even have any fun. Her brother-in-law looked really confused and sort of just steered the conversation back to ourselves while trying to ignore him. As Jono left our chat, he said to me, coming in close to my ear, You'll wear that hat, even if I have to put it on your dead head myself. Well... When someone says something like that, what do you do? The whole rest of the evening was spent in nervous anticipation of another run-in with Jono. He was still there, of course, watching me from one side of the room or the other. Sometimes he would grin and make a weapon with his finger and go bang, 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 silently from across the room. I did, however, come face to face with him again that night as I went to the toilet. It was occupied and I stood waiting by the door. I heard the toilet flush and then the door opened. It was Jono. He looked me up and down, then put his arm across the door frame. Sorry, only for people who wear party hats. He looked defiant, psychotic, and very dangerous. Then he laughed and removed his arm. A few moments after I had entered the toilet, there was a massive bashing sound on the door. The door shook on its hinges. Once twice, then one final time which knocked the door handle off completely. Then Jono screaming at me from outside in the hall. Wear the hat. It's a party. Wear it. Then there was a weird silence. The only sound was the muffled music coming from the living room. Everyone was silent. It stayed like that for a few minutes, maybe more. Then I exited. Everyone seemed to be acting normally, and what's more, there was no Jono to be found. One guest, 
I didn't know their name, asked me if I had heard the guy banging his head against the toilet door, and I wasn't going to stick around to see if he was still there. I grabbed my wife and made an excuse to leave, and we got out of there. But it didn't end there. The next day, around 3 a.m., there were three or four sharp knocks on my front door. They definitely weren't from somebody's hand, sounded more like a hammer or something heavy. I opened the door very slowly and found no one there. Then I noticed it. Nailed to my front door with a ten penny nail through it was the purple party hat that I had pulled from the bonbon. We cut our holiday short and flew home the next day. My name is Riley, and I am a 26-year-old guy from Milwaukee. This story I'm about to tell is true and took place about three years ago. Here's a bit of background information. It was late summer, probably early September, and a group of my friends and I decided we wanted to go on an urban exploration. This was something we had done often in some of the more run-down areas of Milwaukee, usually its northern side. It was pretty risky stuff because of the area's history of drugs, gang violence, and squatters. However, we were always very careful in these situations and had pretty good luck with never running into any crazy people. You could say we were just fascinated about what was inside the buildings and it gave us a bit of a rush. The night we left, there was a small group of us going. Five in total. It was me and my friends, Jamie, Kevin, Vin, and Ty. We were all relatively the same age, except Ty, who was 29, and had gone to the same high school in the suburb of Bayside, where we had lived. My friend Jamie was the only girl going, and also happened to be the one who would drive us there, because she had a large SUV that could fit us all. She also happened to be Kevin's girlfriend at the time. Anyway, we drove up to North Milwaukee, past some very bad neighborhoods and many run-down buildings. The location we were going to was an old elementary school that had shut down back in the late 90s. We had learned about it through an Urban Explorer Facebook group and managed to get in contact with a guy who had been there twice. He told me that the building was quite large and had three floors as well as a basement floor that was completely destroyed due to flooding and exposure. He said that it still had a stage down there where the little kids would perform in plays and musicals. I also remember him telling me that he found some old costumes the kids used to perform in. But he also warned me that there was a lot of black mold and asbestos. Nonetheless, we parked in a large parking lot behind the school that at one point was a busy plaza, but was virtually empty now and was extremely cracked and had weeds growing all across it. We approached the back fence that separated the school playground and the lot. Most of the playground equipment was broken, rusted, or missing. We all walked together to a small opening in the fence by the swing set that would just allow you to get through if you were careful enough. Kevin stood at 6'5", and weighed about 230 pounds, so he knew he couldn't get through. It didn't matter, because we wanted one person to wait by the car so it wasn't broken into, and keep an eye out for cops or any weirdos who came in after us. However, Jamie sort of chickened out due to the weather and wanted to wait with Kevin, so we let her. Ty, Vin, and I got through the fence relatively easily and made our way across the playground towards the back doors of the school. Along the way I noticed a no trespassing sign a few feet away from the fence, but quickly pushed it out of my mind. There was once a chain on the double doors that kept people from entering the school, but someone had cut it long ago and kicked it off to the side where it laid coiled up and rusted. Now I'm going to talk about the weather that night because I think it adds a lot to the story. It was in the high 80s, but it felt much higher due to the humidity. In the distance, I remember there were large storm clouds, so I knew we had to hurry with the exploration. Vin had brought a camera with him and Ty was recording with his cell phone and had a flashlight app open. We never ended up needing the flashlight because enough light was trickling in through the broken ceiling and busted windows. 
As we entered, the door opened with almost no noise, but the floor was covered with pieces of broken ceiling, paint chips, trash, and dust. The air smelled very wet and musty. The temperature inside felt much hotter and more humid, but we just wiped our foreheads and held our water bottles in our hands. We looked around the floor, which was the ground floor, for about 15 minutes before we decided to move to the second floor. Ty suggested the basement, but the Facebook guy's description and the condition of the staircase changed all of our minds. Vin led the way, followed by me and Ty at the rear. The stairs were covered in debris, so our steps made very loud crunching noises all the way up the staircase. Keep this in mind. We had gone on these explorations many, many times and had never ran into anyone, except a very nice homeless woman and her dog many years ago who told us to stay off drugs. You could say we were overconfident and had our guard down. We reached the second floor, which had many more classrooms than the bottom floor. Many of the rooms were completely trashed, either due to the weather or vandals who had come in. The desks laid all over the floor, either broken or knocked over. Most of the windows were boarded up or broken, and graffiti covered almost every inch of the building that we had seen. However, some rooms were spared, and looked as if the students who once sat in them had just vanished into thin air while nature slowly took the building. Many of the desks still had supplies in them, the coat hooks still had coats on them, and the chalkboard still had writing on it. Ty even found a desk plate with a teacher's name on it. It read, Miss Johnson, after we wiped away the dust. I eventually found a folder in one of the desks that belonged to a kid named Kiana. I gathered that she was a girl who was in fourth grade, and even saw a date on one of her old assignments that indicated it was from February of 1999. Many of the rooms that were in better shape had things like this, so we eventually got bored and decided it was time to move on. As we approached the staircase to the third floor, I had a strange feeling in the pit of my stomach. The kind of feeling you get when you think someone is about to jump out and scare you any minute. I told Ty and Vin about it, and Ty told me not to be a wimp and to just keep moving, because he was starting to hear thunder in the distance. I noticed that it was starting to get cooler in the building, and it was much easier to breathe as we walked up to the third floor. It was here where we would run into a strange and frightening situation. I noticed that the third floor of the school was different from any other floor. The floor had much more trash on it, trash that appeared to be fairly recent. A lot of the old furniture was put in the back part of the first hallway we had turned into and piled, very high. Then, Ty said something that for whatever reason gave me a cold chill up my spine. He noticed that the floor was not nearly as dusty and had fresher footprints than any we had seen earlier. We walked for a few more minutes, and I could tell that we were very nervous about running into someone. Just before we reached a hallway with a lot of classrooms, I decided to text Kevin to see if there was any strange activity outside. He replied within 10 seconds and said that it looked normal, but that it was going to rain any second. I told him to stay focused and message me if anything odd happened. We looked through many of the old rooms and found nothing but trash, old furniture, and rubble. One of the rooms Vin had walked into had half of its floor caved in. He was lucky that he saw it when he did. A few more minutes went by and I heard Ty say, Dude, check this out. Me and Vin walked over to him and saw that he was holding a bag full of old used syringes. The needles looked very old, and the plastic Ziploc bag holding them was torn and tattered. I told him to drop the bag before he got hepatitis or something. We all sort of chuckled and continued to walk down the hall toward the furniture pile. We noticed that behind this pile was a staircase that was completely filled with old shelves, chairs, and tables. To our right was a large room that was relatively clear, but had mattresses scattered about. There were a lot of cigarette butts laying on the floor, and an old rusted oil drum was in the middle of the room. Vin said that the room used to be a library because of a small plaque he had seen above the doorway. It made sense to me why there were so many shelves and chairs piled up right outside. 
As we got closer to the far end of the room, we examined the mattresses. There were about five of them, and they were all very dirty and torn up. Some had disgusting-looking stains and had horrible body odor smells to them. Vin noticed a small stack of dirty magazines by a bed on the farthest side of the room. We all got a giggle out of it. The room had two large windows parallel to each other, but they were boarded up and allowed almost no light into the room. As we got to the back of the room, we heard the sound of music being played. All of us froze in unison as the door swung open. There was a man at the entrance of the door. The look on his face told us that he was not happy that we were there. He was average height, had a shaved head, and a short scruffy beard. He wore a faded brown shirt and some old white basketball shorts. His shoes were white at some point, but now they had a stained brown look to them. He was a white man. His whole body was covered in a thick layer of dirt. I will never forget his eyes. They were a very pale blue and looked like the eyes of a wolf. However, at the same time, I noticed the man behind him who gave me chills. This man never once stood up and sat on a lawn chair with his left shoulder pointing towards us. He turned his head to look at us. The man had bright pink hair tied in a ponytail and appeared to have no teeth at all. He looked very skinny and his skin looked tight and pale. His eyeballs bulged slightly and gave him an even more frightening appearance. He wore a white t-shirt and black shorts. This man never once said a word to us. The man at the door spoke in a very rough and direct voice. He asked us what we were doing in the building and if we were cops. Ty answered first and told him that we were just documenting the old historical buildings in the area and that we had no intention of bothering anyone. The man appeared to relax more and asked us how long we were wanting to stay. I jumped in and told him that we were just about done and that we had to head out before the weather got bad. The man lit a cigarette and asked us if we wanted one, but we all declined. He then offered to give us a tour of the building, but we all quickly and in unison said no to the offer. The man's demeanor changed again as a dark and angry look fell on his face, almost as if we offended him by refusing the tour. He eventually chuckled and said, Okay. He introduced himself as Walter and said the pink-haired man was Ronnie. To our surprise, the man cupped his hands as he hollered out quite loudly for someone named Marty. There was no reply, and the bald man said that he must have gone to go number two somewhere. As we talked for a few more minutes, I took out my cell phone and saw that Kevin had messaged me several times. The messages said that a man had walked into the building about a minute ago and that we needed to get out of there as soon as possible. The man asked us how many of us there were altogether. I lied and told him seven, because at this point I was ready to crap my pants and the feeling in my stomach was coming back. There was something off about these guys. Something told me that they were very dangerous. Vin and Ty obviously felt the same way and had very worried looks on their faces. All the while the radio continued to play, but Walter ordered Marty to turn the radio off and that it was giving him a migraine. As he did it, two things entered my head. He said the pink-haired guy was Ronnie, not Marty, and that as Ronnie or Marty or whoever the heck reached for the radio, I noticed a bungee cord wrapped around his arm and a syringe in it. I don't think Walter noticed any of the things I was picking up on, but before anything could happen, another man entered the room. This guy was by far the weirdest and most unsettling of the group. He was fairly short and had medium-length Bieber-style dark hair. His clothes looked much newer, but far too big for him. He had a blue Milwaukee Brewers t-shirt tucked into his oversized red sweatpants. His face looked sharp and leathery, but he appeared to have some sort of skin condition. His eyes were a beady black color and wide open. Parts of his face were a very bright pink, and he had a large amount of bumps on the lower corner of his bottom lip. He spoke in a more high-pitched rural accent. 
The other two men remained where they had been. Walter in the doorway and Marty or Ronnie in his chair. The new man said that his name was George and that he was very interested in Vin's camera. He asked what kind it was, where Vin got it, how much it cost, and why he had it. Vin explained that his hobby was filming videos and that he would often photograph at weddings and other events. This was all true, and the man immediately perked up and smiled. The kind of smile that gives you an uneasy feeling in your gut. The best way to describe it would be how the Grinch smiled in the old animated movie. As creepy as that was, this is when it gets really creepy. He asks Vin if he has ever recorded any little girl's beauty pageants or stuff along that line. Vin told him no, and the man genuinely looked disappointed. He went on to say some more creepy stuff about how hot the girls in these pageants were and that he would die to be able to be alone with them. Our faces told the story of how we felt hearing this, but the man seemed oblivious. He asked us all if we had any kids of our own. Ty slipped up and told him that he had two twin girls who were two years old. The man giggled in a very creepy and cringy way. He then asked Ty if he ever left the girls alone by themselves, or if he had a babysitter. Ty told him that he and his fiance watched the kids the majority of the time, but would occasionally have his aunt babysit them if they could not. George asked Ty if he had any photos of the girls. Ty showed him a few on his phone, and the man asked a very strange question. He asked if he would allow his daughter to date a guy like him. By this point, I'm sure Ty wanted to drop this creep, but he also knew that the other two were behind us and could possibly have knives or something else. So instead, he said he would have to get to know him more. The man giggled again and said that he could get to know them when he babysat them. The tone of his voice still gives me chills. It was said in such a slow, seductive type of way that left little doubt as to what this guy was. I saw Ty's brow drop and knew that he was getting pretty upset. I took my phone out and texted Kevin to honk his horn a bunch of times. As I did this, the creepy weirdo stepped toward me and asks me who I was messaging. He was close enough for me to smell his bourbon breath. I leaned back slightly and told him we needed to leave soon before the weather got really bad. Walter spoke again and said that we might as well stay since the storm would begin any moment and he didn't want us to get wet. Vin explained that we had two friends waiting in a car for us outside. Just as he said that, we could hear a car horn blaring outside. Both the creep and the bald man showed no reaction to what happened and insisted that we stay and invite our friends in. We all stood there and explained that we had to leave, and eventually they agreed. Nonetheless, George insisted that he walk us out, and so we walked and got to the ground floor. As we crossed the floor, we could hear this creepy man muttering to himself and giggle every now and then. We stepped outside and the weather was much cooler. The air smelled of ozone and there was a static feeling in the air as small droplets of rain hit my face. George walked us over to the area of the fence we had entered. Ty slipped out first, followed quickly by Vin. They both stumbled down the steep hill and were waiting for me to go. As I tried to go through the fence, George pushed it against my chest. I was on edge, but it still caught me off guard. I gasped, and he leaned in real close. The smell of bourbon made me turn my head slightly. I will never forget what he said to me in a very quick burst. I know you know what I am. It doesn't matter because I like it. You're lucky that fine girl was in the car with that fat guy, or I would have done whatever I wanted to her. As he said whatever, he said it much slower, seductively, and emphasized like he had earlier and licked his lips slowly at the end of the sentence. His beady eyes widened as he let go of the fence. I quickly slipped through and tumbled down to the concrete. I was totally fine, but I looked up to the creepy psycho. 
Ty, Vin, Kevin, and Jamie were all there to help me up. They all looked up at the man in shock, and Ty hurled an insult at him. George slowly rose up and looked at Ty through the fence. He put his tongue on the chain link fence and made a licking motion. He winked, giggled, flashed his Grinch smile, and said his last words to us. For your girls. And gave a very direct point to Ty. It took everything we had to keep Ty from going after him. But eventually we lost sight of George and we got Ty to calm down. We sat in the car as our adrenaline rushes damped and left us feeling exhausted. We told Kevin and Jamie everything we had seen, heard, and felt. It was in the car that we decided to make this our last urban exploration ever. We all agreed unanimously that this was too close of a call. As I sat in the car, I kept thinking about each of the men we had seen. Who exactly were they? They were obviously addicts of some kind, but something seemed off about each of them. The pink-haired man said nothing and was like a ghost. The bald man said little, but his wolf-like eyes spoke so much, and the creepy man couldn't stop talking. I would later try to find these men on a website that posted jail mugshots. I could never find them, until a few weeks ago Vin sent me a link to a sex offender registry website. My heart nearly stopped. Pictured was the guy who said his name was George. He looked much younger and his hair was shorter, but it was undeniably him. He even had the same creepy smile in the photo. However, his real name was Charles Earl Daly. He was a wanted sex offender from Arkansas who was considered to be a very high-risk offender, and possibly armed. Reading about his crimes made me want to vomit and made me angry that it had taken us so long to find something on this guy, but I was amazed that Vin had found something. I eventually told the police about how we ran into this guy, but nothing came of it because the old school was officially torn down several months ago and I had no idea. Life has gone on normally. Our groups of friends still talk, hang out, and reminisce about our exploration days. Nonetheless, the number one thing we always talk about is whatever happened to those men. Where is Charles Earl Daly? Who wasn't fortunate enough to escape from these guys? It still sends a shiver up my spine to think about the danger that we were in. A cold, cold shiver. I work in food service, front of house. So, in the early days of the pandemic, with restaurants closed, I was taking work wherever I could find it. An old friend clued me into a medical office that needed someone to come in and do a bit of light filing. I was able to go in at night to limit direct contact with people, so I jumped at the opportunity right away. Ironically, the medical office job had been the safest gig I had been offered thus far. I wanted to avoid the bus if I could, due to crowds, so decided to swing for a rideshare app. It's not all that expensive in my area, and I really didn't want to get the virus. I headed in at almost 3 a.m. because it was after the cleaning crew had left. I was kicking myself for being so cautious, though, because I was exhausted. I stumbled onto the block looking for my ride, and to my tired self's great relief, the car spotted me almost immediately and pulled up asking, Uber? While I cluelessly wandered up and down the street searching. The ride was taking a while, but I had only just moved here last year, so I'm not familiar with all of the surrounding areas, and thought nothing of it. I was pretty alert at first, so I was trying to pass the time playing games on my phone and stuff, but the car didn't have a compatible phone charger, and I wasn't sure the building would have one, so I wanted to save my battery to be able to call a ride back. I shut my phone down into airplane mode, and eventually drifted off from a combination of tiredness and boredom, I don't often take rideshare, so being alone with a strange driver often put me a bit on edge. But this guy had a pretty boring car and a very standard look about him. He looked a little like my brother even. Young, clean-kept, 
listening to jazz. Nothing that screamed, you need to micromanage this trip. When we arrived, the driver tried to wake me up by calling to me from the front, but I was in too deep of a sleep and couldn't fully distinguish it from my dream. Finally, he awkwardly jimmied my leg to wake me up and kept saying, Ma'am, ma'am, we're here now. I was embarrassed that I had been that out of it, so I just gave a hurried, uh, thanks, and booked it out of the car and into the building. As I looked around, I began to realize nothing was what I had expected of an office park. I had seen a street view of the building when I first looked up the business, and it had appeared to be a strip mall plaza. The further I went, the more loudly alarm bells were ringing in my gut. The structure was semi-dilapidated, and it was pitch black dark past the entryway. I expected some lights to be off in the nighttime, but not to the whole building. I skittered across the concrete foundation comprising what was left of the lobby area, told myself they must just be renovating, and followed signs for the stairs. After what felt like ages but was likely just a few minutes, all I had passed was construction equipment, a couple locked doors, and some smashed windows. I was certain I was not going to find a medical office and figured maybe I had mixed up the address. I took out my phone to double check, but once I got it out of airplane mode, I could barely get a signal. I kept moving around in the building, pacing, looking for a stronger signal. I eventually confirmed in my texts that I had written down the correct address just by scrolling back, which didn't require service. Since I had only been inside for a few minutes at most, I figured I would try to get in touch with the driver, because if I entered the correct address, then it was only fair he should continue my ride to the correct place and save me the added fees of calling a second trip, considering this was all his mix-up. The app was taking forever to load with my slow service, but before I could get to a cloud of reception, I heard a rustling sound in the lower level of the building. I was on the top floor, and the only stairwell I was aware of was the one I had taken up, so it would force me into the middle of the building. There was no way to exit the situation without encountering whoever was downstairs. In an abandoned building in the latest hours of the night, I figured the chances were high that it was a tweaker, and I had no desire to try slipping past a tweaker, especially when it was late enough that they were probably on something, so jumpy and on edge. I tried to get a text out to a group of friends with my address and a request to call 911 to help get me from the property because I didn't feel safe walking in that neighborhood at night and didn't have enough reception to call a new ride, but the message wasn't sending. Reception was too weak, so I gave up on getting my phone going and started checking for another stairwell or even a window with a balcony or dumpsters that could be used to exit the second floor as a last resort in the event whoever was downstairs came upstairs. I scrambled over to a door with a stairs sign on it, but the stairs were completely dilapidated and it was essentially just a straight drop down to the first floor. At that point, the worst case scenario began to unfold. I heard whoever was downstairs begin making their way up the stairs. I thought fast and figured based on my walk, the floor was basically a giant loop so I would have to wait for whoever this was to come up the stairs, wait for them to come all the way up, and then sprint the opposite direction of wherever they were going and try to get down the stairs and out of the building in time to make it to the road without encountering them. I was not anticipating being chased or anything, but didn't want to piss off a druggie or have a homeless person who might have been living there feel as though I had trespassed and become hostile towards me or have any sort of interaction that could possibly occur at that hour in an abandoned industrial park. I held my breath for what felt like five minutes, but was likely closer to just 30 seconds. And the person appeared at the top of the stairs. To my great relief, it was just the Uber driver. I figured he had come back for me, realizing he had left me in the wrong spot, a place that could have worked out to be dangerous. So I came out from the beam I was hidden behind and started to wave him down. But then I processed. There was no way for him to realize this had been the wrong address. My stomach lurched forward and my blood chilled to slush. I made eye contact with him very briefly and he was completely calm and composed, but breathing pretty heavily. 
and blocking the stairwell down. On a normal, rational day, as an outside observer, I could think of a dozen innocent reasons he might have returned. But in that moment, standing across from him, I just knew in my gut that this was someone with ill intent. I can't remember much more from the ensuing few minutes. Operating solely on muscle memory and instinct, I superman dove from the second stairwell's opening and just let myself fall down the drop. Thankfully, I don't think he had seen where I had gone at first, and though I was in too much pain to know it then, plenty was bruised, but nothing was completely broken. I scrambled up and threw myself at anything that seemed like it could be the door. It was too dark to tell. I was disoriented from the fall, and I wasn't in a calm enough mindset to think to use my phone flashlight. Plus, in hindsight, some part of me probably knew it would call too much attention to my location. Just before I was able to reach the door, it flew open with a blinding light beaming straight into my eyes. My first thought, though not totally coherent, was, there's another one of these guys, and I stumbled backwards, trying to find something to hide behind. Before I could, a voice called out, All right, this is the police department. Everyone get on your knees with your hands in the air. I didn't believe it was the police at first. I was in such a fight or flight mode and had already committed to flight that I continued looking for ways to get out. But he kept shining the flashlight right at me as I teetered around and he yelled, Hey, I said get on the ground. Right now. Hands out. Hands out where I can see them. He sounded so authoritative that I just automatically did exactly as he asked. He approached me and finally shined the light away from me. It took a second to get my night vision, but once I did, I could see he was really a police officer. I tried to explain what was happening, but first he started asking me all these questions, and that, combined with what had just happened and my fear of the driver coming back, all snowballed into my being unable to perform a single articulate sentence. He was even asking easy questions too, like, Can you tell me your name? Do you have any knives, needles, or anything that could poke or cut me? Would you rather talk in here or outside? And my total stunned babbling in response, at first led him to believe that I was on something. He directed me out to his car, and once I was safely out of the building, I was able to start getting my bearings just a little. I sat on the edge of the back seat of the squad car, with the door open facing out, while he stood across from me and asked the same questions again. The first thing I could think to ask was, Did my friends call you? What did they tell you? And he explained, No, nobody called him. He was patrolling the area and noticed a car idling outside of the building that is known to be condemned and nobody is supposed to be inside. And he said, when they are, they are not up to no good. He was launching into a speech about how if I had gone to shoot up or meet a John, he had resources he could direct me to, and that this was not an ideal place to do either of those things, and asking if I had somewhere safe to stay that night. But I was stuck on something else he had said. Finally, it all clicked. The car... I spilled my whole rideshare story in a frantic word vomit. He looked around, and the car wasn't there anymore. The officer guessed the guy had driven off while we were talking inside the building. He asked me all the details I remembered, and I told him, but there weren't many. I had been too tired when the ride started to track much, but the officer realized I could pull up my Uber app and get all the information. There wasn't really enough reception there, even outdoors, so we sped down the road, and once I had enough bars, the app roared to life. And I had four missed notifications from Uber. They said, Hello, I've arrived. And, I don't see you. Can you confirm the pickup address is correct? And, I am flashing my hazards. And finally, unfortunately, your driver had to cancel. At first... I thought the driver was so cunning as to pick me up while sending these fake messages and canceling so the GPS wouldn't track us, knowing I wouldn't notice because I was asleep with my phone off and exonerating himself. But instead, I checked the car details, checked again, and it was definitely not the same driver. 
the person who had driven me there had not been my Uber. My driver was somewhere else on the street when this guy pulled up to me. The policeman took my statement and said they would keep an eye out for the guy, but the best I could give them to go off of was basically young-looking man with brown hair, sideburns, goatee and four-door sedan, wearing a zip-up sweatshirt, maybe had a hood, which is basically one out of every four guys in this city. I feel so blessed to have survived this near miss. Suffice it to say, I do not take rideshare services anymore. Quadruple check your license plate and driver name. You just never know. A few months ago, I, 22, was at the local coin laundromat. I went late because I had been studying around 10 p.m. The laundromat is pretty small, closer to the edge of the beach town I live in. The town is pretty well known for drifters and people experiencing homelessness. Most people are friendly, and there is a lot of drug use, but I had never really felt scared. Everything was fine until I went to move my laundry to a dryer. I was listening to music on my headphones, but not super loudly. Suddenly, I just got the feeling that someone was watching me. I can't really explain it. I just felt the presence. I turned around and there was a man standing just a few feet away from me. He had pink hair, wearing a full face mask, like a ski mask, a hoodie, gloves and sunglasses, even though it was dark out. The gloves and sunglasses especially immediately made me feel uncomfortable. I thought maybe he was a drifter or high, but I didn't want to be rude. I tried to laugh it off and told him he surprised me. He immediately started talking. A lot of it was disjointed and just didn't make sense. He was talking about coming up from Brazil to bring his brother money to get a classic car. None of it made much sense, but he would ask me questions and wait for me to respond, so I tried to just play along. I still thought he was probably just high or something, but he was standing between me and the only door, and I started getting this gut feeling that he was blocking the door on purpose, not just accidentally as he talked to me. He was getting closer to me as he talked, and the feeling got stronger. Logically, something was off, but mostly, I just had this feeling in the pit of my stomach that I needed to leave and keep him talking until I could. I started to edge to the side, but he stayed in front of me, and the feeling got more intense. I started to grip my keys in attack position just in case. He talked more and then backed off a little. He took off his backpack, which was a child's unicorn backpack, and set it on a nearby dryer. I looked over to the door just for a second, and when I looked back, he was pulling something I couldn't see out of it and holding it to the side, behind him where I couldn't see it. But I did see what was in his backpack duct tape. Instantly, it was just like an alarm went off. There was no more worrying about being rude. No more second-guessing myself that he was just off, but harmless. It was like this cold, numb dread just washed down over me. I almost felt calm, like I knew the next steps. Knew I had to do something. Time seemed to move in slow motion, and he turned back to me, not saying anything anymore, and took a step forward. I gripped my keys as tightly as possible and tried to mentally prepare to fight. I remember being afraid that I would move too slow or be too weak, like in a nightmare. But all of a sudden, the door to the laundromat opened and a woman walked in, barely even looking at us as she went in to get her laundry. It was like a scene in a movie, a moment of intensity just interrupted by something innocuous, and suddenly, it's over. He just turned, got his bag, and left. I was so scared, I just stayed there a minute until I could get my laundry and just go home. I didn't report it. I never knew what to say, since nothing had actually happened. But when I think about it, I think the scariest thing is that he left as soon as someone walked in. If he was just crazy, it wouldn't have mattered. 
I think a stranger's laundry timer saved me from something terrible. I don't go to the laundromat anymore. I joined a laundry service. The extra cost is worth it to never have to go back. For some background, there's an app called Life360 where you can add your friends and family on. And essentially, you can all see each other's current and past locations. You can set alerts to be notified when someone comes home, or leaves, arrives at work, etc. It's a really great app, and I recommend it to everyone. You can never be too safe nowadays. Two months ago, I was at home, waiting for my boyfriend to get home. I got an alert at around 6 o'clock, letting me know that he had left work. It usually took him around 45 minutes to get home. I got up from the sofa and headed upstairs to run myself a bath. My bath was ready in about 10 minutes, and as I was doing other things, waiting for it to cool, I heard a thud downstairs, and through the closed bathroom door, assumed that it was the front door. I shouted something along the lines of, I'm taking a bath. I heard him walking along our very creaky floorboards and assumed he was in the kitchen grabbing some dinner. It was about five minutes later when I picked up my phone to put on some music and realized I never got an alert on my phone from Life360 saying my boyfriend arrived home. So I went into the app to make sure, and I kid you not, my blood ran cold when I saw that my boyfriend stopped at a gas station and was still about half an hour away. I could still hear the floorboards creaking downstairs very lightly, as if someone was trying to tiptoe, but was unable to. I had no idea what to do. I called my boyfriend. He didn't answer, and when I didn't hear his phone ring from downstairs, I freaked out even more. I have horrible anxiety, and I could feel an attack coming on. I left the bathroom and walked into the bedroom as quietly as possible. I shoved my desk chair under the knob as it didn't have a lock. I don't know why, but I didn't think to call the police then. I was so focused on getting out that all my other thoughts and senses just disappeared. I say this lightly now, but this was not the case in the moment. I proceeded to basically mission impossible out of the room. We had a shed under the window, large enough for me to safely get on top of it, and then jump off of it into the garden. The only issue was that I had to make my way down the garden alley, where I would have to walk past the large window and door, where he would be able to see me very clearly. I was so scared. I kept taking peeks into the window and couldn't see anyone. I felt more confident to run past and took one last peek, and he was there looking right at me, not even a foot away from the window. I can't even begin to explain the sheer fear and horror I felt. Looking him right in the eyes, he had such a cold expression, totally emotionless. I ran, didn't look back. I was terrified. I remember nearly tripping in my slippers and having to shake them off so I could run faster. There was a long road between us and our neighbors, where I was running to. I did make it. Their lights were on, and I started pounding on their window. I was let in, and they called the police for me, as I was inconsolable at that point. I kept telling them to please call my boyfriend, as he was on his way home. When the police arrived, they found no one there. We didn't have any cameras, and neither did my neighbors so we had no way of telling when or how he entered and left. I later found out he came through the window. That was the noise I heard, which I assumed was the door, was actually the window that fell downward and shut loudly, after I assume the man came in. There were also some scratches on the top of the chair that I put under the doorknob, signaling he had tried to push it open, but was unable to. There wasn't much of a case, I couldn't ID him. I don't even know what color hair he had, only that he was tall, slim, and a man. 
I only looked right at him for a mere second, if that. Nothing was stolen either. We have cameras and a security system now. Never making that mistake ever again. A few years ago, I was working as a healthcare assistant at the hospital, and recently having moved out of my dad's home, I had started renting a small detached home in the countryside. I had one neighbor on this street, a man in his late thirties who I will call Jake. He was single and lived alone. My first encounter with Jake was when I was moving in. My dad couldn't accompany me on my first day of moving due to his work schedule, so I was unpacking by myself. Jake walked up to me, introduced himself, and offered to help with moving my heavy items. I am very small, so I appreciated the help. My first impressions were that he was very kind, open, and polite. He chatted to me about his job, told me that he liked to play instruments and write in his spare time. We bonded over both loving the band Tool, and we both enjoyed playing the bass. The next day, I brought him some beer as a thank you. He wasn't in, however, so I left it by his front door and included a thank you note for all the previous help the day prior. Over the next few weeks as I settled in, Jake would pop by. We would chat about music, discuss shared hobbies, drink beer, and occasionally even watch movies together. I was new to the area and didn't have many friends yet, so he helped provide some social interaction outside of my job. But as you can already tell, things didn't stay so good. I got home one evening to see a basket full of flowers on my doorstep and an included card which read that it was from Jake and he wanted to speak with me when I had the time. I walked inside with the basket. I didn't even get a chance to put it down before I heard knocking at my door. It was around 11 p.m. and I wasn't expecting anyone. I looked through the window next to the door to see Jake waving at me. I opened the door, and that's the first time I can recall where I started to feel uneasy around him. He asked if I saw the basket and if I liked it. He asked to come in, but I said something along the lines of how tired I was and that we should just speak tomorrow. He didn't say anything for a few seconds before he asked if I would want to grab a coffee with him before work tomorrow. I said sure and closed the door. That next morning, we grabbed coffee that was close to the hospital I worked at. He seemed very excited and giddy. Soon after, he asked me to be his girlfriend. I had to decline, as we had only known each other for a few weeks. And well, he was significantly older than me. He suddenly dropped his cheery demeanor, as if he had became someone else in a matter of seconds. He grabbed his things and left, saying only that he had to go to work. I went to work too, and tried not to think too much on it. I had to work overtime that night, and started heading home at around midnight. When I pulled up to my home, I saw Jake sitting on my doorstep. I really, really didn't want to get out of my car, but I did, and walked up to him. He started off politely, asking if I had thought over his proposal. I said no, that I'm sorry, but I'm not interested. Once again, as if a switch had flipped, he went off on me, calling me spoiled and ungrateful. I was scared at that point and asked him to leave. He wouldn't. I managed to get to my car with him following me and showed him through the window that I'm calling the police. He swore at me and left. I didn't call the police that night. I gave him the benefit of the doubt, thinking he was just frustrated. One of my biggest regrets was not calling them. The next morning, I found wildflowers that looked like they were picked from a garden at my front door, as well as a post-it note with the word, sorry, and a sad face drawn on it. At work that day, I was called by the nurse in charge, who took me aside, saying my boyfriend was here to see me, as it's urgent. She also told me to tell my boyfriend that he should not come to see me at work again, especially since I wasn't on break as it's unprofessional. It was Jake. 
He wanted to ask me if I had gotten his flowers and message. I went off on him, saying things along the lines of how dare he come to my work, getting me in trouble no less, pose as my boyfriend. All of this took place in the canteen. He didn't say anything, didn't apologize. I told him to knock it off, and I left. Things only got worse from there. He would often wait for me when I got home, try to bribe me with gifts, more flowers. He even went as far and got me a new guitar. I accepted nothing, and always left everything where he had put it. I eventually broke down to my dad, who asked if I wanted him to speak to Jake. I said no. He offered for me to move back in with him, but I had too much pride and declined. My dad was really worried about me. One day, everything came to a halt when I came home to my front door, ajar, though not broken. My front room looked absolutely ransacked. I ran to my car and called the police. Nothing was missing, absolutely nothing, but my front room, kitchen, and bedroom were all rummaged through. I told the police I had an inkling it was Jake, who they ended up questioning, but his friend vouched for him and said they were together that evening, so it couldn't have been Jake. I still don't believe that. I tried to tell the police everything that has been happening with Jake and how I was starting to feel very unsafe. However, I had no proof but the notes he had left me, which weren't threatening. So since there was no threat to life or well-being, they literally could do nothing. My dad helped me clean everything up, and I had my locks changed. Jake actually left me alone for a little while after that. I started looking for a new place to live around that time. Then, one evening, I had come home, ate some food, showered, and went to bed. Only to be awoken, I'm not sure when, to somebody standing in my doorway. I didn't move. I remember originally thinking I was having a sleep paralysis episode, but after moving my fingers, I realized I was fully awake, with a dark figure clearly standing in my doorway. My phone was under my pillow, so I rolled over to my side, pretending to still be asleep, and I just waited, with my hand under my pillow on my phone. There was no way I could call the police without alerting the person in my doorway. Eventually, I could hear the footsteps fade, and I called the police only telling them my address and that someone just broke into my home and that I think they're still here. I got out of bed, grabbed the keys on my nightstand, and got out of the house by going out my window and bolting to my car. I had on a tank top and shorts. I didn't even have shoes on, which made driving horrible. I saw him then when I was pulling out, standing in the kitchen through the window. It was Jake. I had a small essential oil diffuser next to the window that shined enough light to be able to tell who the figure was. I drove as I spoke to the police. I remember just completely detaching from reality. At least, that's what it felt like. I drove to my dad's house. After looking over my house, the police drove to my dad's home where I was. I told them everything about Jake, how he had been following me, coming to my work, waiting for me when I got home, and now I was 100% sure he broke into my home and was planning to do God knows what. I was told that they found my front door locked when they got there and went to knock on Jake's door. He answered and looked as if he had just woken up. They asked him some questions and left him alone. It is so unimaginably hard to prove that you're being stalked in the UK. I managed to get a restraining order on the grounds of harassment, with proof that he had come to my workplace posing as my boyfriend, and a co-worker who could support me in this as she had overheard our conversation, where I had asked him to stop following me. I had also saved some texts that he sent me, where I asked how he got my number, and told him to stop contacting me, but he went on to send some vaguely threatening messages along the lines of, I'll be waiting when you come home today. Which along with the workplace incident, as well as the fact that I had mentioned Jake to the police when my house was broken into, managed 
to get me my restraining order. I went back to that house once, with my dad and his friend, to gather all my things. I did not see Jake that time, or ever again for that matter. I had to transfer workplaces back to my original workplace as I moved back in with my dad. I am now moved away and live alone again, trying to put the past behind me, but this definitely messed with me a little. I had to get some therapy and found it difficult to develop friendships, especially romantic relationships. He somewhat ruined that for me. I have not made any new friends since, never had a boyfriend either. I find it very hard to trust people outside of work colleagues and family. Once I got off work one night, I went straight to bed, and that was around 5 o'clock in the evening. I guess you can say I'm not really a night owl because my job schedule varies throughout the week. Either I'm working at night or I'm working in the morning. This day, I had to work in the morning, so I stayed up the night earlier. I woke up around 9 p.m. I got up to talk to the family, watched some TV, then started getting tired again. This was around 1 a.m. and I decided to go back to bed, and I actually felt the weight of sleeping this time. Once I got my bed ready, I put YouTube on for a little background noise and just started to drift off. Then all of a sudden, everything was quiet. Then I dreamed about waking up in a building. A building I have dreamt of before, but not for a long time. I was laying on a sleeping bag in a decrepit room with no furniture. I wasn't scared, but confused. The door leading outside suddenly swings open with someone walking in, then slamming it shut. Then I was automatically pushed out of the dream as I was jolted awake. I was laying there thinking maybe I was just experiencing sleep apnea and tried to get up, but I couldn't. I couldn't move my arms, my legs. It's like I left my body for the next minute of what I'm about to tell you. I have had experiences with sleep paralysis before, but not to this extent. Once I knew my body went numb, I started to panic, started to breathe heavily. It was unbearably longer than it should have been. For me, it would last around 30 seconds at most, and I haven't even experienced the large weight on my chest yet. That's what I was actually waiting for, and I guess my body was trying to prepare for it because the dread was like a sharp knife point, and it just kept jabbing me each passing second. Then, I stopped breathing because what happened next made my heart stop, and my blood cold. In close proximity of my ear, I heard someone say, Hey. It sounded like a woman whispering in my ear. I was so disturbed I tried to call out for help, but I knew that couldn't work because I couldn't even breathe out a syllable. I tried to break free of this invisible bind, but I gave up and knew I had to rough through it. The next thing I know, something sits on my chest, but it wasn't the normal weight I would experience in these episodes. It was something lighter that felt less aggressive. It felt like fingertips caressing across my chest in a sensual way laying down on my right peck. It was followed by a leg wrapping itself on the front of my thighs. The next thing I know, the left side of my body was being weighed upon like someone would be cuddling up next to me. Just for the record, I don't have a girlfriend, and I doubt anyone in my house would start sneaking into my room at night. I was frightened and confused. I still couldn't move. Then the woman's voice came back. What are you doing? It said in a very quiet, sincere tone. I didn't know what was happening, but I knew I had to respond. So as calmly as I could, I said, I'm trying to sleep. That's when I noticed my face can move, and my hands can move. But I refused to open my eyes, because I didn't care for what there was to see. 
The next thing I knew, the weight on my left side started to diminish and my body can move again. So I shot up, looked around the room. No one was there. My senses started to come back and the sound of my computer comes back to me like it was never turned off. I didn't bother going back to sleep. I guess this was a wake-up call. I need a better sleep schedule. Probably need to change a few things from now on. But my mind is still stuck on it. Was it a spirit? Was it part of the dream I was having? If it was a spirit, maybe it was just lonely and it just needed a body to lay with. Maybe it was a dream, but I don't dream that often, especially if the touch I felt is real. I don't know what to think. I guess I'll just chalk it up to a hallucination and get on with my life. Something recently happened to me, an event which I cannot seem to get my head around. It has left me perplexed and quite frankly, a little freaked out. I live in a small village in the west of Ireland, not far from the border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. The village has hustle and bustle with around 2,500 people living in the local area. As you can imagine with such a small populace, the community is fairly tight-knit and a person would know everyone pretty well, or at least know them by their face. A man from town, who is now deceased, named Jimmy, used to frequent a pub quite regularly where I used to work, and I often had chit-chat with him on the regular. In more recent years, I did some training in the local nursing home where Jimmy was a full-time resident. He was suffering from Alzheimer's and was now under constant supervision. While his memory was virtually gone, he never lost his ability to play cards, so during my training, I often spent time playing cards with him, and it goes without saying, I lost pretty much every game. While this information does seem trivial, it is relevant to what I am about to tell you. As I mentioned before, Jimmy is now deceased and is buried in a local cemetery which is adjoined to the church. In the evening I bring my dogs for walks, and one route I often take is through the church grounds and I cut through the cemetery. There is a large view of the village and the valley in which it is situated from the cemetery. The cemetery is on a gradual slope and as you'd expect, all the graves are in rows. My dogs, who are both Jack Russell Terriers and in being so are very feisty and nothing ever really spooks them. One evening last week, I decided to cut through the graveyard like I often do, but when we reached the gate of the graveyard, both of the dogs' demeanors changed from that of being happy with tails wagging and general contentment to get out for a walk, to that of which their heads were down and tails between legs and showing stubbornness to pass through the gate. Thinking nothing of it, I pulled the two dogs through the gate jokingly, scolding them, and asking them in the quaint country Irish way, What is wrong with you? We walked up the gradual slope, passing by graves of folks who had passed on along the way. Some of the names I recognized, and some were unfamiliar. Nothing strange in that. Normally, when I reached the last grave on the slope, I would be passing by Jimmy's grave. I would normally stop for just a brief moment, and in my head I would say to myself, How are you, Jimmy? Now, I am a quality manager at work, so it's fair to say that I do notice a lot of things, and I know for a fact that Jimmy's grave was definitely the last one on the slope in the very front row. I at least passed it once a week since he passed away, and I know that it was definitely without a shadow of a doubt located right there. The evening in question, as the dogs and I reached the last grave, my heart nearly went into my mouth. Jimmy's grave was not there. I couldn't understand it. A completely different gravestone stood there of a woman who I also knew from the locale. But how could this be? Jimmy's grave was definitely there. My eyes started darting from grave to grave looking for Jimmy's grave in despair. I eventually found it three or four rows back, but nowhere near the top front row where I had seen it before so many times. 
Miffed about what had just happened, an uneasy feeling came over me, and the hairs began to stand on the back of my neck. Maybe I too was sensing what the dogs had felt earlier. I noticed the breeze had disappeared, and the cemetery was eerily silent, as you could normally hear birdsong from the surrounding trees. I couldn't get out of there fast enough that evening. I have since passed through the cemetery, and still Jimmy's grave is still in the mix with all the others, completely out of place of where I know it used to be. I really cannot understand what happened. It's not as if they moved his plot, or that many people have been buried since he was. Reflecting upon this story, I recalled something that happened to me a few years earlier in that cemetery. Every July on the last Sunday of the month, the local priest holds a ceremony called the Blessing of the Graves. As my grandparents are buried there, I would normally attend such an event, not so much for the religious aspect, but just to catch up with my relatives who would attend. Last year I wasn't feeling well on this Sunday, so I actually missed the ceremony. Feeling a little guilty about this, I decided in my free time to go to the grave to maybe say a quiet prayer for my grandparents. I have been to the grave many times as I often help my mother maintain it by weeding and decorating it with flowers, as well as the annual visit for the blessing of the graves. But this particular day, I could not find the grave, and I spent a good twenty minutes looking for it. Blaming myself, I just put it down to my own ignorance as to why I couldn't find it. But now in hindsight, I wonder if instead of my ignorance, was there something a little more sinister and paranormal at play? Now, to start this off, I am a 22-year-old dude with lots of energy, so much so that I usually take midnight walks around my house to get me ready for bed, and I cannot sleep before 2 a.m. My parents recently told me that they were going on vacation and that they needed a house sitter. Being the cheap parents they are, they asked me to watch their cabin in the forest 30 miles to the nearest town and 3 miles from the nearest neighbor cabin in the middle of nowhere, all alone, with a lakefront view. Who could say no? I told them goodbye and wished them luck in their trip, and I arrived at the cabin the next day. The first day went well. I fished, swam, and ate good food. But the second day is when the nightmare started. The time was about one o'clock in the morning, and I couldn't sleep. I put on my boots and headed out into the cool night air for a little walk. I walked around the house a couple of times and stood by the edge of the thick forest. Just when I was about to head back to go back to bed, I heard footsteps in the trees. Now I am used to deer being everywhere around my house, but the footsteps sounded way heavier than a normal deer. Being the curious guy I am, I threw a rock in the thick brush to see if it would run off. Silence. At first, then I heard something I wish I didn't. Laughing. Not from a normal person, but from someone who sounded insane. Then the same rock I threw was thrown right back at me. I never ran so fast in my life. I ran to my truck. When I started the ignition and the headlights came on, I could see a bald man still laughing, standing in the same spot I was just standing. I sped until I reached the end of the long driveway. I then called the sheriff and had to wait for about an hour. When they got there, they thought that I was just joking, but when they checked where I told them to, they found rope, a knife, and a faint bloody trail leading to another cabin far away into the trees. Inside was just a bunch of scribbles like a child does, and a rag covered in blood. The police looked all around and even checked our cabin, but this person was never found, to my knowledge. The next day my parents cancelled their trip. I still wonder whose blood was in that cabin, and what would have happened if I didn't find the man in the woods.
The nightmare I am about to share is one I had from age 6 to age 9. However, I didn't find out it was more than a nightmare until two weeks ago. I hope you enjoy. When I was 6, my mother and I moved into an older home. It was in good shape for the most part. It was a one-story home with a sunroom, nice backyard, attic, and unfortunately, a basement. It had two bedrooms, so after my baby sister was born, we ended up sharing a room. It wasn't long after we moved into the house that I started having a messed up nightmare. It was the same one over and over again. I was laying in my bed when a man would come into my room and grab me by my leg. He would then start dragging me off my bed and onto the floor. When he got to the top of the basement staircase, he would stop for a moment then continued dragging me down the stairs. I would scream in my dream, but he never stopped. The basement was all white. White walls, white tile flooring. There was a dentist chair, an old vintage one. He would pick me up and slam me down into it. As he would start applying the restraints to my wrists, ankles, and my forehead, I got a good look at him. He was dressed in all white. White long lab coat with one of those round silver things on his forehead. The only thing not white was his dark brown dress shoes. He was an older man, white facial hair. There was a long white table with jars and jars all lined up, with teeth in them, and the gums were still attached. He had an empty jar and his tools all laid out. He then grabbed a knife and started cutting into my gums. There was blood everywhere and I was screaming. It would always end right before it felt like I was going to die. I never watched scary movies as a child, so my mother couldn't figure out why I was having this dream. I would wake up with tears running down my face, wondering why I am having this nightmare. When I was nine, we moved because my mother got married. I haven't had that dream since. Fast forward to two weeks ago. My husband and I were talking about the homes we grew up in. That got me thinking about that house, so I looked it up. Luckily, I was able to pull up the house's history online. I loved reading about it. It was amazing. Until I seen that a man who was very close with the family not only helped get electricity into the home, but also used to rent out the basement for a while. He was a man of science and had a career at a local university as a professor. Very well respected. He even shared my husband's last name, but was not related. I looked him up to show my husband, but once I saw his face, I screamed and covered my mouth. My husband asked me what was wrong, and I told him about the dream and then said, that's the man who would cut out my teeth. I am telling you all this as a warning, something I wished I had gotten before my visit. A bit of backstory about me, as this will be important later. I am 18 years old and I have to drive out of state to visit my girlfriend, as we met online. This drive usually takes us around an hour and a half, an hour and 15 minutes on a good clear night. This was one of those nights. I was cruising down the empty freeway, the lights of a car on the opposite side flashing occasionally. I was listening to some quiet music, taking in the surroundings and enjoying the cool wind blowing in through the sunroof. Now, I will be honest, I wasn't paying as much attention to the road as I should have. I was tired and sick of sticking to my leather seats, so I pulled over to the right side of the road and got out to scratch my legs. I left my car running. I wanted to make sure that I could see in front of me with the headlights, just in case anything came out of the woods. By anything, I mean bobcats and bears, nothing supernatural. It's not that I didn't believe in the supernatural, I just hadn't experienced anything. 
I was parked on the side of the freeway, standing to the right of my car, staring at the pitch black forest and just listening to the sounds of the night. I really don't know why I did it, but something told me that I should look around, that something was off. That's when I saw it, the billboard. It was one of those roadside signs, the expensive ones that big businesses use to advertise. The backdrop was a faded blue with very pale yellow writing on top of it. The text read, Ashland Motel, Exit 72. There was nothing inadvertently wrong with this sign. It was so basic and lacking, but something was off. The billboard couldn't be seen from the road. The trees covered it just the right way, making it impossible unless you were pulled over in this exact spot, looking this exact way. Maybe it's just an old sign nobody took down, I told myself. There is nothing wrong with an old motel sign. The place is probably gone by now. I felt like that wasn't right, but it was a pure gut feeling. I wanted to investigate a little bit further, but my body wouldn't move. My legs felt like lead and jelly at the same time, but I mustered the courage to take a few steps forward. That's when I saw the text at the bottom. Vacancy since 2020. I don't know why, but these words sent such a disgusting feeling into my stomach. This sign was altered recently, so why was it so hidden? What purpose did this sign hold if it wasn't meant to be seen by the public? I felt so sick, I just started vomiting off the side of the road. It was uncontrollable. This sign was absolutely the reason for it. When I was sure that I had emptied out my stomach, plus a little bit more, I ran back to my car and jumped in. I have never locked a car door so fast. I am not a religious man, but I prayed that my car would start and I could just drive 90 miles an hour home, as far away from the Ashland Motel as possible. My 1999 Toyota turned over and the fear in my stomach began building again. I stopped turning the key and waited for a second, hoping a brake would help the car start. I looked around and for a split second, I saw him. He was tall, featureless, shaded by the night. His silhouette was pure blackness. It seemed to consume the moonlight. So it was obvious this wasn't just a tree or plant or animal. This was something otherworldly. I retched the key in the ignition again, and after desperate pleas to whatever god was out there, it sputtered and started. I slammed my foot on the gas, tires squealing, and I got away from the Ashland Motel sign. This was two weeks ago. The Ashland Motel sign had haunted my mind every day. I told two of my friends about this experience. I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I left the bit about the tall man out. They, of course, wanted to find the motel. I begged them not to, that it wasn't meant to be found and we should just leave it like that. They told me that they were going, with or without me. Me, being the overthinker and constant anxiety-ridden boy I am, I couldn't think to let them go without me, just in case something happened and I wasn't there to help. We left after dinner time around 5 p.m. The sun was setting, which made me even more nervous. I put the Ashland Motel into Google Maps. Nothing. I looked it up on Google. Nothing. I searched Facebook for a while looking for an address and only found one post talking about the Ashland Motel. The post read, The Ashland Motel, five stars, safe rooms and lively staff. This honestly sounded like someone who was trying to make you think something while meaning something else. My friends gave me a slap on the back and told me that I was overthinking again. I laughed nervously and agreed, although nothing about this was funny. We ended up putting exit 72 in the GPS and it began taking us there. I made my friend Ethan drive. 
I didn't want to have to sit behind the wheel if that man came back. It took us about 35 minutes to get to exit 72, and we got off right away. Immediately I had a bad feeling. The motel wasn't in sight at all, and I was sure that it wouldn't be, especially because of the placement of that sign. I didn't mention this though, I didn't want to find the motel. Sadly, Ethan remembered my comment about the sign being invisible from the street, and decided to just start pulling down blind driveways and gravel roads. We searched for a while until Will, my other friend in the back seat, told Ethan to stop the car. He had seen something in the trees, a small building hidden in the woods. We reversed slowly until we saw it, the rectangular building hidden by the forest, a sign reading, Ashland Motel. My stomach felt sick instantly after seeing this. The words were in the same pale yellow text, somehow looking more faded than the sign on the freeway. There didn't seem to be a road leading to the motel, meaning that we would have to park the car and walk through the woods to get to it. I begged my friends not to go. We had seen the motel. We could leave. It exists. I warned them about the bobcats and the bears, about ticks and bear traps. Nothing seemed to shake their drive to investigate. I knew that I had to go. If the man appeared, I knew that they wouldn't be able to shake off the fear the same way that I would be able to. We all grabbed a torch from the backseat of Ethan's car and began our trek into the woods. The motel was set back about 100 yards and there was no path leading to it. We had to shine our flashlights at the ground to make sure we didn't fall into a large hole or step on a venomous snake. With each footfall, a branch would snap and leaves would rustle under us. Finally, we made it to the clearing and I wanted to run back as soon as we arrived. The building was a pale yellow with a brown roof that obviously hasn't been cleaned in a long time, if ever. We stood at what seemed to be the front of the motel, but there were no signs or roads to guide us. The best way I can describe it, the motel seemed to have dropped from the sky, removing all the trees under it and just sitting there for years. The grass was overgrown. There were vines growing over the lattice, moss on the doors. There were around 10 rooms. Each of the doors were separated by a window and a small empty pot. I was heavily analyzing the motel, speculating the reason for its placement, when I had the same feeling I did at the sign. My stomach lurched and I placed my elbows on my knees. Ethan tapped my shoulder. I didn't move. He tapped me again harder, but he wouldn't say anything. I looked up at him and the color had drained out of his face. He was staring at the forest behind the motel, as if he were mystified by that spot. Will was staring back at the car. Color drained from his face too. Only then did I realize why they were staring with so much fear. The sounds of branches cracking and leaves crunching were surrounding us, like a hundred people were running in a circle around the motel woods. I whirred around, trying to catch a glimpse of what was making the noise, but it was beyond fast, if it was one thing. I couldn't catch my breath. I began to hyperventilate and sweat aggressively. I saw Will begin to cry silently, and Ethan began to apologize for killing us. I had to get it together. I knew I did. That's when the urge hit me again. I felt so drawn to it. I couldn't stop my head from turning to face the motel. I began to sob when I saw them. Pale faces, all of them staring at us from the windows of the motel. They were illuminated by something otherworldly as the rest of the area was pitch black. All the faces had a disgustingly large smile, too large to be human, stretching from ear to ear, each showing too many teeth, all of them perfectly white. 
The eyes are the reason I am telling this now. They had hollow eyes set into their heads too far back. I realized that I wasn't looking at the eyes, but the lack of them. All of the holes were filled with the same darkness that outlined the man at the motel sign that night. I repressed the need to vomit, but my sobs did not stop. They were deep and uncontrollable. I knew I had to run, even if the thing running around the motel would stop us. I just knew that it was better to deal with that thing than whatever was in the motel. Those faces would do something worse than kill us. I knew it. I grabbed my friend's arms and started running. My vision was blurring. The footsteps and crunching got louder and louder. I drowned them out. I could feel myself choking on my own mucus and tears. I screamed to hurry up and we sprinted deeper into the woods. It felt like we were running through the woods for hours as the footsteps echoed around us. Screams flooded my ears. They were louder than any noise I ever heard before. I knew it was coming from the motel. The faces were so angry and hungry and horrible. The screams were so loud, I thought I was going to die. As I dragged my friends through the final stretch of the woods, the screams suddenly stopped. The lack of noise was deafening, but I knew we were still being chased by the forest thing. I saw the car. The stupid Ford Focus was the best sight I had ever seen. We had finally made it, and the footsteps stopped. As soon as we made it to the car, I began to vomit profusely. It felt like I was bleeding from my stomach, and it was too dark for me to check. I couldn't tell if the liquid running down my face was tears, mucus, or blood, and honestly, I didn't care. Ethan was vomiting aggressively as well, sobbing between hurls. Will was on the ground in the fetal position, sobbing. I turned around to look back at the Ashland Motel, and there it was. The Shadow Man. The one who was at the sign. The one who was staring at me. He was illuminated with the same sinister light that cast upon the windows in the motel. But he still was as dark as ever. He had no features. He was taller than me. And he felt sinister. I could tell that he was smiling at us, trying to lure us back in. I grabbed my friends and threw them into the back seat of the car. I didn't want them to see him. I knew they would never forget his darkness. We drove home in silence and eventually arrived. I got my car from Ethan's house and headed back to my house. No matter what I do, the screams still play in my head and I can feel the smile on his face. That's why I'm telling this. Does anybody know anything about this motel? The Ashland Motel. Is it possible to forget all of this? Will he follow me? I don't want to keep seeing this place. Can someone please help? I have worked for the United States Forest Service here in Texas for just shy of 10 years now. I love my job, and it's rare for anything particularly creepy or scary to occur. But having worked this job for so long, I have my fair share of stories I can share that might just make the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end. For example, we sometimes get jaguars hunting in the forests here. A particularly scary big cat and that's because of what they do with their prey once they're caught and subdued. So just picture the scene. You're walking through the trees on some bright sunny day when all of a sudden you start to smell something rotten. You look around, but there's nothing to be seen. Just the picturesque view of the pines and the sound of bird song floating through the green. Then something hits the top of your head, something wet. You place your hand on the top of your head, feeling something cold and slimy dribbling through your hair. You bring your hand down to see what it is, 
hoping that it's not bird crap, only it's something way worse. It's blood. You look up, and hanging up in a tree just feet above your head is the mutilated, half-eaten corpse of an animal, guts torn out, skin shredded, face half-eaten with hooves or paws missing, with broken pieces of bone protruding from cracked limbs. It seems an utterly bizarre thing to do, but the jaguar has a good reason for doing all this heavy lifting. If a jaguar doesn't bother to hoist its kill into the tree, it risks losing its meal to other more ground-based predators or scavengers. Creepy, yeah. But that kind of natural world stuff is nothing compared to some of the other stuff I've encountered during my time in the Forest Service. So this other time, I am on a routine walk through some of the trails to make sure all the directional signs and information markers for tourists are all in order. There's a large rock protrusion about 100 meters off of this trail, like this big sandstone boulder that juts out of the earth that has kind of a shallow cave carved on one side that has been worn away from thousands of years of wind erosion. As I get close, I see a guy in what I first thought was camouflage hunting gear hanging around the entrance. I call out to him, just some friendly greeting, nothing threatening, and he turns to look at me. Only he doesn't say a word, he just runs off through the trees. I start getting worried about what he was doing in the cave. Terrified he has left a body or something there, and honestly, I was so thankful that he hadn't. But it seems like he did leave something behind. I mean, I'm not even 100% sure it was him that did this, and I have often considered the possibility that it was him that happened across this little find first. And seeing me, he got the idea in his head that it was me that left this there. He got the idea into his head, saw me, and just freaked. But when I walked into that little cave and shined my flashlight around, I saw something that would completely explain why he was so quick to run away, whatever his motivations for doing so were. There was a little circular patch of dirt, one that looked like it had been raked over to clear some space, and in the middle of it all were a bunch of human teeth. I don't know why they were there. I don't know who left them or why, but I did what I could. I gathered them up into a little plastic bag I had on me that had previously contained my lunch and took them down to the nearest police station, giving a little description of the guy that I had seen run away from the cave. I have the usual wild animal encounters, weird noises during the night, but I have never forgotten those teeth. I have no explanation to offer up at all, but it certainly does make for a good little scary story. This is something that happens constantly to me, and I am actually at work typing this out, because it just happened again. Three months ago, I started working at a packing warehouse. I'm the youngest one here, being only 19, and there's barely any other females here. The women's bathroom literally has only one stall, and since the virus, it is supposed to be one person in the bathroom at a time. This wasn't a problem for a while, until one of my coworkers we'll call her Jane, started following me into the bathroom. At first I didn't care, as sometimes she would come in while I was in there, and I would see her feet by the door. I just assumed she was waiting to go. Then I started to notice she would only go as soon as I went in. I gave her the benefit of the doubt for a few weeks. Up until recently, when I would see her standing right in front of the stall while I was in there, I could see her through the cracks and she would just stand there, still, with a blank expression. I thought she was just a creep. Other people started to notice when she would literally just leave the bathroom and I would go in after her, and she would just go right back in. She only did this with me, and when I left, she would leave without using the bathroom. All around the factory I see her staring at me. This weirds me out so much, but she hasn't really done anything else. I mean, we have never even spoke to each other. Until about five minutes ago. She came in again while I was in the stall. She walked closer to the stall door, 
and started to tap it. She kept whispering, I want to come in with you. I'm freaked out, so I yelled at her, no. She started to raise her voice, still saying she wanted to come in. I screamed at her to leave. I was just scared for my life, thinking that she would just slide under the bottom. She just laughed and said she'll see me tonight. I'm getting off super late tonight, and I live alone. I don't know what to do. Often, I enjoy walking my dog at nighttime. This is due to the fact that my dog is harder to walk when people are around with their own dogs. So, we tend to walk around parks in the area when they've become somewhat secluded. I am not a very big guy. I'm just about 5'10 and very lanky, so I wouldn't call myself an intimidating figure. However, my 120 pound black boxer named Loki could be somewhat considered threatening to most from what I hear. I figured his size would be used as a deterrent for anyone looking to cause nightly troubles. I was dead wrong. On one specific night in the fall of 2016, I could recall of an encounter that reminds me of why I am so reluctant to walk around once daylight falls. This specific park is one I have been to a couple of times, and from what I remember, this park is usually secluded around 6.30 and later. Aside from a couple of joggers, there are very few other dog walkers. Not many people walk the same path I take. I also like to put on my headphones and listen to music while I walk. But on this specific night, I chose not to wear them since my phone was on low battery and I wanted to preserve it as long as I could. Anyway, the walk was going as usual. Loki did his business and we continued our usual path. About midway on our walk, I realized that it had started to get really dark. Since he was done with his business, I decided to cut the walk somewhat short and we took a shortcut that kind of led us off the path. This path had a bunch of trees surrounding the area, and there were still leaves on the branches. With that being said, I felt a weird feeling as if I were being watched. I have pretty bad anxiety sometimes, but since I knew the town was safe, I knew that nothing was going to happen. But still, I could not for the life of me shake off the feeling of being watched. I peered back to see if anyone had been following me out of anxiety, and every single time, no one was there. In fact, no one was anywhere. This whole shortcut was essentially secluded. Suddenly, Loki stopped walking and also looked back. I told him, Loki, come on boy, we gotta go. One thing I failed to mention was that Loki is a big coward. I noticed his tail was tucked between his legs, which is a telltale sign that a dog is afraid. I was also curious and a bit nervous but I surely did not want to find out what he heard or noticed. I just wanted to get out ASAP. I pulled a little and he began to walk, but every now and then I'd see him peer back. After maybe a minute or so of walking, he stopped again, and this time he began to growl. Despite being a coward, Loki is a bark but no bite kind of dog. So I took this chance to see exactly what he was growling at. It was quite dark so I could not see well. So, I used my phone's flashlight to see what was up. Trees. Just trees. What he heard was probably some kind of small animal. Once again, I turned around and kept walking. He continued to peer back once in a while still, but this time I noticed it was a lot more frequent. I just said to myself, just squirrels, maybe a bird, and I ignored it. Then, I heard what appeared to be actual footsteps and branches breaking. There is absolutely no way a small animal could have produced a sound like that. Loki turned around quick, and still with his tail tucked, he began to growl and bark at a figure that I could only describe as a man in his early 50s, possibly late 40s, appear from out of the woods. He was dressed in dirty clothing. His hair was long and was graying. He had one hand in his pocket, and he said to me, Nice dog you have. What breed is he? He's a boxer, I replied. 
Oh, I love dogs. Mind if I pet them? He wondered. The man got closer and emerged from the trees. As he got closer, I realized that he was quite tall and a bit burly. Loki instantly got bad vibes. He ran behind me and started to bark at him. Actually, I do kind of mind. My dog here doesn't like strangers. Sorry, but it's probably not best if you pet him. I quickly stated. It's okay, really. He seems like a friendly guy. Just a little pet wouldn't harm him. The man retorted as he got closer. I felt extremely uncomfortable as he appeared to get closer and closer. I don't know why this guy couldn't take no for an answer. I mean, I usually don't allow people to pet Loki unless he comes up to them first. If he's scared of you, then I usually do not want to freak him out by letting him be pet by a stranger. This is especially the case when said stranger came from the woods behind a few trees. I'm really sorry, man. I'm scared he'd bite you or something. I told him as I began to walk away. Like I said before, I wasn't trying to be judgmental or anything, but the dude came from the woods and was possibly the one trailing us from before. I don't know why you won't just let me introduce myself to him, the guy replied angrily. This time, I began to speed walk. I was very uncomfortable, and my fight-or-flight instincts began to take over. He followed us and kept muttering curses to himself. I don't know if this man was under the influence of something, but he did not let up. I won't lie, I started to get a little angry. Why can't a guy just take no for an answer? He began to match my speed, almost as if he was trying to catch up to us. Loki and I both took this as an answer to start sprinting a bit. I don't remember much of the running, it was all a blur to me. But I do remember the spine-tingling feeling of hearing his footsteps rapidly increasing behind me. For a man of his stature, he was quite fast. I also realized that his intentions may not have been to just pet my dog. No one reasonable would go that far just to pet a dog that clearly wanted nothing to do with him. I looked behind me and he was in pursuit. Maybe about 10 feet behind me, he was chasing us. I'll never forget the look in his eyes. I have never had anyone look at me like that. A look of killer intent. All for what? Just because he couldn't pet my dog? My instincts told me that he definitely had sinister intent behind that. Finally, the path led to the park exit and into the busier streets. I lived about 10 minutes away from the park. I made sure no one was following me, and I even made sure to walk on populated streets. After what seemed like an eternity, we got home, but I knew for a fact that I was not going to get a minute of sleep. From my window in the porch, I watched all night with Loki, just to see if anyone had followed us home. I also made a police report with my parents. After all, this guy seemed to have been quite suspicious, and who knows what his true intentions were. Had his target been someone who couldn't protect themselves or run away? What would he have done? I also often ask myself, what if I was wearing my headphones and the sound of music drowned out the footsteps behind me? Ever since, I haven't walked Loki in that park. I have also made it a habit of mine to walk on livelier streets at night. If I could give anyone one piece of advice, even if you live in a relatively safe town, do not ever let your guard down. You never know what kind of person might be lurking in the shadows. Montana has to be one of the most beautiful places in the world, and it's one of the last beautiful places in the United States that still feels truly wild. Unlike my native California, where almost every area of natural beauty is plastered with man-made trails, ranger stations, and tourist traps. But I don't mean to offend anyone. I'm sure your favorite hiking spots in Wisconsin or Washington or wherever are amazing. And maybe it is just a little internal bias talking, having watched too many old cowboy movies with my dad. But to me... Montana truly feels like one of the last, untouched wilderness areas in North America. A buddy of mine feels exactly the same way about it. 
So every year around September, he and I would take a trip up to Bozeman to spend some time away from big city life out here in Frisco. We have been friends forever and pretty much spent all of our high school and college days together. But since we have slammed into our 30s and did all the boring grown-up stuff like get married, have kids, focus on careers, we don't have nearly enough time to spend together. So I honestly relish our year trips out to Montana together where we can catch up on stuff, get some serious drinking in, but most importantly, indulge in a mutual hobby of ours that's verged on an obsession ever since we were teenagers. Hunting. Our stomping ground of choice has always been Glacier National Park, right up on the Canadian border. It's about a five hour drive from Bozeman itself, but we make a point of driving out for a few days. One, to get settled into a campsite, another few to actually hunt, all before a few days of drinking back in Bozeman to celebrate our successes or commiserate our failures. So last year, we repeated the same old ritual, driving out to the national park with our hunting gear in tow. We found a good place to park the truck, hiked a few hours out into the wilderness, and found a decent little spot to set up camp. Every year, we seem to be a little more exhausted when the day ends. Call it just side effects of getting older, I guess. So last year in particular, we passed out pretty early in our one-man tents with the intention of rising at dawn to begin our day's hunt. 6 a.m. the next morning, the little alarm on my wristwatch starts beeping. It's the closest thing we have to that feeling of Christmas morning when you're a kid. It's just pure excitement, jumping out of bed to see what hunting Santa has left among the trees for us that day. We have a little breakfast, drink a little coffee, then pack up and head out. For those of you that are unfamiliar with hunting or nature in general, there are two times in a day when birds sing the loudest, dawn and dusk. It sounds all pretty to us humans, like this wonderful lyrical bird song, but it's actually just pure war cries. What sounds sweet and cute to us is actually them like, I'm here, and if you come up in my tree, I'm gonna mess you up. So back off, other birds, for real. And it's something that soundtracks every morning hunt every single time we have visited Glacier. But that morning, it was almost silent. We could hear the odd squawk in the distance, but our immediate vicinity was as silent as the grave. And that only means one thing, that a large predator is in the area, something that's on the hunt. I remember the look on my buddy's face when he turned to me and stated that exact thing, how I double-checked that I had my can of bear mace on me just in case anything happened. But that area of Montana, right near the Canadian border, is known to have wolf packs roaming around. And I shuddered at the thought of what would happen if we were cornered by one. Two aging city boys would be run down in an instant. We wouldn't stand a chance. We would be torn apart and eaten alive right there on the forest floor. Probably before we could even get a shot off. Trigger discipline is probably the most important aspect of weapon safety but I struggled to keep my finger off the trigger of my Remington once I had racked around into the chamber. The fear was palpable. It felt like something was close. Real close. And in woods as dense as the ones we were in, something could be on top of us in just seconds. Then, after another mile or so of walking through the near silent forest, we saw it in the distance. A grizzly. And it was huge. I had never seen one in the flesh before that day, and I was completely overwhelmed by the size of that thing. I mean, they are monsters, in the very sense of the word. Just a flesh tank. A ball of muscle and sinew. Perfectly designed to chase down, kill, and shred whatever they take a liking to. We watched it staring back at us, like this dull expression on its face before it sniffed the air a little catching our scent. We must have looked like frightened little boys, but to the grizzly, we were nothing. This was just another day, and we were just another meal, another kill, business as usual. We just slowly walked on, keeping our eyes on that murder machine the whole time, until it was eventually out of sight. We're not dumb. We knew we couldn't just hang around and carry on our hunt with that thing in the area especially not since it had our scent. 
So slowly but surely, we made our way back to camp, with the intention of packing up and moving to a safer area. But God laughs at well-laid plans, and about halfway back, as we're keeping our heads on a swivel, trying to keep an eye out for that thing stalking us through the trees, I heard something heavy, bounding towards us. I couldn't see it right away, and frankly, the idea that something so huge could just creep up on us like that is something that is just pure nightmare fuel to me. But stalk us, it did. And in a moment of pure, stomach-churning horror, it knocked my buddy to the ground, as easy as a grown man might knock over a child. I mean, it just sent him crashing into the dirt. And it was on him in seconds. How I managed to miss that thing with my first shot is something I'll never really understand. I am an experienced hunter, and I am a pretty good marksman, but pure panic took over. Crippling fear just had me turning to jelly. The feeling of expecting to see my best friend in the world torn apart before me is something I am never, ever going to forget. I am not military. I have never had any official training, nothing like that. So I didn't even think to work the bolt action and chamber another round. I just went for the bear mace, spraying it right in that thing's eyes as it slashed its claws across my buddy's chest and face, tearing up clothing and flesh like with deep, gouging strikes. His screams, though, that's what I kept hearing in the quieter moments during the months following that trip. These blood-curdling screams as he thought he was going to die, and not just die, be eaten alive, watch his own guts being torn from his body, and chewed up right there in front of him. But it worked. Somehow the bear mace just worked. It immediately stopped clawing at my buddy, started like wrinkling its nose and doing these weird like sneezes or coughs. I can't really think of any other way to describe it. But what was obvious is that it was in considerable discomfort as the ingredients in the mace went to work on its nose and eyes. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it took off again, crashing through the trees, smacking into the one odd or two as it obviously struggled to see where it was going. Then it was just a case of checking on my buddy. But oh my gosh, he was an absolute mess. The bear's claws had torn off chunks of flesh from his face shoulders and chest, and blood was everywhere. I mean everywhere. I was frantic too. I kept alternating between trying to tend to his wounds and looking around to make sure the bear wasn't charging us again. Like when I think back to it, I can only see certain frames. It's not like a movie in my head. It's like still pictures. Side effect of the adrenaline, I guess. The blood is leaking off my body as I help him to his feet. He was capable of running, but the attack had stunned him, and he shook violently as I pulled him up and started dragging him back in the direction of our campsite. I knew the bear mace, or bear spray, or whatever you want to call it, had worked, but for how long? I had no idea. And so we ran, as fast as our legs could carry us, through trees and over hillocks, until we saw the bright orange fabric of our one-man tents. Another weird memory I have is of my buddy applying his own gauze bandages, like you think the guy would be in major pain at that point, but he was just running on pure adrenaline. That bear had torn him up real bad, but he couldn't feel a thing. It was just pure survival instinct kicking in. He was a survivor, and he wasn't about to go down easy, and in a twisted kind of way, I was really proud of him. By that point... My one major concern was that he'd lose too much blood on the way back to our truck. I mean, he had already left a blood trail from the scene of the attack, so the bear would be able to trace our path really, really easily. So I was stuck in a horrendous catch-22 situation. Leave him with his rifle and risk getting attacked again. Or have him come with me to get help and risk bleeding to death or leading the bear onto our trail but a primal, angry roar that echoed through the trees kind of made that decision for us. The bear was still in the area. Not even that. It was close. And it was angry. I wrapped like half my buddy's head in gauze, taped a bunch of it to his chest, and we got running again. Almost every step we took, I expected that bear to just appear again. Only this time. If it attacked me, my buddy wouldn't have a rifle to be able to take the thing out. 
although that fact that the bear mace had worked was actually a huge comfort, so there was no doubt that it would work a second time. But we got lucky for a second time that day. First time when the injuries to my buddy weren't as bad as they could have been, and the second when that bear didn't rally for a second attack. We made it out of the park and down to a place called Ennis pretty quickly, visited a medical clinic, got my buddy all stitched and patched up, then actually headed to a bar to just decompress and unwind from the nightmare we had just lived through. Needless to say, my buddy didn't have to buy a single beer that night, not as he told the story of getting full-on attacked by a fully grown grizzly. We're not sure if we're going on our year trip this September, all this virus stuff aside. I'm not sure either of us is quite ready to get back on that horse, but I look forward to the day when we are. I'm not going to let a horrific encounter like that ruin the one thing that's kept us close for so many years. This happened a few years ago in my hometown. I am not going to say where to protect the privacy of my best friend, but everyone should be on the lookout for these types of situations as they are growing increasingly more common. My best friend in undergrad, we'll call her Maria, and I were extremely close. We worked together, had the same degree, had the same hobbies, most of the same classes, the same friend group, and lived very near to each other. As a result, we were with each other very often, so very rarely, alone. Keep this in mind as the story goes on. Maria was picking up her cats from a friend's house and parked her car on the street outside. She put the cats in the car, ran to lock the front door, and came back. It took maybe 10 seconds to lock it and run back, but she didn't lock her car. About halfway to her house, she realized that her purse containing makeup, hundreds of dollars, checks from work, her passport, all of her IDs and cards, and bills for her apartment with her address on them was missing from the passenger seat. She had been running errands to prepare for a trip to her hometown, which is why she had all of these things with her. Pulling over, she looked at her bank account online to see someone had already tried to use the card at a gas station five minutes away, so she canceled her card and drove home. When telling me the story, I pointed out that whoever took her purse was so fast that they had to have been watching her, and she agreed. She reported it all to the police, but wasn't expecting anything to come from it, as we lived in an area notorious for theft at the time. A month or so later, she received a phone call from a detective saying that they had found all her items except the cash. Maria told the detective it was fine, as she already had new ones. The detective paused for a moment and then told Maria that they would not be returning her items at all since they were now evidence in an investigation. When Maria asked what she meant, the detective told her they found all her items with a woman who was known to be involved in drugs and human trafficking, and our state is one of the hot spots for human trafficking in the U.S. Along with the stolen items, there were pictures of Maria from several months prior walking around our college campus and our work and hanging out with friends on her birthday. There were also photos of her friends and other girls that we didn't know. These people had her hometown address, her address in the state where we lived, where we worked, the places we ate and hung out at, her university ID card, knew that she had animals and where she walked them, where she did her banking, what kind of car she drove, and who her friends were. Naturally, her boyfriend, who was in the military, lost it, and had his friend sit outside the house when he wasn't home, and escort her to and from work at night for the next few months. It didn't seem like I was a target, but I still had my boyfriend use my car to drive me to and from work for a while, and I bought pepper spray for my keychain. In the aftermath of finding this out, we realized a few things. Despite being followed at fairly close range, somehow neither of us ever noticed somebody following us, probably because the person was a woman. Most of the opportunities for someone to take her, such as walking to her car or house at night, 
were probably missed because either her boyfriend or I were with her. They must have been learning the schedules of everyone around her, as well as to see when there were times she was truly alone. Since they already knew so much about her before stealing all of her information, there must be a big boss somewhere who has at least some information about her, including what she looks like. The one thing they didn't seem to have photos of was her hiking with her dogs. Either they didn't know she hiked, often alone, or they were worried it would be too obvious if someone were to follow her, thus tipping her off. And perhaps the most terrifying, if they decided after all this time to make a move and steal her things, they must have been planning to do something big fairly soon. It's likely they took her IDs in order to make fake ones to get her out of the country undetected. Unfortunately, I can't give an update, as nothing ever happened after the arrest, and every time she asks about the case, the detective says it's an active investigation and they cannot disclose any information. We have never actually seen the photos either. All of the explanation was done over the phone. It's been three years since all this happened, and even though we have moved past it, it still terrifies me to think about what would have happened if they hadn't found that woman. I urge everyone to be aware of their surroundings. Be wary of anyone following you, not just men. Stay with your friends, check in on them to see if they made it home safe, and always, always lock your doors. Before I begin, I'd like to state that I am a paranoid schizophrenic. This will come into play later. This happened recently, on July 6th at around 8pm, just starting to get dark when I happened to notice a man walking around my housing complex. I saw this on my security system, with about 6 cameras in total. He is wearing a black hoodie with the hood up and a pair of ratty blue jeans, and he had a wild looking beard. I see him walking around and think nothing of it until around 30 minutes later, I see the man walk around near my house and notice him walking a bit too close to my car for comfort. He then just walks away and I don't see him for another hour when I get an alert on my monitor with all of my security cameras that says there is a proximity alarm. I have each camera set to a different proximity alert and the two garage door cameras were set to around 15 feet away from the camera. At this point, it's dark outside, and the cameras switch into infrared mode, where I can get a better look at this guy. He looked crazed, and had a small grin on his face. It didn't look too obvious, but it was definitely noticeable. I kid you not, what he does next is just downright terrifying. He looks up, and then begins to stare into the camera with his wild-looking face, and just sits there for a good five minutes. He then tries the rear left door and fails to open it, then tries the driver's side to no avail. The crazed man begins to then knock on the windows of the driver's side door and starts pounding it after a short period of time. This guy was getting more visibly agitated and angry with each second he couldn't get into my vehicle. By this point, I am already on the phone with the police and they say they'll be at my place soon. I get off the phone with the operator and just continue to watch what this guy is doing. He's still trying to get into my vehicle, then stops and just stares into my car with no regard to anything else. After 10 minutes, two police cruisers come onto my street with their lights on and their weapons drawn at the man. He looks at them and starts walking toward them slowly. By doing that, the guy got tased. I assume the guy had a weapon of some sort, because why else would four officers have their weapons drawn? Then, I hear a loud scream come from outside. Once the officers got the guy in cuffs, he turned his head back toward the main garage door camera and stares into it with the most deranged and insane look on his face. I give the police a statement and a USB drive with all of the footage of what just transpired, and I am still waiting to hear back from the police. I am not allowed to show any footage from these events, as there is still an active investigation going on.
This is a true story. I'm a female, and when I was in my 20s, I went to a retreat in the beautiful Berkshire Mountains in Massachusetts. It was a weekend of lectures and activities on how to live your best life, basically. Little did I know that by midnight, I would be living my worst nightmare. Upon our arrival, we were given a tour of the campus, which consisted of various buildings for lectures and activities, dormitories, a cafeteria, and an arcade. We were warned about ticks and that there had been recent bear sightings. I was so mesmerized with the beauty of the place that I admit, I may not have been paying the utmost attention to the tour guide. It was autumn in New England, and the leaves were a multitude of colors. Standing on the edge of the mountain, we were able to see a babbling brook below us. I had never been that high up on a mountain before, and the view was insane. The highlight of the tour was definitely the arcade building, which consisted of various game rooms. There were all kinds of games, from a pool table to classic arcade games. After touring the arcade building, the tour guide warned us to be back in our dorms by 11 p.m. We are very strict about lights out at 11 p.m., no exceptions. You must be in your dorm at 11 p.m., so keep an eye on the time. It seemed odd to me that there was such a strict curfew for a bunch of paying adult customers, but I guess they wanted to make sure we got enough sleep to be well rested for the lectures in the morning. After dinner, I decided I would spend the rest of my first day at the arcade building, since there were no activities planned that evening. I had been eyeing a racing game. It was the type of arcade game that you sit inside, and there's a steering wheel, and you have to stay on the track. Well, this game was extremely engrossing, and I was enjoying myself to the fullest, so much so that I could not believe it when the lights suddenly went out. The game went dark, as well as everything else in the building. Could it possibly be 11 p.m. already? I actually spent five hours playing this game? No way. I was scared sitting there in the dark. Is anybody here? I called. Nobody answered. Apparently, everybody had their eyes on the clock, except me. I couldn't blame my fellow guests for leaving me behind, because this was a loud arcade, and I was sitting inside a game where they couldn't see me. Plus, we had just met each other, and they had no idea of the headcount. After calling out several times to no avail, I accepted the fact that I was alone in this pitch-dark building. Every single game had turned off as well as every single light, and you could hear a pin drop. Terrified, I decided that the best strategy to avoid getting hurt was to hold my hands out in front of me until I could feel the wall and then slide my hands along until I found the door to the outside. It seemed to take hours to get myself to the wall, never mind to get to the door to the outside. I kept walking into things and getting hurt, but finally, my hand turned a doorknob that was heavier than the rest, and I knew I had finally found the door to go outside. I was so thankful that my nightmare was about to end. As I opened the door, I realized that to my horror, when they said lights out at 11, they not only meant indoor lights, but street lights as well. I was standing outdoors in the pitch darkness on the edge of a mountain, in an area that had recent bear sightings, all around me as far as the eye could see was pitch black. I had no idea which was north, south, east, or west. I knew I was on the edge of a cliff, because the babbling brook from earlier kept getting louder and louder, so instead of walking with my hands out in front of me like I did in the building, I decided to crawl to make sure I was still on land. I would put one hand lightly in front of me to make sure there was still ground, and then the other would follow and then my legs. I had to crawl like this for hours, fearing that I would fall off the cliff at any moment. As the brook got louder and louder, fearing that a bear would come and attack me at any moment, wondering if I would ever be able to find my dorm. I was crying in the pitch darkness. I was praying like crazy. I honestly thought I was going to die. I was either going to fall off the mountain or a bear was going to find me. Or, I was going to tire from this crawling that I had to do, which was exhausting physically and emotionally. 
About three hours later at three o'clock in the morning, I finally saw a light in a window. It must be a dorm, I figured. I was going to knock on this window at three o'clock in the morning, and I did not care. I just couldn't take this anymore. I stood there scared that the people would be mad that I was disturbing them at three o'clock in the morning, but on the other hand, I didn't care because I didn't want to die. A man opened the door and I burst out crying and tried to sob out my story. He took pity on me and gave me a lantern and pointed me in the direction of my dorm. By the time I reached my bed, the sun was coming up and it was almost time to attend the lectures. As you can imagine, all I wanted to do at that point was sleep. I was very thankful to be alive. I used to be in the Boy Scouts and spent many summers working on a camp staff as the pool director. Another staff member named Chris and I arrived two weeks before the camp opening for the summer to clean the pool, check equipment, and get all of the canoes and rowboats out of the storage and cleaned up. The rest of the camp staff would not arrive until the next week. It should be noted that before working on staff, I had camped here for about 10 years and never had one single problem. This is a 600 plus acre camp that we both knew like the back of our hands. When you first enter the camp, you drive up a long road about two miles long and drive into a large gravel parking lot. At the front of the lot, off to the right, is a large lodge with a gravel road that goes in two directions, straight ahead or to the right. By going straight, you can drive either to the dining hall or continue past and continue down the road past many different campsites in four different cabins on the three mile drive down. Ultimately, this road leads you to the back winter entrance to the camp at the lake, where there are additional cabins and a parking lot. There are lots of trails throughout this area that led to all of the different campsites and cabins. About three quarters of the way down this road, there is an amphitheater surrounded by large cliffs with caves. Many of the trails crisscross through the cliffs and back to the top of the camp. The dining hall was located about 100 yards from the lodge. At the edge of the parking area, about 75 yards downhill from the dining hall, is a large swimming pool where the showers and changing rooms are located. About another 100 yards down the hill is a large pine forest where the staff campsite was located. The staff area had several small ponds around it and several large cabins with a road leading back to the camp's top. After working outside the entire day, Chris and I get cleaned up and meet his mom and dad in the nearest town for dinner. Dinner was great, and we returned to the campsite around 9.30 p.m. As we walked down the road to the staff area, we decided that instead of sleeping in the cabin, we would sleep in the staff tents that we had already set up because it was warm outside. All of a sudden, we heard a truck turn down the gravel road. At first, we thought it might have been the ranger coming to say hi, as he knew we were there, but it did not sound like his truck at all. Luckily, the cabin we were standing in front of was back off the road, so we could not be seen. We hurried behind the cabin to the back entrance, unlocked the door, entered, and locked the door. Thankfully, we never had the lights on, however, the windows were open. As we snuck over to the window, we saw three trucks parked with four guys standing in front of them. None of them was anyone that was on the camp staff or that we had ever seen before. We thought at first that maybe they had a legitimate reason to be there. All of a sudden, we heard one of the men say, Where'd they go? I saw them come down here. At the moment, I knew they were looking for us. The cabin was empty, so we knew that they would see us if they came to the doors or windows. Luckily, there was a storage room across from the bathroom at the opposite end of the cabin that had a door in the floor with a ladder that led underneath the cabin as it is about six feet off the ground. If they tried to get in, we at least had an exit. We heard the people at the front and back entrance knocking on windows, telling us to come out. We quietly crept down the ladder and moved slowly to the opposite end of the cabin and we were able to slide out the end where a piece of the lattice was missing around the edge of the cabin. 
Once out, we had to quickly decide if we run up the road to our cars, which was about a half a mile away, and risk them catching up to us in their trucks, or turn and run down one of the many trails in that area. At least we had the advantage of knowing the place if they decided to run after us. We snuck out from under the cabin and began walking towards one of the trails that was about 50 yards from the cabin. About halfway there, someone screamed. They're over there! We began running down one of the trails that we knew led to the middle of the camp, where there were many campsites, cabins, and areas we could hide. We could see flashlights running behind us and on the trails next to us. We quickly jumped onto another trail that led up to the amphitheater, where there was a hidden trail that led to the top. We knew we would be safe there, because we would be able to see anyone that was walking up the trail. We finally made it to the amphitheater, and to the top of the cliffs where we stayed for, what seemed like, forever, but was only a few hours. We kept seeing flashlights off in the distance. Finally, the flashlights were moving towards the lake, opposite where we were. We took the back trail which took us around the far back side of the camp and to the top, where the lodge and dining hall were located. It took about 45 minutes to reach the top. We then slowly walked back to the staff camp so we could get our keys. The staff area was about 200 yards from the parking lot where my car was parked, which is a different lot next to the archery range, which had a separate exit. We ran to the car and drove out of there as fast as we could. We drove to the camp ranger's house which was at the very edge of camp by the main road and told him what happened. He called the local sheriff. When they arrived about 40 minutes later, they searched throughout the camp and never found anyone. We never did find out who it was. We also never had any trouble the rest of the summer. I worked there the next two summers without issues. When I was about 16 or 17 years old, I was walking home from a party being held at my friend's house. The streets were dark and eerily empty as I strolled down the road that led to my home. The beeping of the watch I wore then notified me of the passing of the hour, and I glanced at it to confirm the time. 3 a.m. I didn't normally go to parties or come home so late. In fact, I can count the times I came home after midnight in high school with one hand, but I was a good kid, and my parents knew my friends well. All I had to do was let them know who I would be with, what time I would be back, and give them a call before I left my friends' houses, and I pretty much had no curfew. As I wasn't really accustomed to coming home so late, I wasn't used to the empty streets. They were normally bustling with people playing and living their lives. The emptiness gave the walk a creepy vibe. I was about two short blocks from the bridge that led to my house when I saw a hooded figure step off the bridge, headed in my direction. One thing you should know about that bridge is that it was a hot spot for mugging and other violent crime. I was always told never to walk on that bridge at night and to go around the long way. I did mention I was a teenager at the time, however, so of course, I didn't listen. Seeing the hooded figure made me wish I had, however, as even from afar, he gave off a threatening vibe. I decided that I was a tough guy, and if the guy started with me, I would finish it. I continued toward him. Big mistake. As I drew closer, the strangest thing I had ever witnessed happened. From either behind or out of that hooded figure, Another hooded figure came forth and fell in line with the first. Then, out of the second, a third emerged, and from the third, a fourth. I couldn't believe what I had witnessed. It was almost as if the first guy multiplied into four people. Either that, or they were walking in such a perfect sink that you could not see one behind the other. There were four hooded figures, all dressed the same with the same height and weight, walking toward me in a perfect cadence. I have seen my share of creepy stuff before that day, but nothing like that. 
Every instinct in my body was shouting for me to flee, and I decided at that moment that I wasn't as tough as I thought. I began to cross the street to take the long way around, and they also began to cross. It was clear that they were matching my movement. I picked up my pace and got to the corner before they did, almost at a jog. At one point, I was close enough to get a look at them, but all four of their faces were obscured by their hoods. I couldn't even see their chins or noses. It was just darkness, almost as if they had no faces. I was just about to start sprinting in abject terror when suddenly I found my backbone and decided I would not run from whatever they were. I took a deep breath and summoning all my courage, I turned around to face them. They were gone. I looked around for them, but they were nowhere in sight. They had completely disappeared. There was no place they really could have gone, however. They weren't close enough to any buildings to have gotten into. In fact, they were right behind me. I didn't spend too long searching for the creepy hooded figures, however, and ten minutes later, I was home. As soon as I entered my house, my mother comes from out of her bedroom and approaches me and asked, Are you okay? and thought maybe she didn't remember me calling her before leaving my friend's house. Uh, I'm fine, Mom. We spoke an hour ago. I told you I'd be home at this time. You did, she confirmed. But after I spoke to you, I fell asleep. Then suddenly I was awoken by an angel that told me, Your son is in danger. Come with me. My mother was and still is a Christian, as am I so hearing her speak about angels wasn't uncommon. But her saying she went somewhere with one wasn't your average dinner conversation in my house. The angel led my spirit into a room where there were a bunch of other teenagers that were chanting around a table, and they had a picture of you on the table, and their words sounded foreign. It felt like they were trying to send something after you, my mom explained. I swallowed hard. What happened next? I asked her hesitantly. The angel prompted me to step forward onto their table, so I did, and suddenly, I was wearing this beautiful white gown, and the kids that were chanting could see me, and they all fled, in terror. I think I disrupted whatever they were trying to do. Mom, when did this happen? I asked, although I already knew. Just now, like maybe 10 or 15 minutes ago, she responded. I couldn't believe it. That was about the same time those guys appeared. Was there any connection between my mom's vision and the four hooded figures? I don't know. But all I do know is that I don't ever want to meet those hooded guys again. This was a few years ago, and I don't expect many to believe me considering it was also Friday the 13th. It was my best friend's birthday the night before, and he had just turned 21. Mind you, we were all around that age at the time. I am now a newly 26-year-old male, and what happened later that night still sends shivers down my spine. We had a compact but close friend group back then, and had planned to visit our local pub to celebrate his birthday. The night went on, and as we shared our experiences, talked, and ultimately had fun, which was the most important thing, we arrived at the pub around 8.30 p.m. and got kicked out at 12 a.m. due to closing reasons. After that, we chatted for a bit more outside the pub before walking home as we were all pretty drunk. The night was silent and dark, but thankfully not stormy. My house was on a slight hill in what I assumed a safe neighborhood before this happened. Let me quickly say that I was living with my aunt at the time. I was walking down the street when I noticed someone dressed in black, head to toe, in my peripheral vision. They had their hood over their head, so it was next to impossible to capture their identity in the dim streetlights, but they seemed to be in their mid-30s to 40s with a more muscular build. They were on the adjacent street from mine and coming towards the intersection I was walking through. 
I didn't think much of it as I thought he was out walking home or out somewhere. So I continued to walk and was almost home by this time. It was around 1.30 a.m. when I turned around to see the same guy I saw before following me. I was a little alarmed, especially since I had been drinking a couple hours before, and my paranoia senses were elevated. Needless to say, I have always been paranoid walking anywhere late at night. I started to pick up the pace to get some distance from him, and to my surprise, he did as well. That's when I knew I was in a fight-or-flight response situation. Instead of trying to act all tough and risk getting myself jumped, or possibly worse, I decided to sprint down the street since my house was on the corner of it. Of course, he was right behind me. I ran up my driveway, slamming the gate behind me before abruptly opening the back door and almost shaking the whole house trying to lock it. What I didn't notice is that the motion sensor light we had connected to our garage didn't turn on when I came into range of it. I found this to be odd since we always kept on top of its battery life and the light was extremely sensitive to motion. The next morning, when I felt it was safe enough to exit the house, I checked the motion sensor light and was shocked to see that it had been intentionally covered and turned towards the garage so that it couldn't be activated. I felt a severe pain in my chest when I realized that the man had more sinister intentions planned for me. I went back inside and checked with my family members, and none of them had touched the light after I left for the pub. What happened Friday, October 13th, would be the first and last time I have ever seen that person. What confuses me still today is how he knew I lived at that house. Okay, so bear with me as I kind of suck at telling stories without some rambling. I changed the names for anonymity's sake. I'll give you a little background and then dive into the story. My husband, we'll call Michael, and I are in our 30s. We have two toddlers. The couple I will talk about I'll call Liz, and her husband we will call Klinger. Now let's dive into the story. I was scrolling through Facebook when I noticed a post on one of our local Talk of the Town groups. Liz posted saying she isn't from the area and wanted to know where everyone hangs out, and she said she wants to make friends. Me, being my outgoing self, I decided to comment saying, I'll be your friend. I know, I know, it was a very stupid idea on my part, and I let my overly trusting and friendly personality get the best of me. Liz and I started Facebook messaging and quickly realized we had a lot in common. Klinger and I had mutual Facebook friends, so that made me more inclined to meet up. I arranged for the four of us to get dinner and hang out. We had a good time and shared the same sense of humor. It turned into Liz and I hanging out weekly and Klinger inviting Mike to play pool every week. Mike was working a very demanding job that made it hard for him to have the time to hang out, and when he did have the time, he was too tired. Well, this made Klinger turn a bit crazy. Klinger asked if Mike could go to pool night, and he said no because of work. Klinger completely freaked out. He started texting Mike, saying that he was being a quote-unquote part-time friend, and that he couldn't deal with having a friend that didn't give enough effort. He said that Mike was leading him on as a friend. Naturally, Mike and I thought, what the heck? What is wrong with this guy? Mike started saying that Klinger was overreacting and that he has obligations like work and family time. He said that he doesn't have to be Klinger's friend and to chill out. Mike ignored all messages from Klinger, and we went about our days. Liz and I still hung out regularly, just us girls, and figured that Mike and Klinger didn't have to hang out with us. I thought, okay, problem solved. Wrong. Klinger started messaging me saying that he doesn't understand why Mike wouldn't want to hang out with him, and that he wasn't being nice. I tried explaining that he's got a lot going on and to chill out. This just angered him more and he lashed out by saying that Mike didn't give enough me time and that everyone deserves that. He insisted that Mike take time for himself and have a guy's night weekly. I told Klinger that him and Mike don't have to be friends and it's not a big deal. 
You would think I would have cut Liz and Klinger out of my life right then, but I thought I could be friends with only Liz. I then started to notice that Liz was becoming too clingy and would get mad if I said I felt like just hanging out at home instead of with her. She made me feel guilty for wanting to have time alone, so my idiot self fell for it and thought that it would be wrong of me to leave her to be lonely, as she didn't have any other friends in the area. This in turn made me spend more money than we could afford, as she always wanted to get drinks or food. Mike and I started arguing because Liz would twist things I said to her, then Klinger would spit them out to Mike. I thought about ending our friendship, but wanted to give her the benefit of the doubt. This all changed when I got a text from Liz asking if Mike and I would want to come over and do Molly with them. I am not into that stuff, except for smoking occasionally, so I definitely wasn't about to go over to their place to do Molly. I said that we couldn't, and I am not into it anyway, plus we didn't have a sitter. Liz had the audacity to say that I should bring our kids over with us, and their kids could play with them. I told her absolutely not, and she got mad that I said it was a bad idea. Meanwhile, Klinger is non-stop texting Mike saying that he's a piece of crap alcoholic and that he doesn't give me enough time. Mike and I were totally taken aback as this came out of nowhere and I never complained about my sex life to Liz or Klinger. In fact, I told Liz that I was content with it. I did mention Mike drinking a lot at the time but didn't go into further detail and it wasn't some big secret. Klinger then lectured Mike about him needing to quit drinking and that he's a piece of crap father just like his dad. My husband has his share of issues, sure, but he's not a piece of crap dad, and he has dramatically improved since this occurred. Klinger then said that our kids are annoying and ugly. He told Mike that our son shouldn't have a pacifier and how we are intentionally screwing up his teeth. Keep in mind that they were around 16-17 months and 3 years old with standard tantrums. Mike said that he was done with the conversation and that there was no reason for him to disrespect our family, which obviously included a few choice words. Mike said that he doesn't care what his sexual preference is, but it seems like Klinger seems to be looking for a boyfriend, not a friend. Klinger lost it and threatened Mike and said that he would break him in half. Mike blocked him on everything. Then I texted Liz saying that our friendship was over due to her psycho husband. After we blocked them, we didn't hear from them again, but I was nervous for a good month that Klinger would show up at our house and try to do something. It didn't help knowing that Klinger regularly went on the dark web and hearing all the horror stories surrounding that. Also at the time, they lived about 10 minutes away. Thankfully, I knew beforehand that they would be moving to a city about 40 minutes away in the near future, so I knew it would be unlikely that I would run into them. So long story short, I learned the hard way that when it comes to friends, it's quality, not the quantity of friendships. We have a couple of good friends now, and are more than happy with that. I lived in the same house from when I was born until I was 10 years old. It was a pretty typical suburban home. It was not particularly old and was finished with all of the cheap outfitting that are typically used to cut down on costs in mass-produced homes. It was unremarkable. It was a little box made of ticky-tacky in an area full of little boxes that all looked the same, so to speak. It had a finished basement that was filled with toys it was what should be a child's paradise. There were two rooms there. One was what we considered the main room, which was the room that you first walked into when coming down the stairs and had a TV, computer, and a pull-out couch that was great for sleepovers. The other was what we considered the back room. It was smaller with many toy-filled bins. It was essentially a playroom for me and my siblings. It had a whiteboard on the only wall that wasn't nearly entirely taken up by sliding doors to small storage and utility rooms. I would spend hours down there, often alone, while my mom went about her business upstairs. I spent a lot of time, particularly in the back room, playing with dolls or whatever little girls do, until an uneasy feeling would force me back upstairs to the safety of my mother's side. This would happen just about every time I played down there. I would play until I got too scared, 
and then I would flee upstairs. I didn't put much thought into my uneasy feeling because it had happened in that room my entire life, and four-year-olds tend to not think too much about those things. Looking back at it, I understand the fear and uneasiness I felt in that room. I felt like I was being watched. The feeling was strongest when I was alone in that back room, but I would still feel it when I was in the main room or with people. A prime example of this is the sleepovers I would have when I was a bit older, about seven years old. I always had sleepovers in the main room because it had the pull-out couch and a TV. The pull-out couch was situated as far away from the doorway to the back room as possible, but still had a clear line of sight to it. I would always take the spot furthest away from the back room's doorway in an attempt to get away from the uneasiness that room caused, especially at night. I felt like I was being watched on those late nights, and I would look up to the doorway and expect to see a woman standing there. Even though I never actually saw her with my eyes, it was like I saw her with my mind, because even now, I have a distinct mental image of her. She was tall, frail, and gaunt. She was an older woman, probably about 60 or 70, with a messy frizz of gray hair that went down to her shoulders. Her cheekbones were very pronounced like she had not eaten in months, or like her flesh was starting to decay off her bones. The thing that stood out to me the most was her eyes. They were dark and sunken, vacant with a thousand-yard stare. I did not know it at the time, but after working at an assisted living facility and seeing dying people, I realized that she looked like she was dying, or perhaps already dead. She frightened me but not as much as the other presence. The thought of the other presence still sends ice-cold terror through my veins, nearly ten years later. I never saw him, not even mentally, but I felt the darkness he emitted. I think I could never picture what he looked like because he did not look like anything, like he was inhuman and could shift into any form he pleased. He felt dark and powerful, like pure evil. I felt his presence strongest in the back room, especially when I felt like I was being watched. The dark, malicious energy was suffocating. There, I took special care to not look too closely at the slats of the doors that led to the storage rooms, because I was afraid I would see his dark, faceless eyes staring back at me. I learned to not look too closely at the darkness. There were times when I avoided that room entirely like late at night when everything felt amplified. There were also month-long periods where I could not go into that room alone. I don't exactly know why there were periods when I felt like I could and couldn't be there. Maybe I had exhausted my courage and needed time to build it back up again. Maybe there were certain periods where the presences were just stronger. These periods would frustrate my parents to no end, because they dismissed my fears as childish nonsense. They had never spent a night in that basement the way I had with my sleepovers. They have never felt the gaunt woman's eyes on them as they slept. They had never felt the dark, malevolent energy that radiated from the back of the room in the middle of the night. Eventually, after moving out of that house, I began to think it was just childish nonsense too. I never actually saw anything unusual, so it was probably just my overactive childhood imagination. Right? Well, that was what I thought, until I brought it up to my sister years after moving out of there. My sister is six years older than me, so she was 16 when we moved out of that house. She was old enough to be over that sort of childishness. I had mentioned it to her to joke about how dumb I was as a kid and how my imagination must have gone into overdrive. I stopped in my tracks when she told me deadly serious, no, that house was haunted. It wasn't just you. She and my brother, who was 14 when we moved, were fully convinced the place was haunted. Without me saying anything about the basement, she said that her and my brother thought the basement in particular was haunted. I took things a little more seriously after that conversation, but I wasn't entirely convinced. We were siblings after all, and had talked to each other about the uneasiness in the basement when we lived there. We likely colored each other's perceptions and freaked each other out. At least, that's what I thought, until I brought this up to a childhood friend. 
This friend and I were pretty close in elementary school, but fell out of touch in middle and high school. We now go to the same college and have gotten more in touch because of it. One day when I was with her, I realized that she had been in the basement countless times while we played and had sleepovers. She should also be relatively unbiased because I never told her about the haunting at the time, because I didn't want to scare my friends off. I mentioned my conversation with my sister to her, and she was unsurprised. She told me that she had thought the house, and the basement in particular, was haunted. She hadn't told me at the time, because she didn't want to freak me out. She went on to say that the back room was where it was the worst. I did not tell her that my siblings and I thought that the basement was the most haunted part of the house, much less anything about the back room. Needless to say, I took things more seriously after that. What really freaks me out is my nightmares. To this day, whenever I have paranormal nightmares, it is always in that basement or the hallway leading up to the basement door. I have had dreams where I went down the stairs at my current house, only for it to shift to the bottom of the stairs at my old house. When I walked down the hallway by the stairs and past the basement door, there was the woman, floating ominously. In another nightmare that I had, I turned into a grotesque and mangled monster, and I was inexplicably drawn down that hallway towards the basement. It was like I knew that was where monsters belonged. These nightmares freak me out because dreams are often used by your brain to sort through information and trauma. When I had these dreams, I had just about forgotten about that basement, and I have only recently pieced all of this together. It is entirely possible that I had an experience that scared me to the point of trauma in that basement, but I can't remember it because it is blocked from my memory. In that case, my brain may still be trying to work through it through my dreams. If that is true, I hope that memory never comes to the surface, because some things are best left unknown. I never want to experience anything similar to that basement ever again, because sometimes, childhood fears are more than just childish nonsense. The following story occurred in 2008, during summertime. A month had passed since school ended, and I was excited to be home. I have a huge family. At this particular time, there were about nine people in the household. My mother and father, my four sisters and two brothers, and myself. I am the youngest. The night was beginning to approach, and my mother decided to put on the movie Scream for all of us to watch. Unfortunately, my father had to work. Normally, we watch our films in the living room area, but instead, my mother decided to watch the movie in her room. She had a huge bed to accommodate us all anyway. After getting food and snacks, we turn off the lights and begin watching the film. About 20 minutes later, I spot my mother whispering something into my oldest sister's ear. It was dark in the room, and I couldn't quite hear the conversation. I figured she was telling her to grab something from the kitchen because my sister rolled her eyes and proceeded to go downstairs. I placed my attention back onto the movie. Keep in mind that my oldest sister was 20 at the time. Moments later, I began to hear an unfamiliar voice come from below the room. Everyone in the room was fixated on the film, but even through the volume of the TV, I could hear something. If you walk right through my mother's bedroom door, straight ahead is the staircase on the left. I could see a glimmer of light shining on the banister that leads downstairs. It went away quickly as I heard the front door close. No one seemed to notice. Shortly after, my sister returns back upstairs with some sort of bag in her hand. She kept it tucked behind her back and handed it to my mother and sat down on the bed. At that point, I was confused, but I pretended that I did not see what occurred. After the movie ended, my mother announces that it's bedtime. My siblings and I grunt and groan in irritation and proceed to go to our rooms. Before I leave, my mother asks me to throw away all of the empty bags of popcorn. Now, I did not mind doing this, but I had a fear of going downstairs by myself, especially at night. 
Despite my hesitation, I collect the trash and begin making my way to the kitchen. The only source of light we leave on downstairs is the cooktop light in the kitchen above the stove. As I exit the living room and enter the dining room, I pause and discover something. In the kitchen, I saw a shadow reflecting onto the fridge. It appeared to be a man with a slightly pointy nose and a wide brim hat. He resembled the monster from Jeepers Creepers a little bit. The shadow stood there silently as I watched in awe. I was shocked. I could not tell if it was an appliance or a kitchen item, but deep down inside, I felt as though that was not the case. My entire body was paralyzed in fear. Suddenly, the shadow disappears, and I hear footsteps run out of the back door through the pantry. I scream until everyone comes downstairs. My mother consoles me and asks me what happened. I explained to her the situation, and at that moment, I believe she realized what occurred. Earlier that night, my mother gave my oldest sister money to give to a drug dealer in exchange for weed. When I described what I thought the man looked like, she confirmed that it was him. My mother has known the dealer for many years, so she was surprised to discover that he snuck back into the house to steal from us. Shelves and drawers were open and some items were on the ground and apparently, the front door was unlocked. My mother asked us to promise her to never tell our father about what happened that night. I have kept that promise to this day. I live in a place called Beddington, here in Maine. It's least populated part of the state, which probably makes it one of the least populated areas in the country. And with a population of just over 50 people, we're the very definition of a one stoplight kind of town. We all live pretty spaced out too. Nearest neighbor on my right side is about a mile away. Nearest neighbor on my left side is more like three miles away. The sense of community is real strong, but out here you really are alone in most senses of the word. And that kind of isolation is made all the more obvious whenever there's a power cut. It's only happened like twice the entire time I've been living out here. And one time, it was only for about an hour. But the second time, it must have been a serious fault down at whatever power station feeds us juice. Because the power was out all night. And I don't just remember that night because I couldn't watch the Pat play ball. It's burned into my memory for other reasons too. So like I said... Second ever power cut, but thanks to the experience I gained the first time around, I fare a little better that time. I have candles stored away. I have dynamo flashlights. I even got a battery-powered hot plate that would be good for a few uses, even if it did burn through the batteries. So instead of panicking and bumping into stuff in the dark, that time I just make myself comfortable, pick up a good book, and sit down to write it out on the couch. Now it's at this point that I should bring up my dog, Teddy. Teddy got his name because my grown-up daughter thought he looks like a teddy bear, which he kinda does. And given his considerably superior senses, the power cuts never seemed to bother Teddy none. Teddy never bumped into furniture or got spooked at every little noise or shadow. Teddy just stayed curled up by the log fire and warmed his bones. As I curl up myself, Teddy gives me this look at one point, as if to say, See, now you get it, old man. Just relax and take a load off. The power will come back on when it's good and ready to. But Teddy didn't stay relaxed for long, and neither did I. A couple of hours go by, and I am so engrossed by the book I was reading that when Teddy started to bark, it almost scared me out of my wits. See, Teddy never barked at anything. Even when he saw squirrels or raccoons, he would just sort of look at me like, What are you going to do about them three critters there, old man? Nothing fazed him, ever, so to even hear him yapping like that in the first place was pretty unusual. Then that got me wondering what could possibly freak him out enough to make him bark. I'm like, What is it, boy? What are you smelling? But Teddy just gets up, walks over towards the door to the hallway, and starts growling all low in between barks. And as I'm sitting there watching him, I get this real bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. 
That was the first time I had ever seen him acting like that, downright aggressive and territorial. Now, as much as I respect the Second Amendment, I don't really believe in keeping a weapon in the house. I hate them. Always have. Long story short, I lost a relative in an accident when I was a kid. Now just being around them makes me sweat. But what I do have on hand for home defense is an old recurve bow that I used for hunting. Not exactly ideal to stop a burglar, but it was better than nothing. I must have looked like an old, worn-out Comanche warrior creeping through my living room with a bow and arrow with only firelight to see where I was going. But I sure didn't feel like one. I had just turned 55. I was a grown man. But something about all that darkness and being so isolated made me feel like a scared kid. Best case scenario, Teddy had picked up the smell of a bear or a lynx on the wind. One that was still way off in the distance. Worst case would be something considerably worse. When I take a peek out front of the house through the window of my office, Teddy follows, jumping up on the windowsill and barking a few times after sniffing the air. Whatever he was smelling, I sure wasn't seeing it, so after peering into the darkness for a minute or two, I just take Teddy back into the TV room, where he stopped his barking. All was quiet again, so I carried on with my reading. About an hour later, the same thing happens all over again. Teddy jumps up from the rug, barking up a storm. Only this time, he seems considerably more aggressive. He bounds over to the door of the TV room, scratching at the handle and growling in a way that actually kind of frightened me. Like I said before, I had never seen Teddy act like that, and he was a completely different dog. When I let him out of the TV room, Teddy ran through the open door of the kitchen and started barking and scratching at the back door. I mean, he was going back there, and there was no way I was going to let him outside. The mood he was in, he would probably run off as fast as he could and getting himself lost. And besides that, I felt strangely safer with Teddy around. He stopped barking for a second, sniffed the air, and then bolted back into the TV room, where he started barking even louder at the glass patio doors that led to the backyard. I follow him. I'm all like, get him boy, tear him up. But when I catch a glimpse of the sliding glass doors, I'd swear I saw something moving in the shadows outside. I couldn't even tell you what I saw. It was nothing more than a flash of movement, but it was obvious enough for me to grab that recurve bow that I had propped up against the couch. I was so scared that I could barely line the arrow up with the drawstring. Teddy was going crazy at this point, acting like he was fixing to smash through the glass windows and chase down whatever he could smell. And like I said, it might have even just been the way the firelight reflected on the glass, but I wasn't willing to roll the dice on something being out there. Then suddenly... Teddy stops barking again. I figure it's because he lost the scent or something, because he shuts up entirely and stops pawing at the glass in the back door. But then he went and did the weirdest thing. He backs off from the doors, stands in front of me, shaking on all fours, and takes a piss right there on the carpet. He hadn't done anything like that since he was a puppy. Teddy was hardcore house trained. It's definitely not out of fear of some black bear either. Teddy's been in the same area as those ever since he was a puppy, and unless he actually saw one, I can't imagine he would freak out the way that he did. But the fact remains that animals like dogs have been known to just go to the bathroom on themselves whenever a much larger predator is in the area. Only I can't imagine how much larger it must have been to make Teddy forget his house training. After that, he was almost completely silent, just the occasional whimper while I stood there in the firelight just waiting for the mother of all black bears to come smashing through the back windows. At least, I hoped it was nothing but a black bear. I understand those animals, but I didn't understand what was going on during that power out at all, and it just about scared the crap out of me. But by far the worst part of the experience was when I actually heard something on the little side walkway to my house. See, there's a little gravel path where my wife used to grow vegetables, right around the side of my house, and I swear to the Almighty that I heard two distinct crunches on the gravel, right as I'm staring out into the darkness for like the hundredth time. That's when I started to call out, I know you're there. I'm armed. Now you better get out of here. I listened again, 
and for the next few minutes, there was nothing but silence. Just then, when I started to think I had imagined the whole thing, I heard it again, clear as day. Footfalls on the gravel. That time I was closer, and I had heard people walk up and down the gravel path a hundred times over the years. So I'm telling you right now, whatever was outside my house that night was way, way bigger than a person. If it was a black bear, it must have been the biggest one on the entire East Coast. Now I'm not saying it wasn't a bear or something, maybe it was just a big old dog that got lost and took to wandering into my yard, but like I said, it was big. Really big. And you can bet I was shaking like a dog as I heard its footfalls getting quieter and quieter as it made its way off my property. I didn't hear anything for the rest of the night. Teddy didn't bark again, but he seemed like he had thrown in the towel with that line of defense anyway. But I didn't hear anything outside, and evidently nothing broke into the house otherwise I'd be rambling on about it. It's just kind of surreal to me that one of the scariest experiences of my life comes across like a second-rate campfire tale. I don't scare easy, and what happened during that blackout scared me to death. I just hope whatever the thing was, whether it was a bear or the Turner Beast or something else entirely, stays well away from my property in the future, because it would take far more than just a few arrows to take down a beast as big as that. For a few years there, Omegle and Chat Roulette were like the best things ever. I know it sounds dumb, but the idea of coming face to face with random internet people absolutely terrified me at first. I wasn't the most confident to people when I was younger, and believe it or not, using stuff like Omegle actually helped me come out of my shell a little and learn how to talk to people. And naturally, like anyone who has spent a lot of time on Omegle, I have a lot of stories detailing some of the weirder encounters I have had on there. I mean, I have had some pretty amazing ones. I met one of my longtime gaming buddies on Omegle, and you would be surprised at the number of girls. But I've also had my share of gross, sad, irritating, and downright scary encounters. And what I'm about to tell you is by far the most disturbing. And it's not some creepypasta either. Every word of it is the truth. So I had just gotten home from this crappy part-time job I was working in 2012, and at the time, my routine was like, get home, sneak one of my stepdad's beers from the garage, and see how palpable the mental illness was on Omegle that afternoon. I was actually having a good run at one point. I had a guy singing that Call Me Maybe song, another dude who did a magic trick, a handful of pretty girls, and I think one guy was on something. So all in all, I was in a pretty good mood by the time I hit end and new for what turned out to be the final time that night. Because when I do, I just see this guy sitting at a desk, staring blankly into the webcam. Immediately this hits me as unusual, because most people are looking at their screens to see who you are and not straight up staring into the camera. I said something like, Hey, what's up? Or something. But the dude didn't reply so I figured there was just something wrong with his audio. Now I should add that it was usually around that time that I would just end a chat and start a new one if the person on the other end seemed too weird or like they wouldn't be much fun. I would just skip them entirely. So as you can imagine, coupled with all the other weird stuff you're likely to see during an Omegle session, I ended up doing a lot of skipping. But something about this guy really got my attention. Like at first when I saw him, he looked like he might be in his early to mid-teens. Dark hair and eyes. Kind of a baby face with scrawny shoulders. But the more I looked, the older he seemed to be. The guy had crow's feet. Deep bags under his eyes. Pretty sure he had flecks of gray at his temples too. Like if he was as young as I thought he was, then he must have had the most brutal paper route in history. So for some reason... At a time I would normally just ghost, I said something like, Uh, are you okay? Can you hear me? He nods. He could hear me. And it hit me that this might be another case of someone browsing Omegle when they're high. 
It must sound a little mean or whatever, but I figured I would mess with him just a little, maybe see if I could guess what he was on. I start talking real slow to him, trying to make him think that time is slowing down or something, but he barely reacts, and it's then that I realize he hasn't once looked at his phone screen or monitor. The whole time, he was literally just staring at the little lens on his webcam. I break from the play acting and just ask him straight up, What are you on, man? He shakes his head, so I ask him if he means he isn't on anything at all, and to that, he nods. Now I'm torn between laughing, because of what could have been a blatant lie, and kind of freaking out, because if he wasn't lying, and that was him sober, that made for one really creepy guy. Then, out of nowhere, this guy reaches up towards his mouth like he's about to take out some gum or something. At first, I think he's going to show me some weird root he's been chewing on that made him look all sleepy. I mean, if there is such a thing. I know people can get some pretty weird South American plants and stuff from shady websites, but then it becomes obvious that he has a hold of his tooth. His front tooth, I think. Like in the grip of his thumb and forefinger. And then he starts to pull... I'm like, dude, what are you doing? All calm at first, and then he starts like really getting a grip on his tooth, pulling and twisting, and I'm like, dude, stop, what are you doing? This all escalates until I hear a deep cracking sound coming from the guy's mic. He twists the tooth free from his gum as blood starts pouring out of his mouth, then holds it up to the camera like he's all proud of himself. I am full on squealing at the computer at this point stuck between wanting to cover my eyes and turn it off at the stack and not being able to look away because what is this guy even doing? I asked this guy in like a hundred different ways why did you do that? Was it rotten? Can't you go to the dentist? What are you doing? He doesn't say a word he just spends a few more seconds smiling this gape tooth grin mopping at the blood on his chin and holding up the tooth in front of the webcam then he disappears, and I'm left on the new chat screen, just shell-shocked. Nothing has ever topped that for me, in terms of pure creepiness. I have so many unanswered questions about that guy, and each time I think I get close to figuring it out, it just opens me up to a hundred other questions. I mean, he would have been on something to be able to pull his own tooth out like that. I don't think anyone could stand the sheer agony of it sober. And it's also the whole idea that it wasn't his first time doing it. Like as crazy as it sounds, he seemed to just know what he was doing. That he had to twist it and wrench it. He knew exactly how to grip it. And then the sense of pride at the end. It all just gave me this distinct feeling that he had done that kind of thing before. I didn't see anything else that ever made me react so strongly. And after that, all the random stuff you would see didn't faze me at all. Like as long as there was no tooth pulling, it was just water off a duck's back. So I guess I have something to thank Mr. Tooth Puller for. Although saying that, it's not something I want to see ever again. I grew up on a farm just outside of Limerick in Ireland which as you can imagine, made for quite an eventful upbringing. It also meant my back garden was bloody massive, so I had plenty of space to run around outside, playing make-believe with my two sisters. And without a shadow of a doubt, our favorite toy was the little Wendy house that Dad had built for us at the end of the garden. I don't know if they have those in the rest of the world, but basically a Wendy house is like a little miniature playhouse for kids. And I say little but dad had built us a massive one, with like a little hallway and a kitchen and a little ladder going upstairs to a little loft. It was absolutely adorable. Me and my sisters just loved it. So much so, that one summer's night, when it was warm enough, we asked mom and dad if we could sleep out in the Wendy house one night. They were understandably reluctant to give us permission at first, but we pestered them and pestered them until they finally relented. We could have a sleepover in the Wendy house, but we have to be on our best behavior, not fight, and promise not to go walking around in the dark. It was a deal. You can understand our parents' reservations, too, 
because the end of the garden, I mentioned, was probably about a hundred meters away from the actual house, near this old shuck that backed out onto some woodland. Not the ideal place to leave your kids alone overnight. So that's how three girls under 10 years old ended up in a dimly lit wooden playhouse in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night. And for some reason, my older sister Kathleen decides it would be a good idea to tell ghost stories. Kathleen has always been a bit strange. She has always had a fascination with ghosts and ghoulies and witches and whatnot, ever since she was young. And since she had gotten her hands on a book of Irish ghost stories, she thought she might regurgitate one of the stories she had read to us. She started telling us about a ghost that actually originated in Ireland, that unlike a Dracula or Frankenstein, which come from the other countries, as nine-year-old her put it, we actually had banshees in Ireland, since that's where they originated from. Our minds are absolutely blown. Ghosts lived in graveyards, old houses, and other haunted places that you had to go to, to see one. But here's Kathleen, telling us about a ghost that actually comes to you, to tell you that someone's going to die in your family. And the way it lets you know this is by screaming in the middle of the night, like a ghostly, ear-piercing wail. Kathleen goes on to tell us that these banshee are women who have died in terrible, painful ways. Hence the screaming and that they look like shriveled old women with red eyes who carry bowls of blood. We were just about trembling in our pajamas by the time Kathleen finished describing the nightmarish appearance of the Banshee by torchlight. But somehow, when Dad came out to interrupt and tell us it was bedtime, we managed to get comfy and drift off to an uneasy sleep. The next thing I know, I am wide awake in total darkness, and everything is deathly quiet. Then I hear something that was so frightening that at first, I think I just froze up in complete terror. It was a shrill, ear-piercing shriek, almost gravely too, as if it had come from the throat of an old lady. When I finally found the courage to move, I shot up from my makeshift bed, shaking my sisters awake and telling them to listen. We just sat there in the darkness for a moment, all three of us terrified until we heard the screech again. Hearing it for a second time had me just about out of my mind with fear. But my little sister took it even worse. It's a banshee. I remember her crying. We have to tell mom and dad. Then my big sister, bless her, decided that even though she's terrified, she's going to run to mom and dad so they can rescue us from the banshee. Say what you like about Kathleen, but she believed her own hype. She thought there was a banshee out there just as much as us. I mean, what else could have been making those ungodly noises out there? We are frantically looking for our torches, but in our panic, we can't find them. And when the banshee screams for a third time, Kathleen decides she can't afford to wait any longer. She gets up and in complete darkness, climbs down the little ladder, opens the Wendy house door, and runs off to fetch us rescue. While Kathleen was gone, me and my little sister managed to find one of the torches. So, we flick it on and point it down at the Wendy house door from the loft. I don't know what logic of that was, but that's what we did, and we cuddled together, cried, and waited for the banshee to get us. After a minute or so, we hear rustling outside the Wendy house. Something was moving outside. We are so scared of the thing hearing us that we've got our hands over our mouths but we still can't stop crying, and we still don't turn the torch off. Suddenly the door opens, and what stepped inside made me and my little sister scream in pure horror. Blood was pouring down the mouth and chin of my big sister, and now she's back in the light. Now she too can see that she's bleeding. She smears a bit of blood on her fingers, looks at it, then promptly collapses. We are absolutely inconsolable at this point. Me and my little sister are begging, screaming, crying for our parents to come and save us. To us, Kathleen just ran out to get help, and the Banshee had got her before she could make it. We are trapped. The Banshee's getting closer. We are doomed. Then there's more footsteps outside the Wendy house. Heavier footsteps now. Banshee footsteps. 
The door swings open again. Only this time, the face that appears is our dad, wanting to know, What is going on in here? We're screaming. Dad, there's a banshee. Be careful. It got Kathleen. Behind you, Dad. He's obviously skeptical at first, but when he sees Kathleen's face, it's his turn to be terrified. He turns ashen, grabs Kathleen's little body up in his arms, and then rushes back to the house with her. So keep in mind that even at this, the point of parental intervention, Dad has not taken the time to tell us that there definitely isn't a banshee. And if anything, his reaction at Kathleen's face confirmed that not only is there definitely a banshee outside, but he's completely abandoned us. Seriously, just try and imagine being seven years old and that being your truth. We didn't calm down for hours. Mom and Dad say we were still up crying at one o'clock in the morning, with the whole incident going on at about ten. Even when we knew everything was okay, we just cried because it had been so traumatic. Obviously, there was no Banshee, and we didn't find this out until years later for obvious reasons. But what we had heard was the sound of two foxes mating. As me and my sisters now know all too well, when they do that, the lady fox screeches at the top of her lungs, producing what is a rather unsettling and otherworldly sound. Kathleen, being the brave big sister she was, had run out to protect us, but maybe if she was as nimble as she was courageous, she wouldn't have run directly into that tree in her blind panic, almost knocking herself out in the process. The best she could do then was retrace her poor befuzzled steps back to the Wendy house and pass out at the sight of her own blood. It's a story we tell every Christmas now, especially when there's a new boyfriend or husband making an appearance, and it always gets a giggle from those that hear it. But I think if you put a weapon to my head and asked me for the scariest moment of my life, I would say, the Banshee, when I was seven years old. I am deadly serious, scarier than childbirth, scarier than finding the lump in my breast, scarier than confronting my first husband about his drinking, because I believed something I didn't understand was coming to get me, something mythical, something supernatural, something that even Dad was scared of. Needless to say, there were no more sleepovers in the Wendy house that summer, and the whole thing collapsed a few years later. But me and my sisters will always have that story to make us laugh, even though at the time, we were scared for our lives. Hi everyone. So my name is Lena. I am Malay, and I spent a summer in the United States as a part of a summer school program at Virginia Tech University. There were lots of extracurricular activities too. I mean, what else were we going to do with our spare time? So I got to know a lot of my classmates rather well while doing all sorts of cool things with them. One of the most amazing things I got to do while I was there was go hiking up in the Appalachian Mountains. I managed to get some pictures of the most stunning views I have ever seen in my life, and walking those hills will remain one of the most memorable times of my entire life. But I'll never forget my time in the Appalachians for another reason, too, because it included one of the most hair-raisingly terrifying experiences of my life, one which left me shaking from the amount of adrenaline running through me. So at one point, we were taking a break from hiking, eating some snacks, and taking sips from bottles of water that didn't manage to stay very cold for very long. I am chatting with my best friends on the trip, Sol and Gabby, when we hear some rustling in the foliage next to us. The next thing I hear is our guide whispering, Don't move. No one move a muscle. They had been confident to the point of cockiness on the trail up until that point. A real outdoorsy manly man type but hearing the fear in their voice made my blood turn to ice, which was no small feat on such a hot day. I did as I was told. I didn't move. I just sort of shifted my eyes in the direction of the rustling, and when I saw what came out of the bushes, I couldn't even scream I was so scared. It was like I had been turned into a stone statue, 
albeit one that trembled uncontrollably with fear. It was a bear, a black bear, and it was walking right towards me. I suppose it had been attracted to the smell of our snacks. From what I understand, black bears don't have the best eyesight, but they do have an incredible sense of smell. And even though we weren't cooking any food, it must have been close enough in the area to be able to pick up the scent. I stayed as still as I could as it walked up to me, but when it stood up on its hind legs, I swear my heart nearly stopped beating altogether. I had no idea they could do that, like I kind of knew black bears were smaller than grizzlies or polar bears, and that they were considerably less aggressive too, but oh my gosh, that thing wasn't small when it stood up like that. I swear, it was so tall. I was trembling and holding back whimpers of fear as it started to sniff me, knowing that if I made one wrong move, if I didn't keep my cool and stay perfectly still, it might just maul me to death right there and then. It was the most terrifying moment of my life so far. It sort of lost interest in me after a few moments, moving on to my friend Soul, who just dropped the sandwich he was eating immediately. The bear sniffed at it, but ignored it then did the same thing to her, standing on its hind legs and sniffing at her face and neck. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, it just lost interest in us and wandered off into the woods again. We all breathed a heavy sigh of relief as it left us, thankful that it wasn't hungry or ballsy enough to have attacked us. Never in all my years have I ever had such an up-close and personal encounter with such a powerful, wild beast. It left an indelible mark on me, giving me profound respect for nature, even more so than I had beforehand. I am just so thankful that it wasn't a grizzly or something out in the Pacific Northwest, because if it was, I probably wouldn't be telling this story. I hate telling this story, not only because of how traumatic it was for me, but because it does show my age. My therapist tells me I should learn to look for the positives in things, so the only way I really know how is by making light humor. This was the early 90s and I was about 16 going on 17, working as a regular babysitter in my neighborhood. My parents had decided that the only way I was going to actually get a car would be if I was the one that saved up for the down payment. So every afternoon after school, I would tutor kids or watch babies, whatever I could do to earn a few extra bucks. There was one couple, the Moors, that always paid exceptionally well, and on Valentine's Day, they had a special request for me to watch both their six-year-old and their ten-year-old so that they could go enjoy a romantic evening together. We'll be back by eight, they said, and gave me about fifty dollars just for ordering pizza, renting movies, whatever the kids wanted to do. I asked them both what they wanted, and they both chimed in with a request to go to the local video rental store. I knew that the Blockbuster wasn't very far, but I insisted that I didn't want to do that until I got confirmation from their mom, this being the age before cell phones that required I had to look up the phone number in an actual phone book and call the restaurant where they were dining. Those two boys were so eager to hear a yes from their mom I thought they might explode from excitement. It took about 15 minutes for me to finally get in touch with their mom, who seemed a little frazzled that the only reason I was calling was so we could go to Blockbuster. Yeah, that's fine. Just don't spend all their money. And nothing rated R, she responded. When I told them, both of the boys squealed and ran to get their jackets. We left the house before it got dark and made it to the rental store in less than 10 minutes. Not surprisingly, it was pretty empty save for the cashier and maybe one or two other customers. Go and pick out whatever you want, I told them as I grabbed some candy bars and popcorn. The oldest came back first with a VHS of some Disney sequel and asked if this was okay. I told him yes and then asked where his brother was, only for him to be surprised that I did not know. Both of us went down the aisles looking for him and for a split second, I got scared, thinking he had decided to play some terrible prank and run off. 
Finally, though, I saw him standing near the edge of an aisle talking to a tall, lanky man wearing a trench coat. As soon as I saw this guy, I got a weird vibe and grabbed the younger boy's hand. Sorry, I hope he wasn't bothering you, I nervously told the stranger. He smelled funny, as if he hadn't taken a bath in a while, and he had this weird, crazy look in his eyes that told me he was trouble. I just had a feeling, and I desperately wanted to be wrong about it, so I yanked the kid away and berated him as we made toward the cashier. What were you telling him anyway? I asked. Just that we was renting some movies, and that we was home alone, the kid said innocently. I don't know why that didn't make alarm bells go off in my brain right away, but I guess I was too busy paying for the movies and dragging them out of the store. When we were walking back toward their house, it finally registered what he had told me. Did that man ask you if you were alone? I asked. My heart was starting to beat a little faster, but I didn't want the kids to think I was worried. Out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw someone following us. Yeah, he seemed friendly, asked a lot of questions about me, the younger boy responded. I picked up the pace and told them we needed to hurry back to their house. I was positive now that we were being followed. I remember I looked back several times to see where the man was, but every time it felt like he was just barely out of sight. He was a master of stealth, it seemed. Once inside their house, I slammed the door shut and was upset at the kid for being so ignorant. Don't you ever talk to strangers. That man could have done you some serious harm. I remember thinking I should punish them both by having them go to bed early, but I had no idea how right I would be about my warning of this stranger. I glanced out the windows to see if I could spot him, and after calming down, I went ahead and let them pick a movie. I was also trying to convince myself that my paranoia had just been my imagination. Less than ten minutes later, as we were watching the Angels in the Outfield movie, I heard a knock at the door that made me realize maybe I hadn't been cautious enough. I went to the front and peeked through the blinds, curious to see that no one was outside. My heart was pounding now as I thought I saw the man in the trench coat standing over near the bushes. I immediately told the boys to pull the blinds closed and then turn off the lights. Next, I started to hear this stranger banging on the windows with what sounded like a stick. Was he trying to frighten us? I remember wondering. If so, he was doing a stellar job, because I was terrified. Turn off the TV for now. Let's get to the bedroom, I said. I remembered that the Moors had a house phone up in their master suite, so I was calmly trying to herd the kids there as this wacko kept rattling against the outside of the house. The kids were getting scared now, especially the youngest, and he was crying. Be quiet, don't be scared, I told him as we ran up to the bedroom. I told them both to be quiet as I reached for the phone, only to find that the line was disconnected. This is the moment when a real sense of panic and dread was starting to overwhelm me. It was just past 6.30, meaning that their parents would not be home for at least another 45 minutes. And now, with the phone lines down, I was positive that this stranger was going to try to break in and do us harm. Still, I insisted that they needed to remain quiet and calm. I got the older one to assist me in moving furniture to the front of the door as a blockade just in case this guy broke in. It's a good thing I did, because about 20 minutes later, I heard the shattering of glass and realized that was precisely what he had decided to do. I told them both not to make a sound as I tried to listen to where the stranger was. The only thing about this whole experience I will never forget is that the stranger started to whistle for us like he was looking for a dog. It was a loud, sharp, insistent whistle, and he kept saying, Here, boy. Here, boy. Come here, boy. I swear I have never been more scared in my life, and I ordered the boys to hide under the bed as footsteps came up the stairs. I was pretty sure we were about to die. It happened just like a horror movie, too. He was standing outside the door, because I could see the silhouette of his shadow peeking under the master bedroom door. 
Then the blockade of furniture started to rattle as I heard him fiddle with it. He shook it violently for a while, but to no success, and then for another long, indescribably quiet moment, I thought maybe he had given up. The kids were trying their best to not squeal or scream, or even cry, but it was so hard to be perfectly still. At any second, I knew he was going to be back. Then, he slammed his body against the door, and it came slightly ajar. I remember jumping and holding the boys closer as he did it again, and then again, until at last he could squeeze in past the wedge furniture. All I could see was his shoes, leather boots that looked coated in mud. He walked slowly over to the bed and sat down, perhaps puzzling over where we were. He started whistling again, and I had to cover the younger boy's mouth as he let a leash fall over the edge of the bed. Did he know we were here? What sort of weird fetish was this supposed to be? He walked around the room, moving to the closet first and checking for us there. Then we heard the sound of the garage door downstairs. I had never been so happy. Immediately, the stranger ran down and I heard shouts of alarm as Mr. Moore likely saw him escape. A few seconds later, Mrs. Moore was in the bedroom, frantically searching for us and calling out her children's names. I crawled out first and helped her youngest get out as she grabbed him and hugged him as tight as possible. Downstairs, Mr. Moore was trying the landline again to contact the police, but it didn't work. Honestly, I thought the crazy guy was going to come back and do us more harm, so I didn't even want to step outside the house until my own parents came to pick me up. Mr. Moore told me that I was very brave and paid me extra for helping keep his kids safe. My parents also told me I had acted swiftly and decisively and it could have turned out a lot worse, but I didn't feel very proud. I had trouble sleeping for a week after. Any sound of a dog bark or a whistle would trigger the memory and make me want to curl up into a ball and hide. I can honestly only share it now after all these years, thanks to a bit of therapy. Sometimes I do think about what could have happened still though, had the parents not shown up early. Would he have harmed us? Or killed us? The cops never did catch whoever the guy was. So I guess we will never know. Except I know that I at least stopped babysitting for the upper class after that. I ended up getting invited to this pretty wild house party back when I was a teenager. Definitely the craziest party I had ever been to. It was good while it lasted, but the reason it sticks out in my memory is far from a good one, as I'll get to explaining. So like I said, this house party was off the wall. There were kegs in all the downstairs rooms. People were taking off their clothes and dancing in the backyard. Some dudes upstairs tore down a bedroom wall with a sledgehammer. It was insane. Now with a party that intense, it's not entirely unusual for the bathroom to be full of puke with random people, like passed out all around the party. And the dude I really noticed was lying on the couch in the TV room downstairs. I figure he must have really overdone it because the whole time I'm there, he's completely passed out. Like to the point where he just sort of became part of the furniture in there. Like he has claimed the couch to himself. In the end, people just let him be and the party continued. People dancing around him, walked around him, drank around him. All night too. At the end of the night, I was way too drunk to call an Uber. So I figure I'll just pass out in an upstairs bedroom and make my way home in the morning. So I have a crappy, hungover sleep wake up, gather my stuff, and head downstairs. On the way out, I have to pass the dude who was wiped out on the couch the previous night. It didn't look like he had moved all night, and that just didn't sit right with me. So on the way out, I try to wake him. Have you ever touched someone, only to realize they're dead? They really do go cold, and they really do go stiff. And I promise you, it's one of the most mind-breakingly awful things you will ever experience in your life. I immediately yelp when I feel how cold the dude's skin was. 
which then has a few other sleepy people filling into the TV room to see what the deal is, which was basically me begging people to call 911 because there's a dead guy on the couch. It really messed people up, mainly because, like I said, we were dancing and drinking and partying around this dude's possibly dead body all night. And there he was, lying in the exact same position he had passed out in. There was no telling at what point he had actually slipped away. No telling just how long we had been partying around an actual corpse. I heard it was an overdose, but never really got that confirmed by anyone. Like I barely knew anyone at the party, just that they were good people and it was a real shame how one of them went out. I am extra careful around drugs and alcohol now too, and I tell my kids that if they want to get into drinking or smoking or whatever they want to do, that they do it safely. I know I can't stop them from misbehaving, especially what age they're at, and it's not even the substances I'm worried about them touching. I just never want any of my kids to have to know what it feels like. Touching flesh that's gone cold. Looking at someone's face and knowing they're no longer with us. I don't want them to know what death feels like. I had never ever babysat for anyone before, so admittedly, I was pretty nervous. But if I had known what kind of night I had in store for me, I would have turned the job down in a second. It was made all the worse by the fact that my parents pretty much assured me that it would be an easy 50 bucks and that the night would be over before I knew it. I had a bad feeling about the whole thing from the start, but my dad actually managed to talk me out of that headspace. Now, I wish I had just trusted my gut and stayed well away. So I wander over to the house around 7 in the evening, introducing myself to the parents and the kid, before they go over a few ground rules. At first, it seemed like my dad was right, that I was just being silly, and that, if I played my cards right, I could turn this into a regular earner to fund my weekend shopping habits. The parents were lovely, and so was the kid, so I got pretty chill pretty quickly and ended up sort of enjoying myself. Entertaining the kid after they left with the help of Disney Plus, which I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a huge fan of. Anyway, everything is going well until it comes time to put the kid to bed. Then things started getting a little awkward. The kid straight up refuses and our new happy little friendship starts to quickly deteriorate. I felt super mean having to lay down the law with the kid and he went from crying and wailing to shouting and screaming at me that, like, I wasn't his mom. He hated me, and I didn't belong there. Stuff like that. It actually kind of hurt, and I started to realize that maybe I wasn't ready for that kind of responsibility yet. To be a parent or a guardian, you need to be tough enough to be able to kind of, like, be the bad guy, if that makes any sense. And if there are any of you out there that are looking to get into babysitting, Thinking it'll be an easy few bucks, please reconsider. I have done way, way easier things for money before and since. Things that don't make you feel crappy for having to shout at a kid. But after a while, the whole temper tantrum seems to have tired the kid out. And even though he still seems upset with me, he went up to his room, got into his pajamas, and climbed into bed to go to sleep. He asked me to read him a story, and since he had actually done as he was told, I obliged. And when his eyes finally closed, and his breathing slowed, I snuck out of the room and downstairs to leave him to get some rest. So about an hour or so later, I was sitting on the couch texting a friend of mine, telling them how babysitting was way harder than I thought it was going to be. I am working through the leftover chicken pot pie that my mom had given me to take over there catching up on some episodes of The Mandalorian, when the family house phone starts to ring. Thinking it was the parents looking to check up on me, I pick up, greeting the caller in the cheeriest voice I could manage. Only, no one on the other end responds. I say hello a few more times, assume it's a butt dial or a bad line and hang up, heading back to finish off my pie. No sooner that I sat down again, 
The phone rings, again. I was kind of expecting it, I suppose. Maybe the parents had gone through a tunnel or something. I don't know. But either way, I get up again, head over to the phone, and pick up. Only this time, when I do, I can hear breathing on the other end of the phone. I give another cheery hello, but there's just the same breathing coming from the other end. When the person finally speaks, it's this super deep voice, obviously a guy, telling me to check on the sleeping kid. I thought it might have been the kid's dad, but there was also something really weird and distorted about the voice, too. I respond, like, Okay, I'll go check. And the line goes dead immediately. The kid is fine, sleeping like a rock. So as much as I'm kind of creeped out by the weird voice, I figure it must have been the dad. Maybe the parents had argued. I don't know. I tried not to think so much about it. But then, pretty much as soon as I'm back downstairs, the phone rings again. No caller ID. No nothing. So I answer, unable to prevent this fear from entering my voice. Big mistake. Whoever is calling senses this and starts to, like, giggle down the phone line in that same weirdly distorted voice. What they said next made my blood turn to ice. Gonna snatch him up, gonna snatch up the kitty when you're not looking. Gonna get him. I went silent, just totally silent out of fear. And that's when I heard a creak in the floorboards above me. Someone was moving around in the rooms upstairs. I pretty much dropped the phone and bolt upstairs into the kid's room to find that he's still asleep. Or rather, that he very much appears to be asleep, but that same deep, slow breathing isn't there. The more I look, the more like he seems like he's almost hiding his breath or something. Not only that, but his arm is at this weird angle that makes it look like he's holding onto something under his pillow. Something he's trying to hide. In a fury, I pull the pillow up slightly and then realize what's been happening. Whoever thought it was a good idea to buy an eight-year-old kid a phone is straight up crazy. But under that pillow wasn't just a phone, there was a voice distorter under there too. I grab both and run out of the room, back downstairs, where the kid starts throwing another temper tantrum. I felt so dumb, completely played by the kid, made to feel terrified and vulnerable. How could someone be so young, yet so malicious and mean-spirited? The parents arrived home shortly afterward, and I didn't mention a word of what happened, until they had paid me in full. Then, I read them the riot act. I was never going to babysit for them again, and they were completely irresponsible. Letting their kid have things like a phone, let alone an actual voice distorter. Turns out, the creepy little gadget was their older college-aged kids, and the little guy was fascinated with it and wouldn't give it back. But I didn't care. I wasn't about to put myself out there like that. Ever again. This happened a few years ago when I was about 15 years old. It was a pretty common occurrence at the time for my family and the families of my two best friends to go out for dinner. During one such time, my best friends and I decided that it would be more adult and cool for us to sit away from the rest of our families and to just eat and chat at a separate table. We were a couple of young teens having a fun time. That's when one of my friends, Jenny, whispered, that the guy sitting at the table next to us seemed to be staring at me. I slightly turned my head and realized that he did seem to be looking my way, but I brushed it off. I mean, we were at a restaurant. People looking around seemed normal and innocent enough. As the time progressed, my other friend Gabby also noticed the man staring at me, and we began to get a little more concerned. He had seemed to have finished his food a long time ago, but just continued to sit there watching us, especially me. 
The man seemed to be in his 30s, and his expression was starting to creep the three of us out. But we decided not to do anything, in case it was just us overthinking. Eventually the man did pay and leave, and we felt relieved. But as soon as I took my first bite of food, Jenny motioned to me frantically. We were sitting by a window, and as it turned out, the man had left the restaurant, but he hadn't fully left the premises. He was standing outside the window, staring at me. At this point, we realized this wasn't normal behavior, but we also didn't want to alert our families and cause a scene. So we kept eating, but also kept our attention on the window. By the time we were all done with dinner and our bill had been paid, the man was still outside. We were worried he would try something, so we stayed close to our dads on the way out. He followed us as we walked to our cars from a distance, but eventually changed direction and left. The whole ordeal was super creepy to us, but we let it go, because it was over, or so we thought. Three months later, the three of us decided to visit the busy downtown area of our city for fun. We were standing on a street corner trying to figure out where to go next, when I felt Gabby tapping my shoulder. At first, I didn't respond, but when she continued, I looked up, and I felt like my heart stopped. It was the same guy from the restaurant. The restaurant had been nowhere near where we were currently standing, yet somehow, by sheer coincidence, we had ran into him again in a city of huge population. The guy made eye contact with me, and I could tell he recognized us. We immediately walked away as fast as we could and he started to follow, but after a few minutes eventually, we did lose him. We tried to then continue on with our plans, and did end up having a good time, all things considered. However, just when we had decided to head back home, we ran into the guy and one of his friends again. This time we were really freaked out. He spotted us again, and this time, him and his friend followed us. Gabby said maybe he won't come after us if we go into a makeup store. We tried that, but nope, they walked right inside after us. At this point, Jenny was ready to call the police, but we decided to try and lose them one last time by ducking into a toy store. We stayed in the store for a while and kept an eye out outside. They walked back and forth for a few minutes looking for us, but eventually they left the area and we decided now was the time to make our move and leave. This time we lost them for good, but the whole ordeal was beyond stressful. The three of us never told anyone else what happened. I still don't know what he wanted from me or what would have happened if he had caught up to us, but I am glad I haven't seen the guy since. All these years later, my friends and I think back to this incident and still think about how crazy the odds were to meet the same creep more than once in two completely different random places. This happened to me when I was 21 after I tried to take my own life. I woke up in the hospital in the middle of the night to a nurse saying he needed to replace my IV. He jabs me two or three times, but doesn't hit a vein. So I ask if he can get someone else to try. He says no and keeps going. As he is doing this, he is pushing and wiggling the needles around under my skin, saying he is trying to get the vein. By the seventh or eighth needle, it registers that he is intentionally trying to hurt me. I ask him, Why are you doing this? He just says back, It's your own fault that you're here. I was too weak to fight back, and it was in the middle of the night. There was no one else around I could call out to. I have no idea how many times he ended up puncturing me in the end. The next day, a different nurse was taking out my IV. She was horrified because she said it was the biggest needle she had ever seen using on a living patient. Not sure why you would use needles on a dead patient, but that's what she said. 
A lot of people shrug this off when I tell them about it, but it was so terrifying being alone, helpless, and knowing that the person who was supposed to care for you hated you and wanted to cause you pain. I was 12 years old. It was the summer between grade 6 and grade 7. My family had rented this really awesome cottage by the ocean in Prince Edward Island. Big cottage with a jacuzzi, a field of fresh barley growing in the backyard, which, if you walked to the end of the field, there was a little wooden path that took you into a kilometer's worth of our own private beach. It was easily one of the nicest cottages I ever stayed at. Prince Edward Island is a beautiful province too, by the way. Definitely go if you have the chance. I remember asking about sharks in the water to my parents, and they just laughed and told me to worry more about jellyfish, because the water is too cold for sharks, but there are a few jellies that can get you in the shallows if you aren't careful. They aren't aggressive though. The beach we had was really cool. So many types of crabs and jellyfish that are actually fun to play with, all just sprawled out for kilometers of beautiful red sand decorated with tide pools. When you finally walk all the way out to the ocean in low tide, you could continue walking for miles through the surf. Unfortunately, I found this out soon enough. It was a normal day at the beach with my family, filming videos and exploring. My brother and I ditched our parents and decided to go for a swim. The water in this beach was about as warm as the Atlantic water gets. I swear, in the more shallow water, it felt just like a public swimming pool on a very hot day. I was wrestling my brother for a bit. I slapped him in the back, performing what we called a five-star. He got upset and started throwing me around the water. He then threw a jellyfish at me, stinging me in my chest, and threatened to pee on me where I then threw the jellyfish back at him, and a jellyfish fight erupted. My parents had reconvened to our location on the shore, and motioned to my brother and I that they had brought lunches. Later, my brother said to me while making an L on his forehead and making a face. My parents called me over, but I wanted to keep swimming. This water was barely up to my waist, so I kept walking further out to get to where it became deeper, I kept walking out until the water was just up to my nipples and started doing a front crawl. I did a couple backflips underwater and bobbed up and down a bit. I then decided I was cold and turned to head back to the shore. What I thought were seabirds turned out to be my family hooting and hollering for me to come back. They looked like tiny little specks off in the distance. I could barely make out that my dad was waving his arms in the air. This instantly freaked me out, because I had no idea I traveled that far in such a short amount of time. Being a 12-year-old child, I had no idea anything about undertoes or riptides. I just knew I had to get back to shore like my life depended on it. Because it did. The resistance of the undertow was fierce. Having gone surfing since this incident, I now know if you are caught in a riptide, to remain calm and swim parallel to the shore until you get out of the riptide. That simple. I did not know this at the time. Full panic ensued. Thank my lucky stars, in my panic, I ended up splashing myself out of the current. This was because I was a bad swimmer. If it kept taking me further, I would have definitely drowned, and the water was becoming deeper. The undertow at my feet was still very strong, although manageable enough to slowly move through, creating lots of resistance and making me work extra hard. Almost drowning is quite the workout. I knew I was slowly but surely making my way back to shore. My parents saw that I was heading back, so they continued to eat lunch. I was becoming exhausted, just trying to march and swim my way back into shore. I was still very far away when something forced me to stop doing everything I was doing and listen to the sound of my pounding heartbeat. 
something slippery and soft brushed up against my leg. I looked around, tried to make out the ocean floor below the waist-deep water I was standing in, still fighting the waves. There was no seaweed below me. Uh, must have been a jellyfish or some sort of fish. I tried to reassure myself as I began moving forward again. As I am thinking this and trying to make out what's underneath the waves, I thought I saw a shadow in the water. A wave obstructed whatever it was, and before I could even think about anything, I felt the force of that same slippery sensation slide across my entire body. Something was in the water with me, and it was gigantic. Soft, but gigantic and terrifying at the same time. I could barely breathe, I was so shook. In some fit of hysterical panic, I started trying to swim away as fast and explosively as I could. First, front crawl, but switched to a backstroke to see behind me before I pretty much had an asthma attack and was forced to stop. I could barely breathe properly and was shaking with fear. I remembered in school that sharks have a sort of ESP and can sense fear. They respond to panicking humans like they are wounded prey. I kept scanning all around me. I could barely see anything through the waves until the sun poked out. Inside a particularly big wave was a giant, black, 10-12 to 12 foot long sea monster. It swam diagonally in my direction so fast it was like it almost vanished into thin air. I was still far from the shore. I decided to slowly walk one foot at a time, planting my feet and fighting the undertow. I was still in waist-deep water. I remembered on Shark Week that sharks can swim at 40 kilometers and most shark attacks occur in waist-deep water. I thought a wave looked like a shark fin and I immediately shifted position to face my demise. Then I noticed, in this level of fear, almost every wave looks like a shark fin. As I looked around frantically, the sun went behind another cloud, removing the glare. And I swear, about ten feet away from me was a dark shadow twice my size. I froze, as it disappeared out of sight again. I did a 360 and couldn't see it anywhere. The same level of fear took over me, where I decided to stop taking my time and start backstroking as fast as I could, like some sort of water strider insect. I had seen jaws at this point in my life, and every time my legs would kick together, a little V of wake would form on the water surface, looking almost exactly like the shark nose as it is surfacing the water and attacking people. Periodically, I would abandon swimming altogether and start screaming and kicking my legs viciously in front of me in the hopes that I'd get its nose. I wasn't even sure if it was around me anymore, in hindsight. But at that very moment, that shark was going to bite my balls off any second. My heel brushed something again, and again. I was scraping bottom. The water level was now down to my knees. I stood up and sprinted as fast as I could to shore. I kissed the sand as I got out of the water. My parents began scolding me about going out that far, telling me about riptides, etc. Great, now they tell me, I thought. I was shivering, shaking, utterly exhausted, and so emotionally and mentally rattled, I just disassociated and said nothing as they gave me crap. I did not tell my parents or my brother about any of this. My brother could be a huge jerk, and I almost knew for a fact that none of them would really believe me. I could hear them already. There's no sharks in these waters. <laughs> it must have been seaweed. My brother making chicken gestures at me. I saved myself the trouble. I just said nothing, ate my lunch, drank some juice, and decided to go back to the cottage after. Sharks rarely attack humans. If they did, people wouldn't go swimming. Beaches in Florida would be a bloodbath of slaughtered surfers. It's even more rare to find big sharks in Prince Edward Island. That isn't a lie. 
My parents reassured me repeatedly on the road trip down and after getting to the cottage that you will never find a shark in the Maritimes because the water is just too cold. Any sharks you see will be super small and restricted to the gulf and very shallow bays. As we were driving to another beach days later, the radio DJ gave a shout out to the largest white shark ever recorded. It was a female just over six meters long, caught in the Gulf of St. Lawrence off the coast of Prince Edward Island. I decided to stay dry and catch some sun that day. I have been working for an independent hotel for just over four years now. We are the number one rated hotel in our city, and proud of it. I mostly work in housekeeping, but I've done some time at the front desk as well. I love my job, and have always said that my bosses are great. Now, being a housekeeper, I have seen some things. I have seen a room where someone snuck in their dog, kitten, and chicken, we don't allow pets. I once had a room that I was cleaning as a stayover that had tripods set up around the bed, professional camera equipment cases, an adult-sized pacifier, on-site, and XL-sized children's diapers. The two people that were in that room were in their early 20s. I even had a room once that we had to call the cops on for a raid because we found drugs. They found a lot of drugs and weapons in that room. Today is the first time I have ever actually felt scared to be in a guest's room. As I'm working on a room that's already been vacated, a man in the next room over catches me at my supply cart. He is set to be staying for several days and tells me, You can go ahead and clean my room now. I'm going down for breakfast. Excellent. I love getting my stayovers done early on. It makes things easier for the people working laundry the sooner we get the dirty laundry down to them. So, I pop over into his room, opening it up and propping the door open with a stopper, like we always do. The first thing I notice is that he has around 20 prescription bottles lined up on one of the two beds, along with insulin and needles. I'm nosy, I'll admit it, and I wanted to see what he was on. Oddly, it was only two different types of medication for all 20 bottles. About two-thirds were a diabetes medication, and the rest were a cholesterol medication. That's a little weird that he has so many bottles of the same meds, but whatever. I go to make the bed and see that some of the bedding has been stained, and I sigh, knowing now that I'll have to change all the bedding instead of just being able to turn down the sheets and blanket. So, I leave the room closing it behind me to get the linens I need, and then head right back to the room. I prop the door open again, and head to set the clean linens on the desk chair. When I see out of the corner of my eye, two notes sitting on the TV armoire. It wouldn't mean anything, except I caught the word, kill, scrawled on it. I dropped the linens and took a closer look. What I read on the first note made my blood run cold. You don't have to forgive her. You just can't kill her. You are here to take money and alcohol away from you. Get over having to kill her and you can safely leave. My heart was pounding. My eyes went to the second note, which had just looked like a to-do list at first glance, but in the end made my stomach churn. Spray and wash. Apply for Medicare. Insubordination. The soul is healed by being with children. Bank card follow up. Inheritance. Savings. Kawaii Pop 10,500. Map Montana. There will be a day of reckoning. Did you tell mom what I said? How did Bev get my address? It was too much. I quickly snapped pictures of them on my phone so I could show my boss why I would not clean his room. I left the room quickly, closing it up behind me. As the door closes, I turn, and I see the man just ten feet away from me, coming back to his room. 
My heart is in my throat, but I manage a smile and tell him, I need more supplies. I'll be back to your room in a bit. I take off straight for the elevator, having noticed our maintenance man waiting for the slow transport. In a hushed tone, I tell him what I found, and he sees I am shaken. Not a normal state for me. He rides down with me, and I go straight to my boss and tell her that for the first time in all these years, I am not comfortable being in a guest room. I show her the pictures, and her face is still and pale. She goes to the front desk and asks our general manager for a minute of her time, and brings her into the office to show her. She agreed this was not a safe situation, and took our maintenance man with her to go inform the man that he had one hour to get his belongings and leave the hotel, and he was not welcome back. I spent a few minutes in the laundry room, trying to calm down, then my boss went back up with me to the floor until the man was officially out of the hotel. This happened in late October of last year in Ottawa, Ontario. I was visiting my old city to see my parents which is always a strenuous endeavor. So I generally try to be in their house as little as possible when I'm over. To kill some boredom one night, I decided to go for a jog around the neighborhood I grew up in, around 10.30 p.m. I was really pushing myself as I quit drinking and was desperately trying to burn off the excess belly fat from being drunk and lazy during lockdown. I ran basically a huge circuit around the neighborhood, taking me through three parks, the third park I had to run through has no street lights. It has one right in the middle, but Ottawa has a thing where random lights shut off and this alternates across the city's power grid to save money and electricity. Nine times out of ten, it isn't shining. Now, this park is extremely dark, especially on a quiet October night with clear skies and dry ground. The road leading into it is well illuminated. This is a quaint, quiet, peaceful suburb. There has been some sketchy stuff that has happened in this little suburb, though. For example, just a six-minute walk from my parents' house was one of the biggest drug busts our city has ever seen. Some gang with automatic illegal weapons, the whole shebang. There were also a couple of stabbings in other areas but very spaced apart and generally resolved by the law immediately. All in all, it's a very quaint, safe, and clean place to raise a family. If I ever have kids or retire, Kanata would be an ample place to do it. I have never once felt unsafe, especially in the neighborhood my parents lived in, as it's full of some very nice houses. Through the darkness, I entered the park and passed through the first part of it, which is a play structure meant for little kids. Pretty much just a wooden mini house that's next to a bouncy spring. This leads to a bigger part of the park with a basketball court, jungle gym, and a much larger play structure with a big green triceratops made of plastic in the sandbox. All this eventually leads to a path that runs behind my old elementary school. At the end of this path is my street. I almost finished my run, running through the dark, spooky park, as I have passed through hundreds of times before. Now, I got into the habit of falling asleep to creepy stories and have been watching a lot of horror movies lately. As I'm breaking into the blackness from the adjacent street, leading into the park, I am on the fence about taking a break and walking, but I remember I was trying to push myself. I carry on as I think, jokingly to myself. Gee, I sure hope nothing spooky happens. But as I am rounding the corner to the other half of the park, I heard a distant scraping sound. I noticed a light from somebody's cell phone shining in the sandbox. As I ran closer, I heard this scraping getting louder. I got even closer, and I noticed through the moonlight that it is a man holding one of those hard rakes with the sharp tines grooming the sandbox. Now, some internal intuition told me that I know this is super weird, 
Why is there some guy grooming the sandbox at almost 11 p.m. with a flashlight? As I approach further, however, I notice it isn't just a man holding a sharp rake. It's a man wearing an all-black sweatsuit with the hood up and a white hospital mask. He is standing underneath the play structure, using the tines of the rake to push a pink horse with wheels on it back and forth, and so on and so forth. He heard the stride of my footsteps approaching, and his head jerked upright in my direction. He quickly moved out from underneath the play structure and shined the light on me, right into my eyes. This is really weird. I thought to myself as I flashed him an utterly exhausted, awkward wave. I have asthma, and my quads and lungs are giving out. I try super hard to up the pace, because I am fairly creeped out at this point. In a flash, he kills his light, and I cannot see a single thing anymore. My heart jumps into my throat, and I am very tuckered out at this point, ready to collapse. I heard a soft shuffling in the sand as I passed him, followed by rapid footsteps in between my strides getting closer and louder. Instantaneously it clicks that this guy is charging me with the rake. It's crazy what fear and adrenaline can do, cause I went from zero to a hundred real quick, sprinting faster than I would be able to normally. My whole body is burning, especially my lungs as I cleared the park onto the well-lit path. I was moving so fast and panting so loud, I couldn't even tell if he was following me or not. I didn't look back. I cleared the end of the path and saw some guy getting out of his car. With him as my witness, I turned around, panting myself to death and wheezing. He was gone. I walked back to my street and went into my house, hacking up disgusting amounts of phlegm absolutely drenched in sweat. I avoided telling my parents this story at first, just to avoid their reaction, but everyone else in my life knew pretty quick. I don't care for police, so calling them wasn't even something that crossed my mind. Later, when I reconnected with an old friend, one who never left Ottawa, she informed me that my old elementary school converts to a homeless shelter at night. They set up cots in the gymnasium and kicked them out at 6 a.m. Her reaction was to rationalize that it was probably a mentally ill, homeless person who was bored and couldn't sleep. But what if he had a different intention? Was he waiting for a jogger to pass by? Was he trying to scare people just for the fun of it? Or was he really in a violent mood? I guess I will never know. I work in the garden area of a home improvement store. I don't work the cash registers and my manager doesn't even let me water the flowers, so a lot of the time I have nothing to do. This results in me taking extremely long bathroom breaks where I just scroll on my phone. I know it sounds bad, but it's better than standing around trying to look busy. Today was the same as any other with me wasting time in the bathroom. Nothing of interest happened until my work phone buzzed at the same time as the stall next to mine. A few seconds later, I see that the guy in the next stall had his hand stretched to the ground with his palm facing up. I at first thought he had run out of toilet paper and was asking for mine. He just stayed silent for a while, so I ignored him after that. Then he started moving that hand uncomfortably close to my leg so I immediately scooted away and prepared to leave. Once the man noticed that, he hurriedly got out of his stall before I could leave. Another few seconds of silence. I took a peek out from the gap of the stall door to see what he was doing, and just like a scene from a horror movie, our eyes connected. He was barely an inch away from my door, trying to peek inside. My blood ran cold. If you're wondering why I didn't immediately open the door and cuss the guy out, I really hate confrontation. I avoid it whenever possible, and I do my best to not draw attention to myself. 
I stood sideways by the door so he wouldn't be able to see me. That's when the whispering started. I don't know what the first thing he said was, but it sounded like moaning. The next part was a bit more audible. He said something along the lines of wanting to see more of my unflushed toilet paper. I was thoroughly disgusted. This guy was a complete creep, and I was alone in the bathroom with him. My heart was beating faster by the second. I knew I had to stay there until another person came into the bathroom. No way was I going to confront him alone. Probably a minute later, someone finally arrives, and I take this as my chance to wash my hands and get out of there. Thankfully, the presence of the other person made the man quit his creepy behavior. As I was about to leave, he blocked my path for a quick second before stepping aside. The weird thing was, I don't even think he works at the store, because he wasn't wearing any vest. My store is extremely lenient about uniform, but most workers at least wear a vest or something connected to the store. He just looked like a regular customer. I am certain I heard two phone dings echo in that bathroom. The phones have a signature ring to them, so it couldn't have been a coincidence. Either way, he only started creeping on me once the phone ring made it clear that I was an employee. The situation really creeped me out, and I have been totally unfocused on my work since then. I kept prowling the garden area, looking for any man wearing a similar outfit to the creeper. I have an incredibly hard time distinguishing faces, so I probably wouldn't even recognize him if I did see him again. When this particular experience occurred, it was July of 1982, and I had just turned 13. As part of my birthday celebration, my parents took me and several of my friends to see Conan the Barbarian at the new walk-in theater in Liberty. This was quite a change from watching a movie from the bed of a truck at the drive-in. Instead of fighting mosquitoes big enough to completely exsanguinate us and trying to be still enough so the big aluminum speaker didn't fall off the side rail of the truck bed, we were able to sit, in air conditioning no less, and enjoy our popcorn and sodas without welts and blood spatters. For several weeks after that, we all made swords out of anything we could find and beat, slashed, hacked, and stabbed the crap out of anything we thought was worthy of being a foe. Mostly, this resulted in a bunch of decapitated weeds and flowers, and a few slaughtered spiders. One of my friends got his father's machete, and we spent a happy afternoon seeing which of us could chop a sapling tree down in a single hack. We almost had a fist fight over who got to use it to kill a little snake we found. It disappeared before we had a chance. Conan was the hero of the day for that summer, right up until we saw First Blood just after Halloween. One day, we decided that we needed to build our own Temple of Set, which was Fulsa Doom's cavernous fortress from the Conan movie. We didn't have a Princess Valeria to rescue, but we thought it would be cool to at least have a cave to stealthily invade. We had visions of tunnels and caverns and underground rooms filled with treasure to steal. After much arguing and discussion, we finally decided that the best location for our imaginary massacre would be at the bottom of one of the steep banks of the river by a sandbar. The following weekend, we all went to the riverbank with our various instruments of destruction. We had a regular shovel, two sharpshooter shovels, a hatchet, and a pickaxe. The area that we chose was at a bend in the river that was about a 10-minute walk from the road. The level of the river was low, and it left a great expanse of sandy shoreline in the bend where the sediments had built up into a sandbar that was high and dry when the river level was low. Over the years, the river had cut into the earth, leaving high banks at this particular bend that were maybe 12 or 15 feet above us. It was already undercut to an extent, and we had to clean out the trash and beer cans from previous visitors before we could start working. We spent the following week digging into the side of the bank. We dug a hole about 10 feet deep and then began making our cavern. It was more work than we anticipated, so it was a lot slower than we wanted. 
We usually worked in 10 or 15 minute bursts, and then we would work on a squared off berm with the dirt we had excavated to hide the entrance. Before we finally got bored with the whole idea of multiple tunnels and caverns, we had dug a tunnel about 3 feet in diameter and 10 feet deep into the bank of the river. At the end of the tunnel we had dug out an area that was more of a small room than it was a cave. We made the floor as level as we could in an area that was about 10 feet on each side. The top of the ceiling was probably 8 feet from the floor. We finally stopped at that height because we ran into roots from the trees on the top of the bank and we were tired of trying to expand it because we kept getting dirt and grit into our eyes and mouths. We thought the end result was awesome. We dug little alcoves into the walls and put candles in them to provide lighting. It went from our own version of the Temple of Set to a little clubhouse. It was really cool inside there when the weather was hot outside. It was even better when the candles lit up the area in a horror movie type of light, and you looked up. You could see the roots hanging down. We were all pretty proud of our accomplishment. We built the berm at the tunnel entrance up to about six feet high and made the outside look like it followed the natural slope of the sandbar. The end result was that if you were to walk along the shoreline and weren't actually looking for it, you would more than likely have walked past it without even noticing this became our home away from home, and provided us with hour upon hour of fun and entertainment. We even camped out there a few times that summer. One weekend, we found that our little hidey hole had been used by someone else. When we crawled into our cave, we found several beer cans and a blanket, and a pair of socks. Evidently, some of the older teens in the area were using it too. We spent that day discussing booby traps and other means of discouraging the invaders from using our cave, but we finally decided that if we did anything to protect our cave, it would probably result in someone destroying it. Over the next few weeks, we found more beer cans, cigarette butts, a crushed pack of camels that was empty, a styrofoam cooler without the lid, a frisbee, and a keychain with three or four keys on it. We put the styrofoam cooler upside down in the middle of the cave and left the keys sitting on it. The next time we returned, the keys had been replaced with a Budweiser that we all took turns sampling and a new box of candles. We had a lot of adventures in the cave that summer. We were Conan in the temple, we were Rambo in the mines, and it was the Castle of the Crystal from The Dark Crystal. Then, one day, we all met at the cave to find that part of the ceiling had collapsed. An area about the size of a big tractor tire had fallen, leaving even more roots showing. We got an old galvanized tub that was about the size of a turkey pan, and tied a piece of clothesline we had liberated to each handle, one leading inside the cave, and one to the outside. Me and Jerry would pull the tub out and empty it after Terry and Bobby filled it inside the cave. After it was empty, they would pull it back inside and fill it again. We were about halfway finished when we heard the laughter. At first, we thought it was whoever was using our cave when we weren't. We were a little excited to see who it was, but then we heard the voices that went with the laughter. It was Bubba Hain and his brother, Henry, and a couple of their friends. They were the bullies of our area. They were notorious for being the local toughs. They all walked around with their elbows cocked back and their chests puffed out. They all smoked and talked with language that would have caused me to get beaten half to death and my mouth washed out with dish detergent if I had ever been caught using it myself. Bubba was 19 or 20 and had been in jail several times. He was mean and quick to fight and it didn't matter if you were half his size. He terrified all of us younger kids. We debated crawling into the cave and keeping quiet until they passed us by, but if they knew about the cave, then we'd only be caught without anywhere to run. So we took off running in the opposite direction of the voices. We climbed up the bank around the bend and circled back to watch from the top of the bank, where we were safe and able to run if necessary. As we watched from our elevated vantage point, they came around the bend. Bubba and Henry were pulling a small aluminum boat through the water 
with a rope tied to the loop in the front. The boat had an ice chest and several flathead catfish laying in it among empty beer cans, and they were talking about finding more fish. Evidently, they were planning to have a big fish fry. Walking along in the front of them were Gerald and Ricky, also known for being less than friendly. They were both walking in the water about chest deep along the far side of the riverbank. They were all wearing cut-off shorts and drinking beer. Ricky would stop occasionally and feel the wall of the bank under the water. As we watched, he disappeared under the sandy water for several seconds and then surfaced again and said, Nothing. And they continued walking. They were talking about which girls would be at the event and who they hoped would come and who they'd like to hook up with. They were noodling for fish. Noodling is one of those activities that can be both exciting and dangerous. The way it works is you look for where a catfish or natural erosion has made a hole in the bottom of the riverbed, usually on one side or the other, as the current isn't as strong there. The person doing the noodling will stick his hand into the hole and feel around for a fish. If a catfish is there, it will think the hand is a smaller fish, and therefore food, and try to eat it. When the catfish has your hand in its mouth, You grab it by the lower jaw or through the gills and pull it out. Obviously, any catfish with a mouth big enough to engulf your hand is a good-sized fish, ranging in size from 20 to 60 pounds, on average. The problem with doing this is that occasionally, you can get a fish that is actually too big to easily extract and doesn't want to let its lunch get away. It is then a fight to retrieve your hand and get your head back above the water before you drown. While they don't actually have teeth, catfish have millions of tiny little spikes on their lips that can scratch you up pretty good. Another danger is that you encounter something other than a catfish, like a snapping turtle. If this happens, it is entirely possible to lose a finger. I am not too proud to admit that I am too chicken to go noodling. As we watched, Ricky went under the water again. After what seemed like two or three minutes, his hand suddenly shot up from the water and waved back and forth. Gerald immediately went under to help him, and they came back up a minute later, sputtering and gasping for air. They had caught a big one, about four feet long. Henry and Bubba pulled the boat over to them, and they all wrestled the fish into the boat with the others. They congratulated each other and toasted their fortune with a fresh beer. After a few swigs, they continued on their way. Eventually, they were out of sight, heading toward the more populated areas of the bottom where they lived. We didn't think they would be coming back, so we jumped back down and continued our work. Bobby realized that they had walked right by our cave and didn't even notice. That was just fine with the rest of us. About five minutes after we had started working on the fallen dirt again, we heard screams and shouts from the direction where Bubba and his friends had gone. They were sounds of fright. We forgot about getting pounded on and ran around the sandbar to the direction of the screams. When we saw Bubba and his friends, they were on the opposite side of the river than before, and the boat was floating downstream toward us. Terry caught the line as it passed, but he wasn't strong enough to stop it, so Jerry and I grabbed on too, while Bobby waded into the water and pushed it from behind. We all figured that our helping gesture would make us immune from any bullying for at least a little while. As we walked the boat back to them, Gerald was actually getting sick in the sand, and Ricky was retching. Bubba and Henry were both white as a bedsheet and were walking back and forth, hugging their arms in tight against their chests, as if they were freezing. They saw us coming to them and immediately went into the tough guy mode with their chest puffed out and elbows cocked. For a minute, I thought we had made a mistake in thinking they'd appreciate our assistance. Henry was the first to realize what we were doing and shouted an enthusiastic thanks and jogged in our direction. He helped drag the boat up to Bubba and the others. We were all apprehensive and ready to take off running, but no one seemed interested in being a bully. I looked to see who got hurt, 
but everyone seemed to have all their fingers and toes, and there wasn't any blood anywhere. So I asked what happened. Bubba glanced out across the river to the other side, about 60 feet away, but didn't say anything. Henry finally said that they thought they saw a dead body. Gerald turned around wiping his mouth with the back of his hand and spit. They ain't no thinking to it. I had my hand around its damn ankle, he said. I reached into that hole and felt what I thought was a tail and pulled on it and came up with a damn sock and shoe. We all looked at the opposite bank of the river, searching intently for any signs of blood and gore, but couldn't see anything. When we asked where it was, Ricky told us that it was about five feet down at the bottom of the big catfish hole. We, we gotta call the police, Gerald stammered. He kept wiping his hand on his pants. He stooped and gathered a handful of sand and washed his hands with it. Bubba told him to call the police if he wanted, but that he didn't want any part of it. Then he looked at us and told us to forget he was there. He told us not to mention his name at all. Then he and Henry turned around and began walking upstream, toward where everyone lived. Gerald and Ricky looked back and forth at each other. Nobody knew what to do. Finally, Ricky told Gerald to wait and he'd go call the sheriff and ran off. We all stood there for a minute, half afraid to talk. We knew about Bubba and acted accordingly, but Gerald wasn't as well known to us. We all know who he was and had heard stories, but none of us had ever had any direct contact with him before this. Finally, Terry asked him how it happened and who had screamed. Gerald looked at him with big bulging eyes, still wiping his hands up and down his pants. I don't think he realized what he was doing. He stared for a minute like he was waiting to see if we were going to make fun of him, but we were all half scared of him and wouldn't have dared to poke fun at him anyway. After a minute, he told us. They were going to have a big fish fry later. They had been out noodling to get more fish so they'd be sure to have enough. They were planning to get just one more before they stopped. He looked at us and held his hands at shoulder level, palms facing inward, and shook them vigorously. Just one more, he said, shaking his hands so hard that water sprinkled on us from his wet hair. He told us that he had been walking along, feeling for holes in the riverbed with his feet, when he found the hole. He had gone under and felt around with his hand, when he felt what he thought was a tail. He said that he grabbed it really hard, ready for the fish to try and swim away, when he felt something oozing between his fingers. He told us that he braced his feet and pulled, and it just came up. As he told the story, he mimed all of his actions. He told us that just as it was getting close enough to the surface of the water for him to see how big it was, that he noticed it was white instead of the dark gray color. Then he saw the sock and shoe. That was when Ricky saw it and yelled. Ricky's sudden yell startled Gerald, who thought the leg was alive. They both ran to the boat and told Bubba and Henry what they had seen. Bubba didn't believe him, so he and Henry waded over to the hole and found the body. In their rush to get away from it, they lost the boat. After a minute, we came around the bend, bringing the boat with us. Ricky came back in a few minutes and announced that the sheriff was on his way. They hurriedly removed the ice chest and empty cans from the boat, and Ricky took everything away. After another few minutes, he came walking back with two uniformed men. The sheriff listened as the story was told again. He took everyone's name and address and phone number. He went back to his car while the deputy was asking Gerald and Ricky more questions. Was the body a male or female? Was the body white or black? Was it an adult or a child? Are you sure it was human and not animal? After what seemed like 10 hours to us kids, but was probably less than an hour, the sheriff appeared again. He was walking with four other men who were all wearing wetsuits and had scuba gear. Two of the men started taking a bunch of photos and plotted the area on a map 
and took more photos from the bank above the hole and from where we were standing, and from the opposite bank on our side of the river. As the two men took the photos, the other two went underwater and confirmed that it was indeed a human body. Two of the men went back to wherever they had parked and returned with a table and another camera. As they returned, the sheriff told us that we should probably leave the area and stared at us until we took the hint and left. We ran back toward our cave and climbed the bank again, this time circling the opposite direction and sneaking to the edge of the bank, overlooking the scene of the excitement. The scuba divers used the second camera to take more photos underwater. They couldn't have been very good photos because the water was only neck deep and they completely disappeared in the murky water. After they finished taking photos, they brought the table out to the edge of the water. The table was actually a large float that two of the men held in place while the other two went underwater again. I don't know exactly what I was expecting to see, but this thing they brought up out of the river actually gave me bad dreams for a few weeks afterwards. It was evidently a man. His face was swollen, and his eyes and ears were gone. His belly was huge. He was wearing blue shorts and only had one sock and shoe. The thing that got me the most was his color. Gerald had said he was white, but he was actually a dull gray color with darker gray and green mottled spots, and he looked slimy. Two of his fingers were just bone. His mouth was open, and as they rolled him over onto the float, a bunch of nasty water flowed out. As I watched them walk the float back over to our side of the river, I noticed more and more details. The skin covering his elbows and knees was gone. The part that I thought was sock was actually skin. Evidently, when Gerald grabbed the leg and pulled on it, he had separated the skin and it just slid down the ankle. The part that I remembered most, the part that made me have bad dreams, was his head. No eyes, no ears, his mouth opened and full of who knows what. His facial skin was swollen to an almost comical size, but the skin around the tip of his chin was gone, showing bone. From watching television and reading books, I had expected the body to be locked stiff with rigor mortis, but it wasn't. His arms and legs actually flopped around as though the bones had turned to rubber. The last thing I remember about the man's body was the sight I saw as they carried him off toward the houses. The bottom of the foot without a shoe wasn't wrinkled, and it was snow white. This was the first time I had ever seen an actual dead person. Of course I had seen countless dead people on television and in the movies, but never in real life. I don't know if that was the reason for the bad dreams, or if it was because of the condition of the body. It was probably a combination of the two. I never knew who he was or how he died. I asked my mother a few days later, and after yelling at me for being down at the river, she said that she had only heard about the police finding a body. We went to the little cave a week or so later to see if there was anything new left in it, but it had completely collapsed, leaving a huge divot on the top. One of the trees on top was still standing, but at a drunken angle. It had rained, and that was evidently enough to collapse the cave in on itself. None of us cared, though. The gruesome discovery had killed the magic of the place for us. The following summer, that whole side of the bank was gone, including the tree. When I was about nine years old, my family used to live in a remote area on the outskirts of town. Considering the location of the suburb, that area was surrounded by warehouses and such. At the time, my family did not have a phone in the house and neither did our neighbors. There were no cell phones back then, or they were a luxury and not everyone could afford one. This took place in the end of the 90s. 
So, if I needed to call my mom whilst she was at work, I had to either go to my dad's work or a company next to his, which was closer, to make a phone call. My dad's work was a relatively short walk from our house, probably 30 minutes or less. My dad was working at a huge unloading dock for metallurgical, natural resources shipments. In order to get to my dad's work, I had to walk past another adjacent company, just like the one where my dad was working. I will call it Docks 2. My dad's work, as well as Docks 2, had a sort of watchtower. It is just a cabin mounted at the top of a tall platform, and you need to go up a decent amount of stairs to get to the top. There was always a guard inside overseeing the whole yard from the top, during the day and night, to make sure no one is in danger, and no break-ins. The phones were located only on site watchtowers at the time. Docks too were much closer to our house, about a 10 minute walk. One day, as I have done many times before, I went to Docks 2 to make a call. I climbed the stairs, knocked on the door, and was welcomed in by a guard I used to see quite often, and knew well. However, that day he wasn't alone. The new guy, who was 28 at the time, was there. Apparently, he was a new employee hired to work shifts. He was this very tanned man, always wearing military-style outfits. I was just an average-looking child looking exactly my age. My hair was very blonde, which made my cheeks always appear rosy red and give me even more of a childish appearance. When the new guy saw me that day, he would not take his eyes off me. As soon as I was about to finish my call with my mom, the new guy went outside to smoke. When I came out, he smiled at me and asked me what my name is and whether I came there often to make calls. I don't remember what I said, but I felt very shy because he was staring deeply into my eyes. I will call him the creep. Fast forward a few days and I came to that tower again to make a call. And there he was again, but that time he was alone. I spoke to my mom and as I was about to leave, he asked me if I want any tea, to which I refused. He then proceeded to ask how my school was going and things like that. He offered to help me with my homework, however I told him I have got it all sorted. Harmless, but strange. On a side note, I just want to say that what gave me shivers when I was near him is whenever he looked at me, he looked drunk, which was very unsettling. Mind you, he wasn't actually drunk, but his eyes would get so hazy and his face flush red. Sometime later I saw him again. That time I was walking to my dad's work with my friend, and he was doing some digging in docks too. When he saw me through the metal fence that was separating us, he just leaned against his shovel and stared at me. He didn't say hi or anything. After those encounters, for quite some time I took alternative routes to see my dad, or play with puppies at my dad's work, or make calls to my mom because he really creeped me out. However, one day I had to call my mom urgently. My dad's work phone didn't work, so I had to go to Doc's 2 Tower, hoping I wouldn't see him. The creep was there, and oh boy was he so happy I came. He was complaining how I don't come anymore to see him. As I was making a call, he grabbed another chair and sat right next to me, very close. It took a while for my mom to get on the phone because she was busy with something and someone went to get her whilst I was on the line. It felt like hours waiting and the creep was just seated next to me, looking at me and smiling. When my mom finally got to the phone, he got up and went to make me tea and brought some biscuits. When I was done talking, he insisted I have some tea with him, which I didn't and he just kept on trying to strike a conversation, but this time the tone of conversation was different. He asked me how old exactly I was, and I told him 12. I have no idea why I lied. He told me his age, and although I knew he was much older, I felt really weirded out that he wanted to talk to me so badly 
or had any interest in me. My alarms did go off every time I was around him, but I guess I didn't feel overly in danger. He then proceeded to tell me that I was beautiful and asked me whether I had a boyfriend. He asked me if I have already dated boys and what type of boys I liked. I was so uncomfortable and so eager to leave at that point, but he would just keep dragging me into these weird conversations. I could tell he was drinking that day. When I began moving towards the door, he followed me. Eventually, we both were outside. However, in order to get down from the tower, you need to walk this narrow path towards the stairs. He stood blocking it so I couldn't leave. He got very close to me, and I was freaking out. The only escape tactic I could come up with as a child was to pretend that I'm seeing someone from the top of the tower. So I began waving my hand at the road down at the bottom and towards houses in the distance, pretending I see someone I know and saying, Oh look, that's my uncle, he's waving. The creep looked in that direction, but either didn't care or could tell that I was lying. I kept on telling him that the uncle who waved back is a very big, angry man. And if I don't come down this instance and go home, we both are going to be in trouble. The creep didn't budge. He got even closer and eventually pressed me against the railing. He kept on asking me his weird questions whilst I was terrified to move because I didn't want to move my body against his, if that makes any sense. So I just froze. He asked me if I would go on a date with him and that he is looking for a girlfriend. And at that particular moment, someone was coming up the stairs to the tower, so he let me go, but asked me to come back. I have not told anyone about this encounter at that stage, because I was afraid that my parents would get angry. I also felt very embarrassed and thought that people would judge me for what's happened. Sometime later I was home, and it was around 9pm. I know what time it was because it was my bedtime. Suddenly, a car pulled into our driveway. I came to see who it was through the front room window, and I could see it was the creep, but this time with other guys, blasting music in his car and shouting my name. I have no idea how he knew where I lived. He must have followed me one day. My dad was outraged. He asked me who these people were, but before I could even answer, he rushed outside. Apparently, the creep wanted me to go out with him and his friends. My dad obviously refused, saying that I am a child and too young to hang out with them or go out at this time of night, and that if he sees any one of them ever again, he will beat the living heck out of them. So, they drove away. I was so upset with my dad that he called me a child in front of them. I think because we lived so far away from everything, I was really keen to make friends as there were no kids around as such. For a while after that, I had not seen the creep again, or heard of him. A significant time later, I was walking to my dad's work again, and I have completely forgotten about this creep. He was working in docks too with his friends, maybe those that came with him that night in the car, or maybe these were just his co-workers. I got scared when I saw him, and even though he shouted hi to me, I pretended to not hear it. He said something to his friends, and I remember so clearly how one of his friends exclaimed loudly, Her? I guess he told them about me, or his interest in me, but no one expected me to be a child. I looked at the guy that exclaimed. He was staring at me in utter disbelief. He must have been 20 to 25 or so, I think. And the creep was saying something to him. His friend screamed at him. Have you lost your mind? Clearly, the creep didn't see me as a child like everyone else did. Fast forward again, maybe half a year later. One day I was home alone in the evening, waiting for my parents to come back from work. We lived in a very safe community, so sometimes I'd be home by myself for a little bit after school until my parents got home. I was playing a game whereby I was a singer. I had this stage created in the living room, and I was performing in front of the chairs, 
Pretending chairs were my live audience. It was pitch black outside. At some point during my performance, I see someone staring at me through the living room window. That person must have been crouching down as only the top of their face could be seen from the bottom. As soon as that person realized I saw them, they ran. I was so embarrassed that someone saw me performing, scared and shocked at the same time, that I was glued to the floor. I don't know if that was him. Our dog didn't react at all, maybe because the music was playing very loud. I was scared to go outside the house and check, but I peered through the window, and no one was there. That person had to climb over a wooden fence to get to our living room window. I told my parents about it. I have also asked my friend whether it was him who came around, but he said it wasn't. I don't know if my friend felt shy to admit he was watching me, or whether it was the creep. In closing, one day I went to Doc's 2 with my dad, as my dad needed something from there for work. I saw the old guard that I knew well, and asked about the creep, and was told that he doesn't work there anymore. I don't know whatever became of him. Part 1 I live in Casper, Wyoming, and have my entire life. Every weekend, I like to hike after a long week of work. It's the one thing I feel connects me to the universe outside of my glorious job at Walmart. Two years strong. Hold the applause. I had had a fairly awful Friday getting reamed out by my manager and needed to get out to avoid losing it. Today, I had hiked up a ridge near Garden Creek to relax, and I decided to photograph the powerful side of the sun, sinking red on the horizon, when I lost my grip. I dropped my phone, trying to get the perfect angle, and it cascaded down the hopefully minimal damage 20-odd feet below. Cursing, I descended the rocks and located the sun's reflection on the screen and fetched it. And to my relief, it was fine, aside from a small ding. I then noticed a rusted square inset in the ground, about four square feet in size. I approached the metal plate and handle, just outside of the view from the beaten path, and realized this was a trap door that was intentionally discreet. I did what any guy with nothing particularly exciting going on in his life would do, and opened the hatch, revealing a set of rungs descending into blackness. I took a deep breath and gripped the metal bars, and began my descent. I first thought this was a fallout shelter as I held my LED flashlight strap in my teeth as I climbed down. There had been no label for what this led to, but someone could have easily stolen the sign at any point since post-apocalyptic came back in style. The echoes in the darkness were spread out, and I soon realized the chamber I was entering below was absolutely massive. Eventually, after 20 meters of descending that ladder, I was on the ground, and I shined the circular beam of the flashlight around in absolute amazement. This was a massive facility, seemingly unused for decades from the telltale orange, red, and brown pattern of the floor rug that shouted late 70s. The gaudy green desks confirmed this, on which sat TRS-80 Model 2 computers with their large floppy disk drives and coffee mugs with Cooper font and phrases like Disco is dead, and cassettes of Rush and other gems from around 40 years ago. It was a time warp, and I was ecstatic to have discovered the place, albeit a bit creeped out by the dark, cavernous space lit solely by the cold beam of my flashlight. There was paperwork stacked neatly in in and out trays, rotary phones, and even a few beanbag chairs near the wood paneled walls. I walked through the massive circular space noticing double doors on a wall, and continued through, my eyes wide in amazement. Past those doors was the longest hallway I had ever seen. I could just make out the end, the light of the LEDs barely able to penetrate the thick darkness. There appeared to be over a hundred tall, steel doors lining the walls of the corridor, 
each locked and containing a small slot for perhaps food and another to allow looking inward. A shiver climbed my spine as I stared at the heavy locks on the doors, and it was then that I caught the faint scent of decay. I raised the beam to the slit and peeked into the first chamber on the left, peering in as my neck hairs raised in fear at what I was seeing. A thin, naked man was standing there, facing away from the sliver of the window, unmoving. His skin looked almost glossy, reflecting the flashlight in an eerie glow. At first, I assumed him long dead, somehow frozen in place, but his hairless head twitched slightly, as if disturbed by the light, and I fell backwards in shock, covering my mouth with my hand. My mind raced to understand, but questions sprouted endlessly. I saw a slip of yellowed, brittle paper glued to the door that read, 01AR, and then noticed all of the doors were numbered as well. I peeked in another window and saw a long, empty chamber with what looked like a moving, oily substance slowly climbing the walls. I blinked in disbelief. It was like a living liquid moving against the push of gravity. I actually bit my hand to assure I wasn't dreaming, feeling pain swell in confirmation. I peeked through another window and shouted as a horrific spiral of teeth, similar to a lamprey's, slammed against the plexiglass slit. I stared in revulsion and disbelief. Whatever the thing in there was had to be over two feet in diameter, its dozens of sharp teeth twirling against the plexiglass. My mind began to spin, as I noticed one of the chambers further in looked to be missing a door, before realizing it was open. It was then I heard the slam echoing from the large chamber I had come from, from that entrance hatch. Something was coming down the ladder with the echoing clicks of the steel rungs. I ran down the hall, past ungodly nightmares locked behind steel doors. The beam of my flashlight illuminated horrible things in those window slits. Teeth, fangs, claws, stretched limbs and bubbling forms. Things that should not exist. Things that dug into the part of my brain that controls logic and rational thought with strong fingers, ripping it to shreds as I ran down that endless hall. The smell of death grew strong as I passed that one open doorway to a massive chamber filled with corpses in various states of decay. Some mummified, black and skeletal, others fresh and red. Some bloated and white with putrefaction, I coughed bile and finally came to another set of doors and burst through. There were flies, cabinets and lockers, giant reels of magnetic tape lined on the faux wood paneling on the walls. It seemed to be a sort of archive, and I saw a desk to hide under and dove beneath, clutching my knees. Whoever or whatever is now in that hall is getting closer, and I am praying I can hush my breathing when whatever is coming arrives. All I can do now is sit in the consuming blackness of this room and wait. Part 2 Staggered steps approached, each accompanied by a loud dragging sound. I sat under the desk in the enveloping darkness, breathing as slowly and quietly as my panicked body would allow. My clenched hands on my knees tightened, as the metal bang from the door bar being pushed forward rang out inside of the black room I hid in from that hall. The dragging sound approached in my direction, no longer accompanied by steps due to the carpeting. The sound grew closer and closer towards me, and I braced myself when a heavy slam rang out directly in front of me. A few seconds later the double doors clacked again, and I heard some footsteps in the hall. I sat on the carpeted floor of the chamber containing reels and cabinets, shivering in the complete darkness. Whatever had entered had either left discreetly, or was now directly in front of me, and just when I was deliberating crawling out or making a run for it, my phone vibrated and lit up. As I removed my phone to quickly silence it, the dim light of the screen illuminated the space under the desk and just outside of that chair gap the horrific face staring in at me. There were two bulging eyes under a massive, bloody hole, 
filled with teeth, and I was about to scream at the thing before realizing it was an upside-down human head. Something had dragged a man's corpse in here and slammed him down on the desk directly across from mine, on his back, so his head was hanging in my line of sight. I caught my breath, realizing whatever brought the body here was likely returning soon. I quickly stood and used my flashlight to grab a few handfuls of papers from random cabinets and desk drawers, and I used the small, circular beam to scan the room. There were eight track players and cassettes, Betamax players and tapes, reel-to-reel -reel tape loops and other storage devices that had existed in that era, nothing beyond. I sneaked slowly past desks and lockers, past the paintings of gray-haired men in polyester suits on the faux wood wall paneling, towards the goal I now stared at in slight relief, those two double doors on the opposite end of the room. The realization that there may be another exit brought the optimistic concept of escape back into my mind, and I made my way over in silent steps. I clenched my jaws as I opened the other set of doors as quietly as possible. Another hallway of roughly 100 doors stretched down in the dark length of the passage. It was as if the entire massive space was mirrored. This facility was absolutely gargantuan. I looked down the long hall with heavy steel doors, knowing that nightmarish things likely were inside of each of these chambers. I took a moment to shine my light on the papers I'd scavenged from the archives of the previous room, and I read, slack-jawed in both amazement and confusion. The papers I held seemed to be internal communications of whatever organization this had once been. I scanned over many references to thermal and ionizing radiation and experimentation seemingly to prevent lethal radiation poisoning. I flipped through more pages, reading about the threats, but nobody mentioned what the threat was except one page, where the threat was referred to more specifically by name, by the letters USSR. This massive facility was a relic from the Cold War. Only one document had a company title, name, or anything identifying on those green and white banded, perforated pages a little logo of three blocky letters under which was written, Anti-Radiation Kinetics. I stood in the dark hall, beam of light barely illuminating the space, intrigue leading me over to the mirrored first chamber on the left. Unable to stop myself, I lifted the light to the plexiglass slit and peered in. Inside was a thin, naked woman with wet skin. She was hairless and had a sheen like the man in the first cell I had looked into. My heart skipped a beat as I heard the metal doors push open in the previous room. Whatever had taken that corpse was heading towards my direction with the sound of the dragging body getting louder and closer. I removed my hiking boots to soften the sound of my steps, slinging them over my shoulder as I ran down that hallway in my thick socks, seeing glimpses of more horrific faces and forms Something gray and heavily veined with four large black orbs of spider eyes stared at me, twitching. Another door's window showed a thin figure with a hairless, wrinkled head that was one giant mouth similar to a canine's. The scent of death built as I realized this hall had another open cell. One I now was dreading to realize was a food storage unit for feeding the abominations in this forgotten place. I only knew I had no desire to meet who or what was feeding them. I passed that room, noticing human limbs hacked and piled away from the rotted dead, slowing slightly to observe a few lab coats before exiting quietly as possible to the doors at the end. I pushed. I pushed again. My heart spilled heavy pounding from my chest to my throat as I realized in absolute horror the doors were locked. I ran into the awful stench of the massive room stacked with bodies, realizing I was completely trapped. I scanned quickly and found a pile of pasty corpses, wet with decay, and jumped behind the bruised, bloody stack. I pressed my face hard into a hiking boot to filter the rancid stench that was beyond anything I could imagine. I turned my flashlight off, and this time my cell phone 
to await the footsteps and dragging over to the meat locker. I am now trapped inside. Part 3 The sound of meat and bone chopping filled my ears in that large, pitch-black chamber. Snapping, sawing, and splashing accompanied the smell of death as I lay hidden in silence. The footsteps came and went, delivering the cuts of meat to this wing of cells in the complete, consuming blackness. Whatever or whoever was feeding the aberrations in those rooms had either memorized every inch of this place, or could somehow see in the facility so entirely devoid of light. I waited, my stomach growling for what must have been a good few hours before there was a good ten minutes of silence. I breathed deeply, mustered my courage, and illuminated the grisly chamber with my flashlight. I walked on the floor, puddled red from the butchered bodies, disgusted at myself for realizing, despite the horrific odor of death, I had been breathing. I myself hadn't eaten in a very long time. I needed food and water soon, or I would lose my strength. Whatever was bringing fresh kills down here was back the other way, so I decided to check the pockets of the deceased. I rifled through jeans, camo pants, khakis, and shorts. There were dozens of bodies and plenty of wallets and keys. I headed out of the mess of butchery to the locked double doors, flashlight in my teeth, and boots strung over my shoulders, trying one key after another for what seemed like an eternity with absolutely no luck. Frustration spilled from a deepening well of despair until I finally felt a key under the door's lock fully and exhaled in relief as it turned. I shined the beam, amazed by the sight before me. Giant vats, large cylinders of compressed gases and glass containers were lined in dozens of rows that stretched out as far as a football field. Wide metallic tanks lined the walls reflecting the LED beam of my small flashlight in the cavernous space. They were large chambers, maybe six meters in diameter, each containing a door. There were scattered black splashes of ancient blood dried on the cement floors and tossed paperwork on the long desks, which divided rows of tanks that told a tale of chaos. I shined my narrow light beam to read the paperwork on the tables and floors and blinked in frozen shock at what I saw. There were countless tests of blood pressure, heart rate, and radiation level monitoring, as well as packets containing the names of couples, some of full families. I flipped through a packet labeled 10AR slash 11AR, corresponding with the labels on those locked doors, and it became clear. I read in disbelief as a promotional packet slid out, decorated with eggshell blue, orange, and brown squares in an illustration of a smiling family that was oh-so-70s, titled ARK, Anti-Radiation Kinetics and You. The informational packet blew my mind. This was a service for perhaps volunteers, but more likely paying families, to subjugate themselves to a battery of experiments for the purpose of living through an impending nuclear winter. There was a colored pencil illustration of a child with blonde pigtails in a pink bell dress hugging a cat with the caption, Sally's cat Tammy is her best friend. That's because Tammy has life-saving genes that can help Sally. I turned the pages in complete disbelief. Not only that this was actually conceived, but in some horrific manner possibly even achieved. I read on in amazement. A similar illustration showed an older man smoking a pipe, smiling, holding a test tube. The caption underneath read, Tom chose an entirely new protein our top scientists created to take him beyond immunity, possibly extending his life by decades. I thought of the seemingly living black fluid I saw in the other wing, I flipped through the illustrations of double helixes, diagrams, and paragraphs mentioning talents and DNA zippering, gene therapy and modification. The pamphlet ended, showing an illustration of a family smiling, sitting in metal tanks resembling those on the massive chamber's walls. It showed them exiting with a 60 star shine to show improvement on the next frame. 
It didn't show the things in those chambers. I scrambled through other notes and urgent memos, one describing rapid, uncontrollable, extreme, and seemingly random mutations. I looked at the memo's title reading, What Went Wrong? I gazed in awe at the massive facility, the ARK, the ARK Lab in all its horrific glory, ushering a lucky few to the future to repopulate the world upon the event that never happened at least not yet. I kept walking through, taking it all in. The small circle beam of my flashlight was barely able to reach the walls and those metal cylinders where couples and families began the nightmarish transformation into what now sat in those cells, feeding on human flesh. I kept walking, hunger kicking me as I saw a desk on which sat a bowl of ancient, hard candies. I ran over and ate the entire stale clump, nearly chipping a tooth, and then continued past desks of gyroscopes, blood centrifuges, monitoring equipment, and the likes. I froze upon hearing keys jingling, and a press of the metal bar, and I heard the door behind me open. I heard footsteps slap the floor in pursuit as I ran. I realized I had no idea where I was running to. I was stuck. I was about to die. I was about to end up on that pile in the other room. My brain screamed, run, and I ran. I made it to the other side of the giant room, to another door made of wood with a knob and chipped screw holes. My pursuer was nearly upon me as I tried the door, twisting the knob and pushing it open. I entered and slammed the door behind me, scrambling my hands on the brass knob and luckily finding a lock which I turned hastily. Pounding shook the door on which I leaned, low to the ground. I shined the light to find a nicely decorated lobby, quaint and ornamented with rounded furniture, with peg legs in the usually quirky colors of the 70s, far more sinister, lit by that single beam of my flashlight. I saw more pamphlets and plastic holders on the desk, and finally realized this was where their journey began greeted by a heavily hairsprayed receptionist. Most importantly, I saw the glowing orange ring on the elevator door's frame. The wooden door I entered from was clearly not going to hold what had discovered my presence for long, so I ran to the elevator, mashing the glowing button. I hadn't even considered the fact that this facility had power, but I realized this could have been my end had it not. I entered the dim, yellow light of the elevator, hearing music and a jiggling of keys from outside the door I had come from. Fuzzy, jazz flute-heavy elevator music played on speakers as my pursuer entered through the wooden lobby doors with wide eyes, reaching out to me with open hands. A normal-looking man, aside from his milky white eyes, perhaps in his mid-sixties, ran into the room screaming just as the doors began to close. I slammed the button and watched as the door shut in the nick of time. I breathed deeply and slid to the floor and sat to put my hiking boots back on, exhausted. I finally registered his muffled voice and what he was screaming. They are loose down there, from higher and farther away. The elevator was moving, not up, but down. Part 4 An instrumental version of a 70s song I vaguely recognized fuzzed from the speaker in the elevator as it descended. I stood on a handrail and tried to open the locked ceiling hatch I'd read only existed in older cars, shaking it and hitting the lock in vain. There was soon a muffled sniffling, then scratching from the hatch. Then the creak of metal bending, and a small black triangle began to appear from its corner. The triangle grew in size to reveal long, malformed teeth in the gap. Something powerful was prying the hatch open. I rushed to the front of the elevator car and pounded the open door button as sweat beaded my forehead. The music crackled before squealing with a deafening screech of feedback. The noise stopped that thing's act of ripping open the car like a sardine can, and it seemed to retreat. My palms squeezed over my ears and I slid to the floor until the sound stopped, 
and a staticky voice spoke to me over the dated speaker system. Listen, you are in very serious danger, the voice spoke. As I looked up to see long fingers like articulated drumsticks emerge from the shadow, I watched helplessly as they reached from the black opening and returned to prying the roof hatch open. I yelled for help, asking for the man to make the noise that seemed to repel the thing, but it was clear the speaker was merely that, a speaker. There was no phone or intercom device, just open, close, and the two floors. I was trying to figure out how to make a last-ditch makeshift weapon. The elevator stopped and the doors slid open. I looked out in utter confusion, trying to understand what I was looking at. There was a road separating two rows of housing that extended into the space under an eerie, domed ceiling that was painted and lit like a sky. More rows of housing units and streets continued to my right. It was like an overly exaggerated, nuclear family suburb with actual white picket fences and astroturf lawns. All of the small houses were Easter egg colors, throwback ranch homes from a different era. I walked out of the elevator, feeling the bounce of the black rubber street beneath my boots, and I hurried to the first house, peering in the windows. It was dimly lit, but appeared to be vacant, and I rushed in the door, which was unlocked. Twisting the lock as I heard the metal clang of that thing from the elevator roof landing on the floor of the car. I kept as silent as possible as the long, horrid shadow of the thing walked by the window to my side. My back was to the door, and I stared at the overlapping colored ovals of the wallpaper that opened to a small kitchen. I then noticed the mirror on the wall that revealed a view of outside the window behind me, and I finally saw that thing from the elevator. It was horrific tall and bony, with multiple rows of elongated human teeth spilling out over each other from a massive, gummy mouth under wide, white eyes. The nose was a small bump above two flaring black slits on the jagged-cheeked face. I realized that if I could see it, it could see me, and I stayed as still and silent as possible when a squeal rang out from the speaker system, scaring the thing that ran deeper into the development. The voice crackled on the speaker as the man spoke again. If you're alive, you need to listen closely if you want to stay that way. The man spoke. The area you are in was built to house our clients. In case the anti-radiation treatment went wrong, which it did, I'm the only one left maintaining this place. But I'm close to making it right again. I'm sure of it this time. He said. I realized he must be insane if he thought he could fix anything about this zoo of nightmares. I crept on the olive green shag carpet towards the kitchen as silently as possible. I was getting farther from the door, but could still hear him on the announcement speakers of the enormous fallout shelter. I looked out the kitchen window that was fixed to the massive outer chamber wall. It was like a cutout display that emulated depth with a layered set of photos of rolling hills and trees. I shook my head and reached down to open the kitchen drawers, removing a steak knife I found inside. Use the maintenance hatch labeled A13 just a bit forward to the left. You really shouldn't have unlocked that door, the voice said gravely. I gripped the knife and slowly walked to the window, looking out to the street, seeing some emaciated form climb out of a window of one of the houses. It walked on four pale branches of flesh limbs that twisted and curled like ram horns. Its skin was pocked with patches of sprouting bluish worms that waved slowly, resembling sea anemone. Its narrow head was inhuman and deformed, squeezed in odd places like a tide roast. The head contained one bulging eye and two quivering circular red orifices underneath. One pea-sized that widened as it sniffed the air, one larger and lined with small, sharp teeth. It walked in shaky, lurching movements, as if unaccustomed to its own body. I almost felt sorry for whoever that had once been, until I saw it heave and vomit a red splash of bones to the astroturf grass it stood on. It raised its head and choked up a deep bark of sorts, pacing in twitchy, awkward steps. 
feedback squealed from the speaker, sending it bounding out of view behind the houses to my right, before the man upstairs spoke again. I have been feeding them cadavers donated to science. I don't know what you saw, but you need to trust me, the voice said. Their body seems to crave only proteins they now lack in their current forms, he continued. I mostly believed him, but I have never crossed a bridge that was half completed. I slowly exited that first house on the left, observing the space, noting ladders mostly encased in cement tubes in the far end of the street, and one hatch on the left behind the houses near me in that faux suburban nightmare. The massive space was beyond surreal, magnifying my fear with its attempt to stimulate a pleasant town from the world above. A plastic, Disney-esque community filled with horrific monstrosities that ate human flesh, the earworm melody from the elevator looped in my head as I clenched the knife tight and quietly walked to the next house on the left. I looked in the window to see a bloated head smushing against the glass, fat as a large pumpkin whose flesh stretched so much that only pulpy red tissue was visible in the holes of a human face inflated by tumorous growth. It teetered back and forth, clearly unable to see, the body below giant and lumped with knobs of ropey varicose veins. I wasn't taking any chances going in there. It was alive, and therefore, clearly able, to eat. I continued to the third house on the left, nearly jumping out of my skin at some deep, rattled, animalistic yell that seemed to come from my right. I rushed into the house and shut the door quietly, gripping the knob tightly with fear as I looked out the window seeing no movement. I then heard a dragging sound from behind me that made the hairs on my neck stand on end. I turned to see the manic, smiling, pretty face on a bald human head sliding on the floor towards me. Her wide, staring eyes looked straight at me above a normal nose and a toothy mouth shivering in spasm. Its body dragging behind was a long tube of flesh lined with dozens of small, trudging legs resembling those of a human baby as it slowly emerged from the kitchen. I held out my knife and opened the door as quickly as possible. That thing's mouth stretched open as it charged at me, the skin on its face peeling back entirely from the mouth as a large muzzle of tooth-filled gums snapped forward. Like a goblin shark's attack, I barely slipped out the front door, but those lunging jaws banged against it too loudly. I saw peering eyes of varying size and distance from each other blink and swivel on cocked heads from the sides of the buildings, alerted by the sound. The nightmarish earworm from the elevator looped frantically in my head, and I remembered it now. ABBA's SOS, just as dozens of monstrous things emerged from shadows and came charging towards me. All I could do at this point was to run. Part 5 The screams alone were enough to drive me to the brink of madness as I sprinted down the rubber street of the hellish suburbia. Animal screams, some high and shrill, others rattling gravel yells, some hissing, popping, and even an eerie whooping that might have sounded funny in any scenario other than this. I ran from the hideous things beyond nightmares that scuttled, bounded and loped towards me from nearly every direction, even spilling out from the elevator doors. Dozens of them. Massive, bony jaws snapping. Fat tongues flopping and shiny wide eyes all fixed on my flesh. I saw the hatch labeled A-13, just feet ahead on the left between houses. I glanced at the small crack under the hatch, seeing shadows moving, and I ran past it, untrusting. I twisted the weight of my shoulder in the last second to ram a slender pale form that charged screaming towards me, clawing with dozens of stacked black talons that echoed all the way down the arm. Pain ignited my bicep as I headed towards the congealing splatter of remains at the end of the street. Above it was a concrete tube, which housed the steel rungs of a ladder. My feet slammed the rubber road as I sprinted, and as I ran, I felt my lower legs sliced and licked and stung by the pursuing horde right behind me. 
I ran towards the feeding tube until I was tripped by something shiny and black, the shape of a rhinoceros beetle's horn. I began to fall forward as everything slowed to a crawl. I aimed my other foot far left to compensate and miraculously didn't topple. Continuing to sprint to the encased ladder, which was painted to match the sky mural of the dome wall. Puddles of blood splashed as I ran, then jumped, gripping the slick steel rungs tightly to climb as fast as my body would allow. The ladder shaft stank horribly from decades of rot. I felt a deformed, wide hand yank me down violently, banging my jaw painfully down on a rung with a stunning blow. I yanked and freed my foot from the boot, and the thing let out a high, gurgling scream as it fell. I heard the falling bodies clang against the metal rungs from the tumbling creatures. I used the few seconds of breathing room to push the kitchen knife's blade all the way down between my foot and the inside of my boot. The blade now extended down from under the heel as a makeshift weapon just as the horde returned, angrier. I felt long fingers wrap around my calf and I stomped violently down, releasing a squeal from the elongated fanged face of that thing below. There were dozens of them, screaming things with too many black orbs of eyes and gnashing jaws. I jammed the blade into the silhouetted head with a downward stomp and climbed faster and higher into the darkness of the tube. Some of the rungs were slippery with blood, and climbing in the darkness became increasingly difficult. I finally reached the top hatch from which the man had been feeding them, and my beating heart sank down into my stomach. It was locked from the other side. The feedback squeal from the speakers blared, not from above, but just below me to the right, repelling the pursuing monstrosities a bit away from me once more, as the voice on the system continued. I'm so sorry. You know I can't let you leave knowing what you know. All our work would be completely destroyed for nothing. Followed by another feedback squeal as the speaker cut out. The slobbering, howling sounds of the horde below entered the ladder well once more, echoing demented screams through the narrow space as they closed in. I stepped down on a few rungs to the source of the speaker sound, and reached over in the blackness and felt a large sliding grate that seemed to be the source of the voice. There was one on my left as well, and neither had locks. I slid open the grate that led to the speaker's sound and turned on my pocket LED flashlight and placed it pointing inward towards the voice in that duct on the right. I realized the passage might lead to that blind madman on the speaker. I slid the left one open and climbed quickly inside, removing the steak knife from my boot and using it to lift up and close the sliding vent cover behind me. I crawled away slowly and silently in the darkness as I heard scuttling, then screams through the access ladder well that had been repurposed as a food hatch. I listened with a slight feeling of vengeance as that man's screams wailed through the blackness of the space, as those things devoured him, alive. Once I had traveled far enough that I felt confident the light would not be seen, I powered my cell phone on and used it to illuminate the metal passage that seemed to go on forever. I was utterly exhausted, and now finally out of immediate danger. My stomach growled with hunger. When the grate on the end of the ventilation shaft came into view, I exhaled heavily and crawled a bit faster. It was the same sliding kind of the others, and I listened intently. Phone screen off to make sure I wasn't seen. Content, I turned it back on, startled, by the large face in front of me, a massive painted portrait on the opposite wall. It was the familiar face of that man who had left me to die in that suburban shelter, far younger and smiling as he held the test tube, but clearly him. Wood paneling and a groovy rug of swirled hues of blue decorated the space, filled with lava lamps and stereo receivers, speakers and a turntable. His office looked more like a swinger's lounge than an office. I spotted the light switch, flicking it on to see the black light lit black velvet paintings of topless women. From the looks of it, his office had been untouched for the past 40 years. I did love that swanky carpet, but the rest was a bit tacky. I shuffled through the papers on his desk, 
reading a bit before switching off the lights and opening the one wooden door as quietly as possible. I heard saliva-filled, heavy breathing in the dim hallway that the door opened to. There was just one small guide light in the hall ahead. Glowing orange rings trailed down a hall of elevators. Hope flooded back into my heart as I saw the sign labeled, Ground Exit. Another hatch. All I had to do was get by that shadowy shape, scuttling low to the ground with far too many limbs. It was spider-like. Two sets of back legs and two sets of arms, elbows and knees pointed upward as it scampered about rapidly in the hull. The head shivered in twitching ticks that sent a chill up my spine. An open elevator shaft on the left seemed to answer my question of how it got in here. I was starving and headed back to quietly search the lab of Gabe Reverton, the name on the metal plate on his kidney-shaped desk. I rummaged through the drawers and shelves of some stashed rotten foods, finding the savior of a honey jar, which I once read doesn't spoil. I forced down the entire container, licking my fingers and scouring the shelves for more food, but finding none. I was going to need my strength if I was going to get past that rapidly moving thing that occupied the elevator bay. I scanned the room, noticing a standing flag of orange and brown hues with ARK written in a white wave of echoed outlines. I only then realized how much I was bleeding and ripped the ARK flag from the brass pole, slashing it with scissors from the desk to make bandages to wrap my stinging arm and legs. I stared back nervously at the trail leading to the duct and realized time could be short if those things followed my bloody trail. I picked up the brass flagpole, slapping the heavy metal against my hand, gauging its stopping power. I searched memos, emergency protocols in the in and out trays of papers on his desk, reading of elevator reprogramming procedures in case of lockdown, troublesome test results on recent mice and other glimpses into secret workings of ARC. There were Polaroid photos of small, horrifying things in small tanks, similar to those I had seen in larger form, still disturbing in miniature. I found a finances sheet and was amazed at the half million dollar cost of the most basic anti-radiation package offered, which grew after shelter property rental, ration packages, and water, power, and heating fees. This had been a multi-billion dollar facility with top scientists of the era, as well as clientele from around the world. I put together a dossier of the most fascinating papers, including the maps I had found that showed all of the services, client and employee access entrances and exits. A quick glancing over, and I realized I'd be in more risk trying to find another way out at this point. I shoved the paperwork in my pants against my back and tried to mentally ready myself. I removed a black light bulb, gripping the flagpole, took a few breaths, and slowly opened the door once more, hearing the wet saliva clicking from the spider-like thing's toothy mandibles. I tossed the light bulb into the elevator shaft, hearing it burst and trickle fragments down deep within. The creature scuttled over in thumping steps, peering over the edge to look in, and my heart raced as I seized my chance. I ran and jammed the flagpole into that thing's fleshy side, shoving it into the opening as it squealed a horrific sound. I ran to the ladder and climbed, despite the burning in my muscles. Higher and higher until I began doubting the shaft would ever end. I heard the squeal behind me then, and it was approaching far too rapidly. As it was nearly upon me, I heard the ambiance thicken, and I knew I was at the top. I shoved with all my might, expecting it to be locked. It wasn't, but it was extremely heavy. I strained and pushed until dirt spilled in, and the light of the sky seeped in. I was free. The moon nearly blinded me as I lay down on the dirt and leaves that covered the thick metal hatch, and to my relief, nothing tried to open it. I caught my breath before searching the dark woods for a small boulder which I tumbled over to cover that hidden hatch. 
I turned on my phone's flashlight and breathed deep the fall air, crisp and refreshing after the horrors from below. I glanced with teary eyes at the moonlit trees, the gradients of autumn leaves warming the scene with tranquility, just above those unimaginable horrors below. I began the long trek back to my car, listening to the peaceful sounds of crickets and bending trees, trying not to think about what I had read on the paperwork, or the horrors still lurking. I was only trying to think of a warm bath and a soft bed, not what I had seen in those notes, trying not to think about the joint founders, Gabe, Barbara, and Calvin, and their three other facilities.